that make possible this meeting. The support, as always, of the ASPB, at UNAM, the Faculty of Chemistry, the Biotechnology and Biology Institutes at Simvestab, UGA, and Angevio, at the University of Veracruz and the Michigan State University. Mm. I encourage young scientists, postdocs, and graduate students to take advantage of this opportunity to update in top topics in plant biochemistry and molecular biology, such as development, mm -hmm. environmental interactions, hormonal signaling, biotechnology, metabolism, stress, and technological breakthroughs. Once again, I welcome all the attendings from different countries. I wish you to enjoy yourselves and participate with questions and comments in this great meeting. Many thanks and have a wonderful week. Greetings. On behalf of SPB, it is my pleasure and privilege to welcome you to the 12th SAMB SPB Mexico Section Virtual Conference. I personally had the privilege of experiencing the positive impact of this meeting in 2019, resulting in a fruitful collaboration with my colleagues. Indeed, the increased number of participants to 1,300 scientists from 50 countries in this meeting is a testimony to the positive and constructive experience of many other participants. I have long valued the power of science without borders. The long history of conferences and collaborative efforts is the prime example of how we cross the man-made borders and transcend political agendas of some politicians. Indeed, yes we can. I am certain that this meeting will be no exception as it continues to strengthen our scientific relationships and enhance collaborations between scientists across the globe. I wish I could be there in person. However, from afar, I wish you much success in continuing this tradition, empowering the young incoming generation of scientists and showcasing the power of science without borders. Be powerful and have a successful meeting. These are challenging times. The world is standing up against one of the major threats we have ever encountered. And if there is one thing we have learned so far, is that in the face of the uncertainty, science, hope, and solidarity must always prevail. We want to give you the most enthusiastic welcome to our 19th National Plant Biochemistry and Molecular Biology Congress. Our 12th joint symposium between Mexico and the USA, and our second American Society of Plant Biologists Mexican section meeting. The pandemic transformed the way we interact with each other. We have been forced to change our daily routines to incorporate video conferencing as a major way of communicating with the world, and inadvertently, we became part of the largest social experiment ever run. We are a species entirely reliant on interaction with other human beings. And although there's no substitute for human touch, video conferencing has been instrumental not only to keep us communicated, but to keep our minds at ease, knowing that we are not facing the challenge alone. Thanks to your tremendous support, we are able to bring together more than 1,300 participants for 49 countries. We are extremely happy that most participants are undergrad and grad students, as this means that you, the next generation of plant scientists, answer the call. We are convinced that you will get inspired by the work of all the amazing lineup of speakers that honor our meeting with their participation. In addition, we will have the participation of over 100 speakers that will share with us their latest results through pre-recorded videos in an unprecedented way. All pre-recorded presentations will be streamed during the meeting in flash talk sessions marked in the program. 
the organizing committee was formed by principal investigators from the Faculty of Chemistry, the Institute of Biology, the Biotechnology Institute from the National Autonomous University of Mexico, the Advanced Genomics Unit from Langevio of the Center for Research and Advanced Studies of the National Polytechnic Institute, the Institute for Biotechnology and Applied Ecology of the Universidad Veracruzana, and Michigan State University. We want to thank the Mexican Society of Biochemistry and the American Society of Plant Biologists for their invaluable support that made it possible to hold this meeting completely free of charge to all participants. Finally, we would like to offer our sincere thanks to all the people that helped us make this event possible. Without any further delay, let's get started.
Okay. Good morning, everybody. To start our meeting, I would like to welcome our first keynote speaker of the day. We have uh, Rob Martinson from Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory in US. The title of his talk is Germline Reprogramming and Epigenetic Inheritance in Arabidopsis. Rob, if you are ready, could you please, please share your screen with us? All right, thank you, Mario. It's easy. Thank you. And I will let you know when you have two minutes left. Okay, sounds thank good. You. Can you see that okay? Yes. Okay, great. Well, uh, first of all, thanks so much for the invitation. I would love to be in Mexico in person. It's a fabulous place I've been many times, uh, but uh, congratulations on being able to put together this, uh, this meeting virtually. Um, that's what we're all doing these days. So I'm gonna talk about germline reprogramming and epigenetic inheritance. Um, I actually always like to start my talk with this um, iconic portrait um, of Luther Burbank, who was a famous plant breeder at the turn of the 19th, 20th centuries, uh, painted uh, actually posthumously uh, by his dear friend, Frida Kahlo uh, in the 1930s. Despite being a famous plant breeder, uh, Luther Burbank did not believe in the newly emerging subject of genetics uh, and famously said that heredity was only the sum of all past environment. Uh, well, now, of course, we know a lot more about epigenetic inheritance, and so maybe he had something, something to say. Uh, but of course, in mammals, it turns out epigenetic inheritance is relatively rare. And the reason for that is uh, reprogramming. So the genome has to be reprogrammed uh, in order to remove and restore epigenetic marks that might have been uh, encountered uh, because of the environment or because of developmental changes and restore them uh, to allow pluripotency or totipotency uh, in, in the zygote. And so in mammals, uh, DNA methylation, for example, shown here, uh, as well as histone modifications and histone variants are extensively remodeled twice. First, in the very early embryo, right after fertilization, when methylation is lost and then restored. And a second time in the germline, where uh, most uh, of, of the DNA methylation is lost, but not all. So there is some possibility for, uh, for epigenetic inheritance uh, in mammals. But in general, the uh, germline uh, and, and the embryo completely remodel the genome, uh, making epigenetic inheritance very difficult. In plants, of course, we have a great deal more epigenetic inheritance in general. Uh, and we've been studying the issue of germline reprogramming for quite some time now, uh, mostly in Arabidopsis. Uh, in Arabidopsis, we've been focusing on pollen. Uh, this is just a, a, a fluorescent micrograph of pollen uh, showing you the two sperm cells uh, labeled in green. One, of course, fertilizes the embryo, the other the endosperm. And the vegetative nucleus, uh, which acts as a nurse cell during pollen tube growth, uh, but doesn't contribute its DNA to the next generation. Uh, and in fact, pollen is extensively remodeled. Uh, DNA methylation, as I'll show you in, in some detail in a moment, uh, but also histone modifications, histone variants, and small RNAs all change extensively in the pollen uh, and are involved in a reprogramming of, uh, of, of the genome. Uh, as a result of this reprogramming, actually both in mammals and in plants, uh, transposons, uh, which are major targets of epigenetic silencing, are reactivated. And this happens in the early embryo in mammals, as well as in the germline. And in plants, uh, we found some years ago uh, just looking at publicly available microarray data, the transposable elements are, are in fact strongly uh, upregulated, both in the pollen and in the immature seed. And this observation was made by Keith when he was a postdoc in the lab many, many years ago. Uh, it turns out that these transposons are the source of small RNAs, just as they are in mammals and, 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 and animals in general. Uh, and these small RNAs uh, in pollen are triggered by a special microRNA, at least uh, in, in many species of plants, certainly in Arabidopsis. Uh, this microRNA is called MIR845. It comes in two forms, a 21 nucleotide and a 22 nucleotide form. Uh, and it's extremely abundant. It's by far the most abundant microRNA in pollen. Uh, and it's very specific to pollen, at least in, in, under ordinary conditions, it's not really expressed very much anywhere else in the plant. Uh, if you introduce a target site for microRNA 
845 into a GFP reporter gene, it will trigger large numbers of these secondary small RNAs, 21 and 22 nucleotides in size. Uh, and in fact, it will silence GFP. I'm not showing you that data very efficiently uh, in the pollen. Uh, now, uh, the important uh, question is the, is the targets of MIR845. And it turns out that MIR845 has the remarkable ability to target many of the transposons in the Arabidopsis genome. And the reason for this is that it actually targets the primer binding site, uh, which is required for retrotransposon uh, mobilization. So these are LTR retrotransposons, the most abundant type of transposon in the Arabidopsis and, and, and in all plant genomes. Uh, and just to remind you, uh, retrotransposons are replicated using a tRNA primer uh, that primes first strand cDNA synthesis through the LTR uh, at a particular site, the primer binding site or PBS. And that first step of reverse transcription is critical for the entire uh, replication and transposition of retrotransposable elements. Uh, what's even more remarkable uh, is that uh, almost all transposons in plants use the same tRNA primer. Uh, this is actually the tRNA uh, for, for the initiator methionine codon. Uh, and that tRNA then, as a result, the, the primer binding sites of most copia and gypsy transpos retrotransposons in the Arabidopsis genome are, are, are closely related. And as a result, MIR845 actually targets hundreds or even thousands of different retrotransposons in the genome. Uh, and of course, this is a fabulous strategy for silencing transposons because the transposon can't really mutate the primer binding site uh, to escape or to evade microRNA recognition because by doing so, it would also uh, mutate the primer binding site itself, which wouldn't allow replication. So this is a, a very, a very uh, powerful way to silence transposons. And remarkably, in the mouse, the same thing happens. And we showed this a few years ago now. Um, but rather than using a microRNA uh, in the mouse and in human, uh, tRNA fragments themselves, uh, which are also 22 nucleotides in size uh, from the three primed end of the tRNA fragment, do exactly the same thing. They, they behave like microRNAs and silence uh, retrotransposons by targeting the primer binding site. Okay, so uh, what about the small RNAs that are generated in pollen? Uh, I'm not gonna show you all the data again, this was published a few years ago, um, but in fact, uh, a, a whole suite of small interfering RNAs are generated or triggered by this microRNA. We can demonstrate that by looking at a mutant, uh, which has lost actually only one of those two of, uh, forms of MIR845, but it's still enough uh, to have a pretty dramatic effect. And as you can see, transposable element small RNAs are greatly reduced in the mutants, and they're reduced in these size classes, in the 21s, 22s, uh, and, and even some 23s uh, in, uh, in, in pollen, uh, rather than the 24s themselves. So it seems uh, that it's triggering these secondary small RNAs, uh, which are very well known uh, in Arabidopsis. Uh, so then uh, we have lots of these secondary small RNAs coming from small, uh, transposons uh, in pollen, uh, and uh, 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 many years ago, uh, Keith, uh, who discovered this class of small RNAs uh, when he was a postdoc in the lab, uh, uh, published a, a wonderful model uh, suggesting that perhaps these small RNAs, which seem to be generated in pollen under the control of the vegetative nucleus, uh, with, were, were transported into the sperm cells to silence any transposons that might have somehow escaped uh, uh, or, or been reprogrammed. And in fact, he was able to, uh, in his own lab, uh, show, uh, show that very nicely in a paper that came out a couple of years ago in Nature Plants. So you can actually demonstrate this uh, very well. Okay, well, what about reprogramming then? So we have all these small RNAs. We have transposon activation. Uh, what about uh, DNA methylation, histones, and so on? Uh, well, just to remind you, uh, uh, pollen arises from uh, the, uh, the uh, inappropriately named uh, pollen mother cell. Uh, which then undergoes meiosis to give you uh, microspores. Uh, and then uh, uh, these, uh, these give rise to the vegetative cell and the generative cell after the first uh, uh, mitosis. And then in a second highly stereotypical mitosis, the germ cell uh, divides again to give you those two sperm cells. Uh, and of course, the sperm cells contribute to fertilization, whereas the companion cell uh, does not, or at least does not contribute its DNA. Uh, some years ago now, Joe Kalako, who was a student in the lab, uh, and Philippe, who was a postdoc, 
uh, we're able to uh, sort uh, both uh, microspores uh, uh, and uh, uh, sperm cells and vegetative nuclei uh, very efficiently and in sufficient quantities to be able to do uh, bisulfite sequencing to look at the pollen methylome. Uh, and uh, uh, they were able to do this in both, as I said, both in the microspore, uh, sperm cells, and the vegetative nucleus. This was published almost 10 years ago now, but I just want to summarize, summarize the results. So just to remind you, DNA methylation in plants is almost exclusively in cytosine, 5-methylcytosine, uh, which occurs in three different sequence contexts, depending on whether the adjacent uh, nucleotide is a G. So CG methylation, and I'll go into this in a lot more detail in the next few slides, uh, is mediated by a, a, a DNA methyl transferase with an excellent homologue in mammals called, called MET1, and it's replication guided. CHG methylation, where H is anything except G, CHG methylation is actually chromatin guided, and it has to be for reasons that I'll get into uh, in a moment. And this is conditioned by a different methyl transferase called chromo uh, methyl transferase. And finally, CHH methylation, which is completely asymmetric, doesn't have any Gs. Uh, this uh, is mediated by a third uh, methyl transferase, and this is guided by RNA interference, and I'll, I'll show you that in a moment. So again, just to remind you, oh, sorry, uh, what we found when we sequenced the methylome, I'm just blowing up one, one chromosome here, chromosome one, uh, is that CG methylation, largely speaking, is unchanged. And that's very interesting, and it probably explains why epigenetic inheritance is so much more common in plants than it is in mammals, because CG methylation is unchanged and so would be inherited, uh, and indeed is inherited in many very well-known examples of uh, heritable epigenetic inheritance. CHG methylation uh, changes a little bit, and in fact, I'll show you in a moment, it does really change, uh, it, especially in the, in the sperm cells, uh, and also to some extent in the microspore. But the most dramatic change is in CHH methylation, which essentially disappears from sperm cells and is almost completely lost in the microspore. And it turns out uh, with some lovely work from Xiao Chi Fang and, and colleagues uh, that it's actually lost even earlier than that in meiosis at that, at that stage, uh, just before the microspores uh, are produced. Okay, so there is then a, a reprogramming of DNA methylation uh, in pollen uh, and um, uh, and we, we can summarize it uh, in this graph, which is sort of borrowed from that, that famous uh, mammalian uh, reprogramming graph that I showed you. CG methylation uh, is, is, is normal in the microspore and is maintained in sperm cells and into the next generation. But CHH methylation, for example, is reduced dramatically in meiosis and in the microspore, and it stays low in the sperm cell. Interestingly, it actually gets remethylated in the vegetative nucleus, even though this doesn't contribute its DNA to the next generation. We think this has something to do with the small RNAs that are being produced in pollen, both the 21 nucleotide small RNAs, which find their way into sperm cells, and of course, the more uh, well-known 24 nucleotide small RNAs from transposons. And we believe that this has an awful lot to do with imprinting, and, and we know it affects uh, the triploid block, but I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna talk about that today. Uh, in the embryo, uh, CHH methylation comes back. Uh, and this, of course, is, is uh, very reminiscent of what happens uh, in, in mammals. Uh, and so we were very interested in the mechanism of, of this uh, reprogramming. So just to remind you, DNA methylation during replication uh, can be maintained if it's symmetric. That's to say, if it's in CG dinucleotides, which are found on both strands. So this C and this C are both methylated. After replication, the two parental strands separate, and both of them are methylated. As a result, the, methylate, the, uh, the, the, apparatus, the enzymatic apparatus required for DNA methylation uh, will fill in uh, the other strand, the nascent strand, will recognize the methylation, the hemimethylation now on the parental strand, uh, and, and fill in that missing methylation. And as a result, symmetric DNA methylation is maintained during replication. Asymmetric methylation, however, for example, CA methylation is different because there's no C on the other strand. And as a result, the parental strands separate and only one of them retains that DNA methylation. DNA replication can now fit in the other strand, uh, but now this daughter chromatid has no DNA methylation because it, it, it has not been inherited from the parental strand. And as a result, asymmetric DNA methylation is not maintained. 
And so it has to be maintained independently of replication by some other guide, not by DNA methylation itself. Uh, and thanks to the work of many different labs, especially uh, my good friend, Steve Jacobson, uh, here in this, this great review written with Judy Law, uh, uh, we now know that uh, CHG methylation, where H again is anything but G, so A, C, or T, CHG methylation, which is not strictly symmetric, because remember that CHG will read differently on the other strand, is maintained not by DNA methylation, but by histone methylation. There's a histone methyl transferase, actually several of them in plants that methylate K9 on uh, histone H3. Uh, and this is recognized by that chromomethylase responsible for CHG methylation. And it's this cycle uh, that maintains CHG methylation. CHH methylation, oops, I'm sorry about that, uh, is, uh, is maintained, as we all hopefully know by now, by RNA-dependent DNA methylation, where small RNAs, uh, uh, particularly of the 24 nucleotide class, but actually we think in, 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 in all classes, have the capability to, uh, to trigger DNA methylation as well. They're produced by special polymerases, POL4, uh, RDRP, Dicer, and Argonaut, and so on. Uh, but then importantly, they interact with the transcripts of another plant-specific polymerase, polymerase 5, uh, which then uh, involves uh, two very interesting uh, histone lysine 9 methyltransferase homologues that were thought until very recently to be inactive and yet somehow are required for DNA methylation. So it's a complex process, RNA-dependent DNA methylation, but a very important one, uh, and one that, uh, that I'll, I'll be talking, talking about more in a minute. Okay, so uh, in order to look at uh, the inheritance of DNA methylation during DNA replication in replicating cells, we've been collaborating with Bill Thompson and Linda Hadley bodine now for many, many years at North Carolina State University. And they have a Arabidopsis cell culture system shown here, uh, which is uh, completely diploid. Uh, we've actually sequenced it many times. It doesn't have any obvious epigenetic mutations or none that affect what I'm about to talk about. Uh, and uh, you can grow it in culture uh, essentially forever. And in fact, it has been in culture for, for probably for decades at this point. Uh, it incorporates BRDU very nicely, which is of course, uh, the nucleotide mimic uh, that allows you to follow DNA replication. Uh, so what we do is we pulse uh, for 24 hours those cells with, uh, with BRDU uh, and then, uh, or EDU actually these days, uh, and then uh, measure by fax nucleotide incorporation against DNA content. And this allows us to separate nuclei uh, that are in different phases of the cell cycle, G1, S, and G2. The S phase cells can be further separated, as I'll show you in a moment, into early, mid, and late S phase according to DNA content. And that uh, reflects the, the differential DNA replication of different parts of the genome because euchromatin is, is replicated early and heterochromatin transposable elements are replicated late. Uh, when we uh, do the methylomes then, so we have enough nuclei uh, to be able to do whole genome bisulfite sequencing on those, on those methylomes, uh, we notice the following things. First of all, CG methylation, despite being in culture for 30 years, uh, CG methylation was largely maintained uh, in these G1 cells. CHG methylation was lower, but it was still there, but CHH methylation had completely disappeared. So in that way, it sort of reminded us of pollen as if somehow there's some sort of reprogramming effect was associated with, with just a lot of cell division. We could uh, look much, much more uh, uh, specifically at strand-specific methylation using a technique that was pioneered by Karen Schneeberger many years ago now, uh, which looks at strand asymmetry in DNA methylation. So you take the entire methylome and you plot the methyl C level at each dinucleotide, CG, for example, on one strand, on the Watson strand, and on the other strand, the Crick strand. And you plot that as a scatter plot. Uh, if, as is the case in G1, uh, CG uh, uh, dinucleotides are largely symmetric, then they will cluster in this heat map at the top right-hand corner. And this is because they're 100% methylated on each strand. If, however, they're asymmetrically methylated, then you get this much broader distribution uh, showing 
uh, asymmetry. And this is exactly what we see in S phase nuclei isolated from those cultured cells. CHG methylation, on the other hand, is always asymmetric, as if it never gets fully symmetrically methylated, which of course is, is, is not really a tenable situation uh, in, the, in the very long term, and it's lost an awful lot of CHG methylation. We can even separate into early, mid, and late S phase uh, using this technique, and what we found is that most of this asymmetry in CG methylation is in late S phase, and that makes sense because the transposons and heterochromatin that where most of the methylation resides uh, replicates late as it does in, in animals. Okay, so now armed with this uh, uh, technique, we can now look in other tissues of the plants thanks to our own methylome data, but also methylome data that's been published from many other labs uh, working in Arabidopsis. And what we found was that CG methylation is symmetric in most of the tissues and stages that we looked at. What we're looking at here, of course, is pollen. Uh, we're looking at myocytes, microspores, sperm cells, and the vegetative nucleus. But interestingly, CHG methylation was much more variable. We found in leaf, and actually in almost all tissues that we've looked at, and we've looked at a lot of published uh, methylomes, uh, it, it, it's almost always asymmetric, as it is in tissue culture. Oh, no. I think I'm losing my cursor. It's not good. Sorry about this, it's really annoying. I thought I was doing okay. I'm gonna to have to, I'm gonna to have to abandon the PowerPoint and come back to it, sorry about this. Ah. Uh because the bandwidth isn't big enough. It shouldn't take too long. I guess we're all getting better at doing this now. All right. <clears throat> so as I was saying, uh, CHG methylation is asymmetric in almost all tissues that we looked at. But importantly, and very interestingly, there were exceptions in pollen. So myocytes shown here on the right uh, have fully symmetric CHG methylation, as if during meiosis, CHG methylation is restored, it's reprogrammed in an important way. Uh, and in the microspore, similarly, it gets, uh, it, it retains almost all of its symmetry. But in sperm cells, it's gone again. And sperm cells are actually arrested in S phase, so that sort of makes sense. But the CHG methylation is now asymmetric again. So it's been reprogrammed in meiosis, just like in mammals, but then, but then uh, uh, gets, gets, uh, gets removed. In the embryo, interestingly, it comes back. So in the embryo, both CG and CHG methylation are completely symmetric once again. This is mature embryos taken from Arabidopsis. In contrast, endosperm, uh, which of course has a rapid rate of cell division uh, during, uh, right after fertilization, uh, is, is completely asymmetric, both in CG and CHG. So this is really rapidly uh, replicating and doesn't really care anymore about its DNA methylation. Of course, the endosperm is not gonna contribute to the next generation either. Okay, so uh, this is very interesting. It's clear that uh, cell culture, uh, rapidly dividing cells, can give us a very powerful model uh, for DNA methylation, epigenetic inheritance. And then by looking at all these other tissues, we had a good idea uh, of, of, of how this worked. And so we were able, this was published just, just very recently um, in the cell cycle then, we think CG methylation is, is restored during S phase. CHG methylation we think is restored in G2, and that's because the microspore is actually arrested in G2. CHH methylation, on the other hand, 
may, may require that the cell cycle arrest altogether. We can't, we can't eliminate that possibility. It's our favorite theory. Uh, and certainly uh, is, is, is much later than CHG methylation uh, in the cell cycle. All right, so then we were interested then in how this uh, DNA methylation gets restored uh, in the embryo, uh, given that it's lost uh, from the sperm cell. Oh, uh, sorry, and before I do that, uh, what about small RNAs? Well, these tissue culture cells uh, have very interesting small RNA uh, patterns, very much like pollen, a large number of transposable elements, including Attila elements shown here, uh, actually accumulate uh, uh, not 24s, but 21 nucleotide small RNAs. And they do that in a cell cycle specific way so that cells enriched in S phase have a lot more 21 nucleotide small RNAs than other cells. So there's something very important about that 21 nucleotide small RNA class uh, that is also found in these rapidly dividing cell cultures. Okay, so what happens in the embryo? Well, recently, uh, Jean-Sebastien Perron, uh, working actually with Daniel Griminelli, who was on uh, sabbatical in the lab at the time, uh, looked in early embryos uh, at DNA methylation patterns and looked in a variety of mutants, in RNAi mutants, mutants involved in RNA-dependent DNA methylation, and in mutants in that histone methyltransferase required for CHG methylation. And again, this was published very recently, but what we found was that there were two classes of transposable elements in the Arabidopsis genome. DNA class transposons, and also uh, uh, well, DNA and some line uh, retrotransposons are, are actually very sensitive to RNA-dependent DNA methylation. Whereas other types of retrotransposons, the gypsies and copias, uh, were much less sensitive to RNA-directed DNA methylation and instead depended on this histone methyltransferase. And that's shown here, looking at different levels. I'm sorry if the writing is a bit small, but CHG methylation shown here in blue, uh, is dramatically reduced uh, in these DNA transposons in the RNAi, RNA-dependent DNA methylation mutants. Uh, and whereas the converse is true for this other class of transposons uh, shown here, so, so they're quite radically different. And we wondered then, given the dependence on, on K9 methylation, what happened to K9 methylation? And uh, jean Sebastian and, and John Kahn in the lab were able to do uh, CHIP-seq, uh, looking at uh, K9 methylation in very early embryos. And what they found was sure enough, K9 methylation mim mimicked the CHG methylation that I just showed you. So it's, it's reduced in the RNAi dependent transposons uh, and uh, in, in RNAi mutants, uh, but it's not reduced in those transposons in the canonical K9 methyltransferase mutants which were thought previously to completely erase all K9 methylation. And in fact, they don't uh, because these RNAi dependent ones are still maintained. And so we were very interested to find out how K9 methylation was maintained in this way in the embryo. Daniel Griminelli uh, produced these beautiful micrographs uh, looking at very early eight style embryos uh, by immunofluorescence using an antibody to histone H3 lysine 9 dimethylation. And what he found, was then wild type at the eight cell stage. There's lots and lots of K9 methylation. But in mutants, for example, in Argonaut, in Argonaut 469 triple mutants shown on the very right hand side, that K9 methylation is not there in the early embryo. Similarly, uh, in the uh, in double mutants for the sub H29 factors that I told you about earlier, which are required for RNA dependent DNA methylation, but thought to be inactive uh, as histone methyltransferases, they also lost. K9 methylation at this early stage. I should say it comes back later. So it's only at this very early stage of reprogramming that these mutants seem to be important. Uh, and indeed, uh, the argonauts that I just described, AGO6 and AGO9, are expressed at the very early stages uh, in, in, in embryos, uh, just shown here. So this is just using Amcheri, AGO9, and AGO6 uh, labeled uh, argonauts. So it makes sense that they would be involved in these, uh, in these stages. AGO4 is actually a bit later on. It's really uh, uh, in the in, in later embryos than six and one. Uh, well, uh, we were then very curious as to whether sub H9 might be the K9 methyltransferase, even though it was thought to be inactive, responsible for this phenomenon. And so Jean Sebastian, uh, first of all, uh, uh, did some complicated crosses shown here uh, to eliminate the function of all of the K9 methyltransferases that we know about. Uh, and when you do that, 
uh, you get a very specific phenotype in Arabidopsis, these very curled leaves. Uh, it's sometimes called the STC phenotype. We know the gene that's responsible. Uh, and what he found was that he got that phenotype very strongly uh, when he knocked them all out. But if he replaced sub H9 wild type copy into that background, then the phenotype was rescued as expected. But then he made a mutant in sub H9 in the catalytic domain for the set domain for the K9 methyltransferase. And even though the protein is expressed at normal levels shown in, in, in part A here, uh, it, 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 uh, it completely failed to restore the phenotype. And sure enough, ChIP-seq revealed that it also failed to restore K9 methylation to those specific subset of transposons that require the RNAi directed pathway to get K9. So in fact, SUVH9 must be functional, uh, which was quite a surprise. And again, this was published just, just recently. All right, well, what effect uh, does all of this have in, in the real world? So of course, uh, you know, most plants don't, don't propagate themselves by cell culture, uh, but in fact, in agriculture, of course, uh, many plants are propagated by micropropagation. And uh, a famous, uh, maybe infamous example is the oil palm, uh, where, uh, which, which has really been subjected to relatively limited breeding because of its long breeding cycle. And as a result, uh, cloning of uh, uh, elite uh, palms that were known to have very high yields, these are hybrid palms, uh, could be accomplished by simply taking like the heart of palm, those spear leaves uh, from a mature palm tree, putting them into culture and then uh, generate, regenerating something like 10 to 50,000 uh, genetically identical oil palms that in theory would all have that same very high yield uh, as, the, uh, 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 as the original palm. But maybe it was the uh, ghost of Luther Burbank, um, but in fact, uh, it turns out that's not always the case. Although uh, uh, tissue culture uh, labs uh, in Malaysia and Indonesia are getting much better at this, uh, there is still a real problem, which is that many of the palms, only when they're mature, so they're already occupying precious land uh, in, in, in these oil palm plantations, uh, turn out to have this, this uh, very ugly and uh, very, very low yielding uh, phenotype called mantle. Uh, this is uh, a parthenogenic uh, fruit, uh, usually without a seed, usually female sterile, uh, and, uh, and it also has these homeotic, these homeotic trans transformations and very little oil. In fact, those homeotic transformations uh, are transformations of stamens into carpels, the very well-known B class of, uh, of homeotic mutants in plants. And indeed, the phenotype looks an awful lot like deficiency in antirhinum or AP3 in Arabidopsis if you, if you look at it in the right way. So, uh, so you have all these uh, transformations of, of stamens into carpels. And so deficiency was always a, a, a strong candidate gene from what might be going on, but no one could ever detect a mutation uh, in deficiency. So uh, I should say, uh, full disclosure, this is a work that was done with a company, Orion Genomics, of which I'm a founder, uh, in collaboration with the Malaysian government, uh, the Malaysian Oil Palm Board, uh, who uh, collected material from uh, hundreds or even thousands of these mantle palms from all over Malaysia. Uh, and we subjected them to DNA methylation, uh, 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 microarray analysis, because it's much cheaper when you have thousands of samples than doing bisulfite sequencing. The material we used uh, is, were uh, trios, uh, where we had a mother palm called an ortet uh, and genetically identical clones called uh, ramets, so either normal or mantled ramets. And then we looked for methylation, DNA methylation genome-wide, uh, and looked for those regions of the genome that were always methylated in normal ramets and never methylated in mantled ramets. And amazingly enough, uh, there was just one, uh, three, three, three or four features on the microarray where they all clustered on exactly the same place uh, that fulfilled that criteria out of many, many hundred uh, mantle palms. This is effectively an epigenome-wide association study. It's looking at, at DNA methylation uh, rather than, than SNPs. Uh, but what we found was that the, uh, the, the single feature in the genome that seemed to be responsible was a transposable element. No, no big surprise there. It was actually a line element and very satisfyingly it was in the very long 30 kb intron found in the deficient gene. So this, this all made sense. 
uh, when we did some bisulfite sequencing now on selected trios, uh, this is just one shown here, with M for mantled, N for normal, and O for the mother or tet. What we found was, uh, once again, the same sort of thing. CG methylation was unaffected. CG methylation didn't change in the karma transposon. But CHG methylation and CHH methylation both disappeared in a, a substantial uh, differentially methylated region of several hundred base pairs uh, uh, within the, the karma transposable element. You might be wondering why it's called karma. Uh, well, uh, in fact, uh, this type of line element had been discovered before. It had been discovered in rice. Uh, and in rice, the karma transposon was, uh, was actually published a few years ago now uh, and called karma because it was activated in tissue culture, just like karma in oil power. And in fact, it's one of only two transposons. The other is a, a well-known LTRH transposon that are activated in rice tissue culture. And it took a whole generation after regeneration from tissue culture for it to move. And that's why they called it karma, because it depended on uh, what had happened in the previous generation. And so, of course, we could then uh, name our epi alleles good karma for methylated and bad karma for unmethylated. Uh, and uh, we could also uh, uh, figure out what was responsible for the phenotype. And it turns out that this, this is due to, to alternate splicing. So uh, like all transposable elements uh, have, or almost all have, have introns, splice acceptor sites, line elements always do. Uh, and there's a line element uh, uh, splice site in the karma transposon. And when it's unmethylated, that splice site uh, gets used. And when it gets used, it truncates the deficiency gene and gives a very strong phenotype. And this is just a developmental uh, a series of fruit development showing that, uh, that uh, the aberrantly spliced form of deficiency. Uh, we showed a similar dependence on this type of methylation in maize for splicing uh, almost 10 years ago. Interestingly, small RNAs also change in oil palm tissue culture just as they do in Arabidopsis, which is pretty amazing. So uh, in, in, in oil palm, in normal inflorescence, we have mostly 24 nucleotide small RNAs, as you would expect coming from transposons. Uh, but in tissue culture, uh, we actually see uh, uh, 21 nucleotide small RNAs much more abundant uh, in oil palm tissue culture, as if those active transposable elements are once again being targeted uh, for uh, small RNA production, just as they are in pollen and just as they are in cell culture in Arabidopsis. But of course, uh, this means that we can now test for karma DNA methylation or bad karma, if you like, uh, in seedlings before they go into the plantation. And this type of predictive test is actually extremely valuable because it means that non-productive, low-yielding palms don't occupy precious space uh, in, the, in the oil palm plantation. Uh, and this test is still, still under development, but it's working pretty well. Uh, and we're hoping that it will have, will have some, some, some real, real world impact on this important uh, epigenetic trait. And this actually led to sort of all my favorite uh, nature covers, weed out bad karma, uh, which sort of, uh, sort, of, sort of sums it up. Uh, this is very important, of course, you don't need me to remind you, but oil palm is a very, uh, a very controversial crop, especially in these days of, of, uh, of, of, of of heightened awareness of environmental biodiversity and climate change issues, uh, the extensive uh, planting of oil palms uh, in, uh, in Borneo. This is a picture taken uh, in, uh, in Sabah, in the north of, of Borneo, by my colleague uh, in Malaysia, Malina Ong Abdullah, who's the first author on that manuscript and, and uh, uh, runs uh, tissue culture for the Malaysian government, MVOB. Uh, and uh, of course, sustainable oil palm is, uh, is, is, is an incredibly important goal for both Malaysia and Indonesia. And being able to reduce the footprint uh, of cloned plantations by simply removing uh, the palms that will, will never produce oil uh, would actually potentially have a significant impact on the sustainability and biodiversity of, uh, of, of the rainforest uh, shown here on the left uh, compared to oil palm plantations uh, shown here on the right. Okay, well, I'm gonna wrap up there. I'm just gonna summarize what I told you. So uh, uh, genome reprogramming uh, in plants and in mammals occurs in the germline and in the embryo at two different stages guided by small RNA. 
Uh, so epigenetically activated, or we sometimes call this easy RNA uh, in sperm cells, are triggered by a very specific microRNA that targets active transposons in pollen at the PBS. And, and amazingly, uh, in mammals, a very similar thing happens by targeting the PBS with, with tRNA fragments. Symmetric CG methylation in plants is not reprogrammed. It's retained in sperm. And that's probably why we have a lot more epigenetic inheritance in plants, for example, transposon silencing and so on, uh, than we do in mammals, where CG methylation is much more extensively reprogrammed. However, asymmetric methylation, which is very important in the Arabidopsis genome at least, and in most plant genomes, is reprogrammed. Both CHH methylation, which is lost in sperm cells, and CHG methylation, uh, which is asymmetric uh, for most of plant development and only made symmetric again in meiosis uh, and uh, in the embryo. Uh, and so in the embryo, uh, we've, we've shown now that, uh, uh, that, that, that methylation, DNA methylation is restored, guided by both K9 methylation and small RNAs, and critically through the, uh, the, the K9 methyltransferase sub H9. In cell culture, this reprogramming doesn't occur because you don't go through meiosis. And so you never remethylate uh, or restore symmetric methylation to CHG and restore CHH methylation. And that's why we think uh, tissue culture, somaclonal variants, which of course occur in, in all plants that have gone through tissue culture, uh, occurs in, in, in such prevalence. And we've, uh, we've, we've shown that this is due to the absence of the correct type of small RNA that would normally reprogram that methylation in the embryo. And as I said, this can have real world consequences to uh, plants that are uh, agricultural plants that are propagated uh, by uh, uh, in this way. Uh, so uh, I have a lot of people to thank. Uh, the, the recent work I showed you was all uh, done by former postdocs, uh, Philippe Bourges, uh, who now has his own lab in Paris, and Jean-Sebastien Parent, who has his own lab in, uh, in Ottawa. Uh, Daniel Gimenetti was on sabbatical, uh, for wonderful for, for actually a couple of years off and on, uh, and really helped a great deal with all of the studies, the recent studies that I showed you. And of course, the early work of, <coughs> excuse me, uh, Keith Slock and Nilash Fred was also very important. Current lab members who contributed to what I told you include John Luck, John Kern, Jason Lynn, and Chris, uh, Chris Susan Alvis, who I haven't had time to tell you all of the work they're doing that's uh, uh, that's related uh, to, uh, to, to, to uh, the stories that I told you. Very importantly, uh, the Malaysian Palm Oil Board, uh, there's actually a cast of thousands here uh, that help with the, the palm oil, the oil palm genome, first of all, the sequence of that, and then all the, uh, the methylation screening and at Orion Genomics, uh, uh, the, the CEO, Nate Lakey, uh, head of bioinformatics, former head of bioinformatics, Steve Smith, and, and head of research, Jared Wilber. So thanks very much. Uh, I'd be happy to take some questions if there's if there's any time. Okay. Thank you so much, Rob. Uh, that was a wonderful talk. And uh, we have minutes for a couple of questions. So uh, feel free to raise your hands. And we're gonna ask you to unmute yourselves once we give you the access. So. Questions? Okay, we have uh, Jose Luis Reyes Tabuada. Can you unmute yourself, please? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, just because they have a message saying that the host is not allowing participants to unmute themselves. Okay, anyway, so I guess he, he, host will have to be very um, active right now. Um, thank you, Rob, for the beautiful presentation. It reminded me a, a lot of things about small RNAs. Um, and I cannot turn on the video, so you'll hear my voice only. Um, with respect to the last part with the karma intron, which is really interesting. Um, I cannot begin to imagine, and maybe you have some ideas about this, what would be the mechanism by which the uh, methylation of the DNA sequence in the intron translates into the splicing machinery to, to, to 
to regulate splicing the splicing process. Do we know anything about that? Actually, we do know. Um, so so uh, in, in plants, um, I mean, we showed it years ago in maize, but other people have observed as well. We, we typically think of it as DNA methylation, and it's specifically CHG methylation, which of course is very provocative because the splice site itself, the consensus splice acceptor site is, is CAG, right? So, right. Uh, you know, you'd almost think that the actual methylation of the, but in fact, it turns out it's chromatin. So it's K9 methylation that inhibits splicing. And this has been shown in mammalian cells now in several different papers, uh, most recently actually by my colleague here, Adrian Craner at Cospring Harbor, about a lovely mm -hmm. paper in Nature a couple of years ago showing this. So, so it seems that because splicing is co-transcriptional, uh, yeah. K9 methylated chromatin slows down transcription, uh, which uh, ha has an effect on which splice acceptor site is used. Okay. Uh, having said all that, I do wonder whether DNA methylation of the site itself, like, like you say, it's a complete mystery as to how that would work, but it's very provocative that that particular cytosine, you know, on the, on the transcribed... So, so it, may, it may have a more general effect then, yeah, but, um, as long as you have splice right. sites being methylated, it will exactly. happen frequently. That's right, exactly. So I, I, I think it's, uh, I mean, we did an analysis of the maize methylome, just looking at uh, a variation in DNA methylation and splicing be between two different inbred varieties of maize. And there were hundreds of alternately spliced genes that correlated very, very well with, with methylation of the splice acceptor site. That was in our genome research. <laughs> but, but, you know, we believe that it's actually chromatin is doing it, yeah. All right, thanks. Okay, thank you, Rob. Um, we have uh, room for more questions. I will read one that comes from the chat. So this is from Julian Peña Castro. He's asking, uh, many people doing transcript transcriptomes see upregulation of transposons. Do you think it is a bad consequence of the stress or an adaptive response? Um, well, it, in, in, in stress-related in stress transposon activation, we know quite a lot about that now. Uh, it's typically very specific. So very specific families of transposons are activated by different stresses. And for example, I mean, a really beautiful example is a, a LTR retrotransposon in Arabidopsis called onsen, uh, which is like the uh, hot bath, you know, in, in Japanese. Uh, and um, it actually has a heat shock promoter in its LTR. So temperature stress directly upregulates that transposon. And there are similar examples, there's some beautiful examples from Rice actually from 20 years ago that have, uh, for example, uh, herbivory wounding response elements in their LTRs. So, so stress response seems to be really specific, but you're absolutely right, transposons come on a lot in different stresses. Uh, but I, th I think that's, that's probably why. I mean, that could be a contributor as well, of course, to tissue culture, because tissue culture is very stressful. Um, but we think that the actual DNA replication patterns that we're seeing in, in tissue culture uh, may have more to do with it. Thank you, Rob. We have uh, another question from uh, Tamara. I think you can go ahead. I think. Yes, you can go ahead. Or if not, uh, you can write it in the chat and we can ask it. Yeah, she's gonna write it. <laughs> okay, in the meantime, while she's writing the question, I have a quick question, uh, Rob. Sure. Do you know if there is now strong evidence for either uh, DNA methylation or histone modifications involving paramutation in any system? I know that in Drosophila, there smaller RNAs are involved, but like uh, being a smaller RNAs, like a diffusible signal that can be inherited. So there are now very good examples of paramutation in Drosophila, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. uh, which are completely dependent on pi RNAs and on K9 methylation. Pi RNAs. Uh, don't guide DNA methylation in Drosophila, where there's no DNA methylation, uh, but instead guide K9 methylation. So that seems to be the more conserved uh, mechanism. 
Uh, and similarly in C. elegans, uh, there are great examples of uh, inheritance, actually environmentally triggered adaptive inheritance uh, that is triggered by small RNAs uh, that find their way into the germline and, 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 and condition canine. With respect to paramutation, absolutely. I love paramutation. I know you've worked on it a lot, Eric. And uh, uh, even actually uh, some oil palm breeders that I was talking to a few years back uh, said that they might have examples of paramutation from karma. Isn't that amazing? So, uh, so uh, I think I think that's right. I think paramutation, um, you know, it's got to involve all the same mechanisms uh, in plants as as in, as in these animal examples. Okay, thank you, Rob. We have uh, room for one more question. So we have um, Mariana. No, wait, I have now Tamara's questions in the chat. So Tamara is asking, in the last part, in the old cell cultures where you find 21 nucleotides, small RNAs, which could be easy RNAs, how are they generated? Is the same pathway that in pollen? It's a great, great question. So in cell culture, most of the 21s we see are from Attila transposons, which is a particular family of gypsy retrotransposons in Arabidopsis. And we showed, I didn't cite this paper, we showed in a paper a few years ago uh, that Attila retrotransposons are actually targeted by multiple microRNAs. Uh, they're probably quite old and they've had time to accumulate you know, a lot of enemies. <laughs> and uh, there's a lot of microRNAs that target Attila. So in Arabidopsis cell culture, that's probably because the, 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 it's mostly Attila's, uh, the microRNA responsible. In oil palm, we don't know. Uh, we haven't done the analysis. We should. Uh, again, it's not all transposons that make these small RNAs. Karma absolutely does, but, um, but not all transposons do. And presumably, they're being targeted by some sort of microRNA. Uh, we just haven't, haven't looked for it. But it wouldn't surprise me. Many plants have either MIR-845 or they have a rearranged tRNA gene that is sort of like a, an evolving microRNA uh, that also targets the PBS. This was published by some, some other groups working in the strawberry and some other, some other plants. So there's lots of ways that you can target that PBS, and, and I bet oil palm is doing that, but we haven't, we haven't actually looked for it. Okay. Thank you. I, I, there's uh, now uh, many questions. I, ha I think we can have one more. So I'm going to read it from the chat. This is from Roman Matias, and he's asking, on the replication of methylation marks, what would happen during natural asexual propagation? Would you expect the same rate of epigenetic variation than in a sexual plant, or would they experience a general loss of DNA methylation? What a great question. Um, <laughs> yeah, so uh, it, I... It, you know, embryo, what, what we've now shown in Arabidopsis is that embryo development itself from the early embryo onwards can restore DNA methylation uh, in, in a small RNA guided way. So even in an asexually propagated species, so long as it produces seeds, then it's probably going to restore at least some of the DNA methylation that might be lost in the germline. Um, having said that, if it fails to do so, even if it's like at some statistical probability, then of course it's, it's never gonna come back because it, if, it, if it never gets fertilized, then it will never have the opportunity to reimpose uh, the sorts of DNA methylation uh, that would be more common in, in, the, in the population. And so, yes, I think clonally, even sexually, even seed, clonal seed uh, would have a more, would be more susceptible to epigenetic variation. Uh, over the long term, I think I think that's it's a great question. Really interesting. Okay, well, uh, time is up. Thank you, Rob, once again for accepting our invitation and for your wonderful talk. And um, we're gonna follow up in our program. Thank you, Rob. My pleasure. Okay, so next in our program we have Marisa Otegi from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in US. The title of her talk is Endosomes in Plant Development. Marisa, if you are ready, could you please share your screen with us?
Good morning. I would like to start by thanking the conference organizers for having me today. So my name is Marisa Tegui, and in my lab, we work with um, membrane trafficking pathways that lead to protein degradation. And today I'd like to show you some of our results in our analysis of endosomal uh, trafficking in plants. So endosomal trafficking is important in the context of endocytosis. And so when cells require their plasma membrane to change composition, um, they will sort them in, they will sort proteins into small endocytic vesicles, send them to endosomes, and at endosomes, they can be recycled back to the plasma membrane or degraded. And this is quite important in the context of responses to environmental cues or during development when cells are differentiated into different cell types. So for example, here we have a, a, a cartoon of a human fibroblast. These cells can change completely the composition of their plasma membrane, every single protein in 16 minutes. And they do so by sorting these proteins into thousands of endocytic vesicles and producing thousands of exocytic secretory vesicles that will um, send new proteins to the surface. And again, it could be for playing new functions or, or, or new roles as the cells need to change. Um, and this is also extremely important during development when um, tissues or cell types are differentiated or to responding to, to different uh, cues. If this process fails, in most cases lead to death or very severe abnormal, um, very severe developmental defects. And so getting a little deeper in, in at a higher magnification, let's say, of what is happening in these cells, we know that one of the most important signals for internalization through endocytosis is actually ubiquitination. So at the surface, plasma membrane proteins are ubiquitinated and that triggers their internalization into endocytic vesicles. Those vesicles travel to early endosomes. In plants, early endosomes coincide with the trans network. And right there, they can be recycled back to the endosome if they lose their ubiquity or retaining the endosomal system, where at late endosomes, also called multivesicular bodies or multivesicular endosomes, the escort proteins that are cytosolic proteins uh, will bind the ubiquity in these proteins deform the membrane and sort them into vesicles, intraluminal endosomal vesicles, in such a way that when the endosome is fusing with vacuoles, those intraluminal vesicles now can be degraded by local hydrolases. And so the ubiquitin usually is removed before the vesiculation process is completed and recycled back to the uh, cytosol. In escort mutants that fail to sequester this plasma membrane into vesicles, uh, the proteins end up being on the surface of the vacuole where they cannot be degraded properly. And if we're thinking about receptors telling the cell to divide or channels or transporters now located in the wrong membrane, you can imagine all these, um, why, why these mutants are usually um, uh, lethal or, or, or have serious developmental defects. So the, the vesiculation process happening here, the two that I mentioned, endocytosis is quite different from what is happening in the endosomal membranes. Here, the vesicle is budding into the cytosol, and in this case, it's budding away from the cytosol. And the different topology also it, uh, imposes different um, constraints. So in the case of endocytosis, we know quite well the machinery here. And so if this is a cytosolic site, a clustering um, cage, this is the most common type of vesiculation happening at the plasma membrane. Uh, this clustering cage will directly engage with the cargo, right? So these are the plasma membrane proteins here represented by these orange lollipops. And so they are physically connected to the cargo during the whole process. And then there are mechanisms that dynamins that will help constrict the neck to release the vesicle. 
For the endosomal vesicles, the situation is quite different. Um, this is a cytosol, so the proteins need to, the export proteins act from the inside. So supposedly they are constricting the neck, but this is where they, we assume that they are located, causing some kind of hysteric problem on how they act. The other difference is that these plasma membrane proteins, as I mentioned, they lose their ubiquity at some point, and export proteins can only recognize them by their ubiquity. So it is unclear how they can, the export proteins can uh, retain the cargo in these budding, early budding um, profiles when there is no physical interaction between the cargo and the export machinery. So we have been very interested in understanding these very late stages in vesicle formation. And so the escorts are um, grouping complexes that they are recruited sequentially to the endosomal membrane. Here represented we have, and this is a cartoon, we don't really know how, how this look like, nobody has been able to see it. Um, we have escort one and escort two was able to interact with ubiquitin. Escort three has been shown to form spirals. These proteins are seven different escort three subunits and they form a spiral that help to constrict the, the, the neck. And then uh, finally, SKD1, that is a triple A ATPase, is acting as a chaperone together with the positive regulator RIP5. So together they bind the escort three subunits they remodel somehow these filaments. And the idea based on data in yeast is that um, then they will recycle all the escorts back to the cytosol for another round of vesiculation. So I'm gonna be focusing on two main topics during my talk, the unique features of endosomes in plants and the plant escort machinery during development. And so, um, one important thing that we found is that um, different from what it has been proposed in yeast, where each vesicle form individually and the escorts are at the neck and recycle at the end of the vesiculation process, in plants, um, vesicles form in networks uh, through concatenation. And so there is an uncoupling, a separation, a temporal separation between membrane constriction and scission. So they start to, to form from the limiting membrane, from the body of the limiting membrane, but they remain connected to each other during that process. We also showed, and we published this a few years ago, that um, the escort proteins remain associated with the, the membranes that are being internalized in, in this vesiculation process. They are retained in these bridges. And that, that should be important for trapping membrane proteins into these domains. And so we did a number of uh, mathematical simulations and we came to the conclusion that if the escorts are not retaining this position, forming very strong uh, diffusion barriers, the cargo proteins would escape. And so um, as you can see, the two patterns are quite different and they impose different uh, functions and dynamics for the escort proteins. Um, just to show you some of the data that supported this, uh, this discovery, these are um, electron tomograms. So these are three dimensional reconstructions from uh, transmission electron um, micrograph. And so we can see this is a wild type multivesicular endosome in Arabidopsis, in a root cell, and all these vesicles on the limiting membrane and form connected to each other. So this is what we call concatenation. And what happened is that one vesicle form first and the, the neck is established, and then another one forms the top and the second neck is established and so on. And again, the, the escorts remain trapped as this is happening. So quite different from what it has been described in yeast. And so we predicted that um, the, the concatenation should be important for cargo retention, but is, is that the case? And so uh, I'm gonna introduce now uh, a couple of mutants. Um, so here we have uh, uh, score three mutant, Qin one. So just to remind you, score three forms these filaments that constrict the neck. And so the Qin one mutant in a rabidopsis is either embryo or seed lethal. 
And the other mutant down here is LIP5. So this is a cofactor for the, the chopper and the AAA GPAs that remodel the, the escorts during the, the last phases of escalation. The mutant is quite happy uh, if grown under proper conditions, but is hypersensitive to um, both biotic and abiotic stress. So for these mutants, we were able to determine that indeed they mislocalize plasma membrane proteins. And so here we have examples of the pin oxin efflux carrier, pin three and pin one are expressed um, as fusion with GFP. And this is a root cap of wild type and in lip five. So pin three GFP is localized to the plasma membrane as expected in wild type, but in lip five, besides being at the plasma membrane, there is a strong signal from the vacuolar membrane. And as you can see, I show you this at the beginning, is what you would expect for an expert mutant that fails to sort plasma membrane protein to trap them inside those vesicles. In CHIM, uh, again, it dies as embryo and early seedling. So here we have um, a heart stage embryo wild type showing the localization of PIN at the, at, 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 at the plasma membrane in the mutant, um, there is a strong signal from the vacuum. Now, obviously these mutants are unable to trap or, or, or to sequester these pin proteins on, on vesicles, but what is wrong with those endosomes and how is concatenation important? And so what we were able to show is that in wild type, Again, the large majority of the vesicles are concatenated. We have placed in these tomograms that you can see here. These are tomographic slices from, from the raw data. Um, we have placed some red um, dots just to visualize the vesicles more easily. And this is wild type. You can see here in the gallery some examples of LIP5 and some examples of chin one And what you observe is that there is a reduction in the number of vesicles, but also they are not concatenated. And sometimes they are connected through very long and weird necks that don't seem to, to respond to the normal um, cycle of letting vesicle form constriction, vesicle form constriction. And so here is a quantification of what I shall show you. There is a decrease in vesicle density in the two mutants, but also concatenation is basically lost. You have more than 70% of the vesicles concatenated in wild type, but less than 20% in the mutants. So what is so unique about plants? Why they do this process in such a different way? And we have been, this is, this is a, a long uh, term goal for us to, to understand. And we are studying a number of proteins that we believe are connected to, to that they will be important to explain this difference. Uh, one thing that you notice immediately is that there are many more escort proteins in plants than in other organisms. So these are just the plant uh, escort three proteins. And so they are uh, clustered together where their um, uh, yeast and their uh, animal um, homologs. In the case of IST1, that is just one of these escort 3 subunits, I want to call your attention to this clay, there is only one in yeast, one in humans, but there are 12 in Arabidopsis. And when we look at those more closely, what we notice is that um, they all contain the IST1 domain that is so important for interacting with other uh, escort protein, so it's essential for the function as, as escort uh, subunits. Um, they all have that, but they differ quite a bit in, in, in their sizes, and we couldn't identify any other domains of known function that could help us uh, predict what they could be doing. So to start somewhere, really, we, we decided to um, analyze IST like one through six because these are the most closely related to uh, the yeast um, isoform and because they, they tend to be more similar uh, to each other as well. And so we check their capacity to interact with other escort proteins. So the, the yeast IST1 protein 
uh, interact with gene one. Again, this is SCOR3 protein. Just to remind you what these things are with SKD1, that is the AAA TPAs and with B5. So we checked for those three interactions and found that um, only AST like one, four, and five can interact with this SCOR3 component gene one. Uh, and only AST like one and five can interact with both SKD1 and lip five. So at least their binding capacities and specificities, they don't seem to be fully conserved. We also um, analyze the single mutants. You can see here, I see like one, two, three, and six. These are the tDNA lines that were available at that time. All the single mutants were wild type looking. And so then we cross them with lip, the, the lip five mutant to see if we could uh, uncover some genetic interaction. And we did only for IST like one. So the double IST like one lip five mutant is um, severely compromised. You can see the plants are really small. They have early senescence. They show constitutive pathogen response and they died at this stage when they are growth at 22 degrees. But as for other Mutants showing constitutive pathogen response when you grow them at higher temperatures, like at 28 degrees, then they can um, grow a little uh, further. And in this case, they were able to produce flowers, although they remain pretty much um, infertile. So we were interested in, in understanding why they are infertile. Um, and so we check for pollen viability and found that whereas the single mutants are uh, able to produce perfectly normal pollen, the double mutant in the double mutant anthers, uh, up to 40% of the pollen was um, inviolable, so infertile. And so uh, curiously, if these plants contain at least one wild type allele of IST like one or like five, then the pollen of fertility is normal. And so it seems to be based on this, that the defect uh, seen in the pollen grains is of sporophytic origin. There is something on the anther and in the, in the, in the parent, in the father, that is wrong. So it's a sporophytic defect more than a paternal defect, more than a gametophytic defect. We check more closely those pollen grains and notice that um, compared to wild type and the single mutants, the X sign, the outermost layer of the pollen coat may have some abnormal features in their pattern. So you can see here in this close up, um, the, the patterns are irregular in some areas and in some extreme cases where the pollen grains are completely shriveled, uh, the X sign is very small. By transmission electron microscopy, we were also able to show that uh, whereas the uh, X sign is highly variable in thickness, thin time is not. And um, tryphene, that is another important component of the pollen code, is made of waxes and hydrophobic material. Um, you can see it here um, embedded into the X sign. In the double mutant is very irregular in the position and also have some kind of crystals represented here in, in, in white. And so it gave us idea that there is something normal, abnormal with the deposition of tryphene and waxes. And so we decided to check the, the composition of, of waxes in, in these anthers. And we were able to confirm that the double mutant has um, lower content of sterols and icane within their uh, waxes. So the X sign, both the X sign and the tryphene are actually produced by a sporophytic uh, cell layer called the tapirum, right? So if this is a diagram of an anther in cross section, the tapirum um, recovers the pollen sac and surrounds the microspores while they are developing. And so as the microspore develops through the stages that are well so characterized in a rapidopsis. Um, and in stage seven, we have a tetrad of microspores. At stage eight, the microspores are free in the, in the locule. So the tapirum at this stage is secreting material for the formation of the X sign. At stage nine, is secreting um, tryphene components 
like boxes that it can be incorporated into the pollen wall. And finally, at stage 10, the tapirum will undergo programs of death. So these cells actually live only a few days, two, three days at most, and then they just die as part of their developmental program. So we assume that the pollen uh, lethality that we were seeing in the double mutant were due to the effects in trafficking uh, in the um, plasma membrane protein that were needed for pollen ball formation. And there were two good examples to follow. ABDG16 and ABDG9 have been shown to be at the plasma membrane of tapiral cells and needed for the formation of the exon and the trifling. So we decided to express those two as GFP fusions in our mutants. So this is ABCG9 under its endogenous promoter. It's most highly expressed at stages eight and nine. And so here you can see the wild type. This is the longitudinal view of the anther. So this is the tapirum, this is the locchio, and this is the anther wall. So the magenta uh, spots are chloroplast. And this is just another view of the tapirum. So at this stage, the um, ABCG9 transporter is at the plasma membrane, the same thing in the single mutants, uh, with the caveat that in LIP5 there is also signal from the vacuolar membrane, as expected from an escort mutant, but still very strong signal from the plasma membrane where the transporter is, is plays its function. However, in the double mutant ISD like one LIP5, what we notice is that there is accumulation in endomembrane, but pretty much there is no signal, very little signal from the plasma membrane. This is different from the, all the other genotypes. And we can quantify this by calculating the fluorescent intensity ratio between the plasma membrane and the endomembrane. And you can see here a very strong decrease in the double mutant indicating less uh, localization or, or, or lower uh, uh, signal from the plasma membrane. Um, again, this is not typical of s mutants. This would suggest that somehow the localization was affected either because there was too much endocytosis happening or the plasma membrane, the, the protein never reached the plasma membrane. And that would be a defect in exocytosis. So then we tested ABDG16. ABDG16 is expressed earlier. Uh, so again, these are under the endogenous promoter, and AD, ABDG16 is seen in, in stage seven. And you can see here, wild type is at the plasma membrane and the double mutant as well. These dots are just endosomes. But the transporter is in the right place at this stage in the double mutant. At stage eight, the transporter is degraded, and that happened in both the wild type and the double mutant. You can see very little, it's almost the signal is gone in the answer by this stage. So now we have this situation where one of the ABCG transporters is, is not at the plasma membrane at a later stage, and the other transporter is properly localized by an earlier stage. So it looked like there is a temporal problem going on. And there is also indication that secretion to the plasma membrane may be affected. So we decided to analyze another uh, marker, another cargo. And in this case, we use the lipid transfer protein, lipid transfer protein fused to GFP. So this is a soluble protein that it gets um, uh, secreted through the Golgi, um, through vesicular trafficking and into the locchio. And so if there is a defect in exocytosis, maybe we could see it with this other marker as well. So the advantage is that uh, the LTPs are expressed all during development of the pollen grain. So it, at stage seven, we can see signal from the tapirum. Then we can start the accumulation between the tetrads in the locule when the microspores are free, stage eight. And then we see more and more accumulation on the microspore walls at stage 10. Uh, you can see the wild type tapiral cells almost depleted of all signal because everything has been uh, secreted into the locule. Now for the double mutant, everything progresses just like in wild type until stage nine, when we start to see accumulation within tapiral cells. So all these dots here, you can see in this detail 
Um, so large accumulation of LTP, the, the uh, lipid transfer protein inside the tapial cells, indicating that somehow they are not being secreted into the locule. So these results showed us that the combination of these two mutations, ISTLI1 and I5, is actually affecting secretion, not so much endocytosis, secretion. And um, this is quite unusual for an ACE mutant. We check um, the features of the endosomes, multivesicular endosomes, and as expected in the tapirum of the double mutant, they are abnormal. The multivesicular endosomes are smaller, the intraluminal vesicles are larger. But more surprisingly, what we found is that the TG and the early endosome that also is involved in exocytosis and secretion to the plasma membrane is uh, severely affected with these big, large bulges. So what we have found, again, is a novel function of this escort protein somehow in regulating exocytosis at this particular stage during microspore polymer development. And just for the last couple of slides, I would like to show you what we are doing right now to further understand the function of these enigmatic IST-like proteins. So I mentioned that we have tDNA uh, mutants for one, two, three, um, and six. Uh, more recently, we have these developed CRISPR mutants for four and five. So now we have a very nice collection of mutants to understand what, what is the, the functional meaning of this diversification. So this is a quadruple mutant for one, two, three, and six. Plants are indistinguishable from wild type, perfectly normal. The one, two, four, five, six quintuple mutant is severely dwarf, but it still can produce flowers, normal looking flowers, and is fertile. Now, the combination of IST like three, four, and five results in these very small abnormal seedlings um, with large uraepical meristems, abnormal roots, that somehow are able to, to keep developing and forming an inflorescent meristem that results in something rather abnormal with the flower buds replaced by more meristematic regions. So this is a project that uh, a new postdoc in my lab, Ariadna gonzalez Liz, has started. And so we are very excited. And hopefully in, in, in a few months, we will be able to tell you more about these unusual IST like proteins and what they may be doing in plants. So just to wrap up, I mentioned that vesicle concatenation in plants is very important for trapping cargo, that the double mutant IST like one five plays an expected function in exocytosis in the apical cells and that we are um, making progress in understanding what the other IST-like proteins do in plants. And with that, I would like to uh, thank everyone who um, has been working on this project so hard, uh, Kaya Goodman and Julio Paez Valencia for, for their work on the anthers, uh, Ariana gonzalez Solis for um, the most recent work in the IST-like mutants. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Marisa. Uh, we have room for one quick question. Okay, so we have uh, Luis Cárdenas. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Maria. Nice talk, Marisa. I, I, would, like, I would like to ask you about the, it's a very nice talk about the tapetum and how this is affected. Do you know anything about the pollen tube tip grow? Because this is highly dependent on also from exocytosis and endocytosis. Have you seen any defect? Uh, yeah, so th that's actually what we thought it was happening first. You know, actively growing cells by tip growth would be affected in this mutant. However, if we manage to make double mutant pollen, like in heterozygous mutants, those pollen grains are able to produce pollen tubes normally. And based on the, uh, of the segregation of the mutant alleles, it looks like they are as competitive as a wild type pollen. So it, it seems to be that this combination, these two mutations have a very particular role in tapetal cell. 
We also notice some defects on the secretion of waxes in leaves. So yeah. it may be something connected with this type of transporters um, and in the cells that are expressing them, epidermal cells. But no, we couldn't find any defect in pollen tube growth. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, so um, we're running on a tight schedule, so we need to move on. Thank you so much, Marisa, for your wonderful talk. Um, now I will, um, we, will, we will go now with uh, Jocelyn. Dan, if you want to come in. I am here. Thank you, uh, Mario and Marisa. Um, continuing the plant development session, um, we're going to learn about plasma desmata. It's my great honor to introduce Dr. Yasseline Benitez Alfonso from the University of Leeds. And her talk is PD Wall Met, Dissecting Cell Wall Properties and Cell-to-Cell -cell Signaling via Plasma Desmata. You can take it away, Yasseline. Thank you, Dan. I'm just checking that you can hear me all right. Yes. Yes, okay. Let me share my screen. And there we go. <laughs> Hello, um, buenos dias para aquellos que están en México. Uh, my name is Jocelyn Benitez Alfonso. And as Dan has introduced me, I am associate professor in plant science, plant science at the University of Leeds. And a proud Cuban Spanish <laughs> for your um, knowledge. <laughs> First, I want to thank uh, this MB committee for inviting me to this amazing conference, especially Dan who was the first one to contact me. <laughs> Today, I will share my ongoing work uh, in the discovery of new cell wall components and the mechanisms facilitating intercellular transport via plasmodesmata. So plasmodesmata are these membranous pores that you can see here inserting cell walls through which there is, has been described the transport of proteins, RNAs, small molecules, and connect almost all cells in the plant body. Uh, hello, everybody. It seems like we have some connection issues with uh, Yasalin. Give us one moment and we'll uh, try to reconnect or get the presentation, a recording of the presentation going. One second, please. Hello again. You are back, Yasalin. We can hear you. Oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> I see that there is some issues with the connectivity. I don't know what is going on. So hot. No worries. So some viruses has been shown to move uh, via plasmodesmata. And um, in the picture here, you can see the tobacco mosaic virus, which has been um, filtrated in this young, in this, this mature leaf from where it can move intercellularly and into the new tissue. So clearly controlling plasmodesmata transport could be very important uh, tool for crop improvement. But unfortunately, we still lack knowledge on how are the, what are the factors controlling plasmodesmata formation and what are the regulatory uh, cues. In my lab, we have focused in understanding the role of cell walls in plasmodesmata regulation with the vision of getting new tools to improve crops, but also to develop new biomaterials. So today I will uh, introduce you to the objective of this work, specifically how we are developing knowledge and tools on the composition and regulation of cell walls around plasmodesmata how we are using this knowledge to develop, um, to target new cell components in order to modify plant growth. And finally, if I have the time, I will introduce you into our work in biomaterial design based on the knowledge acquired from plasmodesmata. 
This work has been uh, carried out by a team of researchers in my lab, but also count with the support of amazing collaborations from the plant science to the cell and the physical science and the mathematical modeling. Some of the names uh, are uh, mentioned here. So the work has been funded by UKRI, which is the research council in the UK, and is under this acronym, namely PD Wolmec, which is a stand for Plasmodesma Wall Mechanics. And the reason is because we are going to uh, complement our studies on the structural and cell biology of Plasmodesma that transport and formation with uh, studies on the mechanical properties of the cell walls that surround plasmodesmata in order to get a better understanding and integrated models in which we can clearly predict functional targets to modify plant growth through targeting plasmodesmata. Finally, this knowledge on, on cell wall components will be integrated into material science uh, type of approach to generate new composite materials. The work is supported by companies such as Futamura and others, and by the centers of innovation and leads, including the Asbury Center and the Bragg Center for Material Research. So this is a real cross-disciplinary area that is inspired really by the understanding of the role of Kalos. Kalos is a cell wall polysaccharide that accumulate at plasmodesmata site. This is seen here in immunolocalization in cell walls of tomato pericarp, where Kalos can be seen fluorescent in a green based on an antibody that is specific to Kalos. So this beta-1-3 glucan has been shown or has been suspected to modify plasmodesmata transport through increasing the accumulations of cell walls around plasmodesmata, thus limiting the cytoplasmic aperture that allow molecules to pass through the channel. Calos synthases and beta-1-3 glucanases are the enzymes that synthesize and degrade calos, and the activities of these enzymes has been shown at plasmodesmata. Moreover, we now have uh, mutants in these enzymes, such as this PD-located beta-glucanase, which I described in 2013, which shows really, really exciting phenotypes, such as in here, you can see the formation of groups of lateral roots, which is very unusual in Arabidopsis. In other mutants, such as the Calosynthase 3, expressed on the rest and estradiol-inducible promoter, described by Ika Hilariuta lab, you can see that there is an induction of, uh, of calos upon estradiol um, application. And this induction of, of calos lead to general uh, reductions in plant growth in Arabidopsis, suggesting again that calos play a really important, root, important role in plant development. We have been exploiting uh, further uh, the tools that we have uh, developed to modify calos by applying this knowledge into novel signaling processes such as the formation of nodules during legume rhizobia interaction. As many of you probably know, nodules are uh, organs that are formed to host the bacteria rhizobia. Here, these are shown here in Medicago truncatula plan, and we see nodules, the rhizobia is able to fix nitrogen. Therefore, this is an, a very important uh, process for uh, sustainable agriculture. And we know that um, different uh, factors modulate signaling to the form and control the formation of nodules in legumes. These are long distance signals from shoots, uh, which are controlled by the receptor, clavat receptor sun, and also short distance signaling that occurs between the epidermal and the cortical tissues, uh, which has been related with the uh, expression of the transcription factor noduling section one or name. So we were wondering if plasmodesmata could play a role in these transport processes. And in collaboration with uh, Fernanda Carvalho Nivel in Toulouse, we uh, studied this aspect by designing a line that expresses uh, YFP, a mobile version of YFP in the epidermal cell layer. 
As you can see here, this uh, YFP gets restricted in the mature epidermal cell laying roots, suggesting that the epidermis is disconnected to the underlying tissue, this in non-inoculated plants. But when rhizobia is present, somehow these channels are open and transport of GFP start to occur in between the epidermal and the underlying tissues, suggesting that plasmodesmata is active. For their work, identify a beta-1-3 glu uh, beta glucanase, which uh, localizes and uh, express in these uh, nodules, and uh, since the very beginning of the infection process and into the nodule development. A topic expression of this beta-1-3 glucanase in legumes, in this case Medicago truncatula, uh, really increase the number of nodules that are informed during infection, whereas silencing of this beta-glucanase use, uh, using an RNAi line lead to a reduction in nodules. Again, suggesting that this beta-1-3 glucanase participate in nodule formation. For their work, a specific, uh, especially the fact that the transcription factor NIN fails to be inducing the nodules in lines in which callosynthase 3 is, is, is activated, led us to propose these models in which plasmodesmata mediate the transport of signals between the outer cell layer into the inner cell layer to regulate the nodule formation in response to rhizobia infection. And these beta-glucanases are a part of this mechanism. But questions remain on how these uh, mechanisms are actually integrated with other mechanisms or in, uh, that regulate nodule formation, specifically the long-distance uh, regulation of uh, nodules in response to nitrate and uh, in response to the plant physiological status, which is controlled by the clavata uh, factor zone. We have made a little bit of progress in this area by identifying a novel receptor like kinase, which is expressed in a small amount after rhizobia infection in medicago roots. But this expression gets very well increased in mutants in sun, suggesting that indeed this, uh, the regulation of this receptor like kinase is um, relying on sun. This receptor like kinase uh, locate at plasmodesmata, as you can see here in this confocal micrograms, micrograph in which the, the fusion protein in this receptor like kinase co localized with aniline blue ankylose in the uh, peri cell, uh, cell wall periphery, suggesting that is plasmodesmata locations. A topic expression of this receptor like kinase really didn't show us any natural phenotype. So we were kind of wondering what would be their role. And due to the role of sun in nitrate, we um, uh, started to look at what is the effect of um, this uh, overexpression of this line in the presence of nitrate. And we found that Although control plants are able to reduce calos in the presence of nitrate and rhizobia in medicago roots, this was not possible in this overexpression line of this receptor like kinase, suggesting that this receptor like kinase really integrate with the process of calos regulation in response to nitrate in medicago roots and in response to rhizobia. Concomitantly, we can see that the um, infection threats or the formation of infection sites and the formation of nodules in nitrate increase when uh, topically expressing this receptor like kinase. So we're still figuring out how nitrate and alterations in both some and this uh, plasmodesmata located receptor mechanistically modify calos and symplastic intercellular transport. But uh, watch this space, is what I will say. So, so far I have shown you examples in which targeting callos regulation at plasmodesmata can be used as a tool to modify plant growth. But the project in general comprises several other cell wall components. And we are starting to understand and I said what are these other cell wall components that might contribute with calos in plasmodesmata regulation. 
This is an example of the type of techniques that we are using. This is a Raman spectroscopy. So we are basically looking at regions in which calos is deposited using Raman and, at, uh, and applying a principal component analysis to identify peaks that are co-regulated with the calos. We can see here that certain hemicellulosis and pectins are uh, identified in this principal compo component three, which is rich in calos. And further analysis using cell wall probes uh, identified uh, by Paul Knotts in, 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 and plant probes uh, led us uh, to identify which type of pectins are those. So here, for example, we can see that these uh, pit fields in cell walls are uh, depleted in uh, Ramnogalaturonan 1 galat uh, with the linear galatan side change, whereas they are enriched in branch galatan side change. So very uh, small modifications in these pectins leads to a different conformation of these pectins and seems that a specific uh, variants of these are surrounding plasmodesmata and co-localized with calos and potentially modifying plasmodesmata transport. But to test this hypothesis, we need to identify which proteins are, uh, are modulating the regulation of these other cell wall polysaccharides. And for this, we are uh, carrying out a bioinformatic approach in which um, we integrate the knowledge obtained from the different plasmodesmata proteomes, uh, which has been published so far. So this has generated a pipeline by one of uh, my students, which uh, integrate the, the different families identified in these proteomes and identify the genes within these food families uh, that encodes domains characteristic of non plasmodesmata proteins, such as signal peptides, transmembrane domains, and GPI anchors. This classify the output in different lists, at, at least according to the likelihood to find these proteins at plasmodesmata. Such as in Arabidopsis, 206 proteins were identified in that list A, which contain these uh, uh, structural features and a likelihood to target plasmodesmata sites. What we can do with this list is now, is now uh, create interactomes, so co-expression analysis to understand which of these proteins are expressed in relation to uh, normal regulators of plasmodesmata such as calos. And by looking closely to this type of interactomes, we can identify not only calos modifying enzymes, but closely related enzymes that modify cellulose, hemicellulose, pectins, and encode cell wall proteins. So this is now a new pool of enzymes and, and, and proteins that we are starting to study to dissect what their role at plasmodesmata are by using uh, genetic mutations in these proteins and studying closely what is their intracellular localization. So to summarize this second part, not only calos is accumulated at plasmodesmata, but cell walls around plasmodesmata has a, a specific uh, cell composition of pectins as hemicelluloses, and we are starting to identify proteins that regulate those and uh, uh, understanding what their role is in the regulation of transport. But how really cell walls composition regulate plasmodesmata transport? The general idea or belief is that calos and other cell wall components physically constrict plasmodesmata aperture and thereby reduce the cytoplasmic sleeve that allow transport through the channel. This model has been challenged recently by the group of Emmanuel Bayer, which discovered this type one or clue plasmodesmata with not visible cytoplasmic sleeve. Despite no visible cytoplasmic sleeve, though no means to where the, the transport can occur, okay, this plasmodes matter seems to be highly permeable, or at least are highly present in very permeable tissue, suggesting that they are very functional. So how this happened? 
This question was partially addressed by using computational models with Eva Dynan in, in, the, ne in the Netherlands, which use uh, the a mathematical description of the geometrical features of plasma desmata to uh, devise a formula to calculate, to calculate the effective perme permeability of the wall based on plasma desmata features, but also on plasma desmata density. When Eva compared uh, the differences in permeability between a straight plasmodesmata, like uh, the ones uh, defined as type one, in which the cytoplasmic sleeve and the neck region is of the same size, with type two plasmodesmata, in which we have a higher cytoplasmic sleeve, she could see that there was very little differences in thinner cell walls. So in cell walls that are young. Whereas these differences are more, much more significant in mature cell walls. Does this make sense? Does that we actually have this type one plasmodesmata existing, existing in very young cell walls? But that doesn't explain how callos or other cell wall polymers add, add plasmodesmata. To it, kind of investigate this question, I took on some kind of physical model to mimic what happened with Kalos at Plasmodesmata. So I created a Kalos cellulose mixtures in ionic liquid, which then are uh, reprecipitated to form hydrogels that can be studied using a scanning electron microscopy. So these hydrogels of various concentration were obtained and, where and the mechanical properties of the hydrogels were determined using FM nano indentation and a test rate analyzer. Our findings shows that young modulus was reduced as callous concentration increased, whereas the ductibility of the gel represented here as the rupture point really uh, increased with increases in callous concentration suggesting that basically callos add as a plasticizer to cellulose, so giving it a more elastic uh, fissure. Interestingly, these changes were not linear, so very little callos induce higher differences in these young models, suggesting indeed that callos and cellulose might interact. Thus, it's very difficult to predict the properties that these mixtures will generate. This model kind of is, uh, makes sense if we consider callos as a structural um, component of plasmodesmata. So maybe callos is necessary in this type one plasmodesmata to give or to provide some kind of elasticity to these cell walls, those allowing these cell walls to be modified for the transport of bigger molecules such as EFP. These findings also open the door to identify new biomaterials obtained by mixtures of callos and cellulose, which is an area that we are exploiting uh, with industry. So, but we are interested in, in, in understanding this further. So we see this PD wall make project. We are understanding the contribution of other cell wall components, pectins and hemicellulose. And we are asking the question how these cell wall properties around plasmodesmata really vary with different cell types and plant species, and how this contribution really integrates with plant development and responses to the environment. And I'm going to give thank you to all the ones that deserve um, uh, done this job in my lab. Lian Germa, Philil Kir, Candela Spaniagua, San Asbury, Mercedes Hernandez, Radu Abusalet, and Rocio Gaudioso Pedraza specifically contributed to the slides that I have shown uh, here today. I have counted with amazing collaborators, including uh, Eika Hilary Utah, uh, Fernanda de Carvalho Niver, Emmanuel Bayer, Paul Knox, Mike Rees, and Eva Dynan. And with the support of several agencies, we've seen a UK and the Liberhume Trust. And please connect with us uh, via Twitter at Benitez Alfonso Lab and visit our website at Benitez Alfonso WordPress. 
Muchas gracias. Thank you for your attention. And I hope that we have some time for questions. We have plenty of time for questions. And that was a wonderful talk, Yaseline. I really <laughs> love the, uh, the modeling and especially the material science and mechanical modeling. That's really cool. We have a, a first question from uh, Luis Cardenas. And uh, you should be able to unmute now, Luis. Thank you. Thank you, Jocelyn. I got two very short questions. As you said, the overexpression of the glucanase induces a higher no nodulation. Do you have any idea about the mycorrhizal interaction? Do you see also, do you expect to have also an effect on this kind of interaction? And my second question is talking That's about very... the cell wall compost. Yeah. My, yeah. my okay. second question is about the composition of the cell wall in the plasmodes matter. Do we yeah. have any idea about the pectin composition? I'm talking about the, the, the nature of the pectin. Is this most uh, the esterified or this is esterified pectin? Okay, that's good that I have answered to both of your questions. <laughs> Okay. No, 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 maybe no successful answers, but the answer that yeah. I have so far. So in terms of the mycorrhiza fungi, we are starting to, to look at that. Um, so far, what we have done in the lab is uh, investigating if uh, arbuscula mycorrhiza induce um, also a changes in calos deposition and in intercellular transport. And mm -hmm. what we have found so far is that uh, arbuscular mycorrhiza do not in, uh, reduce calos, but instead uh, increase calos in the root, uh, so suggesting that it's a different mechanism. In any case, we have a starting to use the mutants, uh, including the sun mutant, uh, to, to uh, exposing them to rhizobia and arbuscular mycorrhiza to actually understand if there is interaction between the two symbionts that could um, right. kind of dissect a crosstalk mm -hmm. between these uh, pathways. Right. So the arbuscular mycorrhiza fungi uh, is ongoing. <laughs> um, the problem with arbuscular mycorrhiza is that we have to do the infection in soil. So it's very difficult from the cell biology point of view, um, whereas we can do in rhizobia in plates, so we can nicely have nice roots to actually visualize what is happening all the time. <laughs> in terms of the, uh, does that answer your question? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yes. In terms of the cell wall composition of pectin composition, um, we are um, studying the pectin composition, not only by using these uh, molecular props that you have seen here, but also by using other approaches such as the co kind of immunoprecipitation with calos. So what we have been starting to do is taking um, calos um, and a protein that binds calos and uh, precipitating this protein in cell wall extract and seeing what else is coming up with the calos. And uh, this is unpublished data, but there is some the, the sterified pet things that comes uh, with the calos, suggesting that potentially they are at very close proximity at plasmodesmata. We have used props against the sterified pet things, but we haven't found a specifically accumulated at plasmodesmata. But that doesn't mean that they don't interact with the calos. So what we are seeing in, in, in these props is that sometimes when we increase calos, we also increase some of these desterified pet things. So there is a more complex interaction between these polysaccharides that, that the one that I have described today that we are just starting to, to, to dissect. Thank you, Yosemite. Yeah. I think we have uh, two quick questions in the chat. The first is from Gerardo Valdez. He says, uh, what about senescence? Callos is used to accumulate in several tissues according to phenophase, maybe about senescence? Yeah, okay. So, <laughs> We have um, we having a study senescence specifically because senescence is with when actually plasmodesmata seems to to stop functioning in in the way that we um, so we are more focused on meristematic tissue or developing tissue, 
But in the past, in College Spring Harbor, where I was in College Spring Harbor, uh, we use uh, we identify gate one, which was a mutant in um, a, a type reduction that indirectly modify plasmodesmata transport. And what we found is that when we uh, topically express this protein on the senescent promoter, we could uh, delay senescent in these lines, which was really interesting. We didn't expect that, but that's something that we saw that's probably due to the uh, export of sugars that occur during senescent, uh, senescent tissue. But we haven't followed up that area of research. Well, thank you. We're at the end of the time. That was a great presentation, Yasmin. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Gracias. <laughs> and up next, we have Stuart Gilmore. Uh, he's coming from Lanhebio. And his talk will be the zygotic genome activation in Arabidopsis. You can take it away, Stuart. Okay, let's see here. Okay, can you see my screen? It looks good and we can hear you. Okay, thanks. Thanks so much, Dan. Um, thanks to the organizers uh, for organizing such a great meeting. And for inviting me, it's really a pleasure to be here. Let me just fiddle with my screen here a little bit. Um, hold on a second. Sorry, people. No worries. Take your I'm time. just trying to like minimize a window here. Here we go. Okay. Yeah, so um, I'm going to talk about zygotic genome activation in Arabidopsis and work we've been doing on this in my lab uh, for about the last 10 years. Um, so in my lab, we work on seed development, um, and we use Arabidopsis thaliana, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. We use it to work on embryo development in particular um, because Arabidopsis seeds are very easy to clear. Um, and so it's really easy to look at them under a microscope, which has been very important for, for a lot of our work. And seeds are really interesting because uh, they have, they are composed of tissues of different origins and of different ploides. So if you have, a, we, here's a seed, this is about three days after fertilization. We have a globular stage embryo. This is the seed coat, which is maternal tissue. And then you have the embryo, which is the product of fertilization of uh, the sperm and the, the, the egg. So it's diploid with one maternal and one paternal genome. Then you have the endosperm, which has two maternal genomes and one paternal genome. So there's, there's all kinds of interesting genetics going on here. Um, and what I'm going to talk about today is uh, zygotic genome activation, as the title says. We also study pattern formation in my lab. Um, um, but zygotic genome activation is what goes on in the first few days or so after fertilization um, when the newly united uh, maternal and paternal genomes become zygotically active, um, and it's part of the maternal to zygotic transition in, in early embryogenesis. So this is something uh, that also occurs in animals and that people have been studying for a long time, and there's quite broad agreement about how this works, how the maternal to zygotic transition works in animals. Um, and the, the consensus is that there's an early period of maternal regulation of embryogenesis. And then depending on the species, uh, it could be a few hours later or about a day later, the zygotic uh, genome takes over the regulation of development and maternal transcripts are actively uh, degraded. So you have early maternal regulation, zygotic re regulation starts up, and then you, you, uh, the maternal transcripts and proteins are often actively degraded so that you have zygotic regulation of embryogenesis. Why does this happen? There's several different uh, hypotheses. Um, in some species, for example, in Drosophila, the early uh, divisions of the nuclei are so fast that you can't actually transcribe anything more than a short gene. So they, they couldn't regulate their own early development. Another idea might be to allow reconciliation of chromatin marks that come in from the sperm and the egg, something that Rob Martinson was talking about earlier. And another idea is it's a way of avoiding um, too much pat uh, paternal control in early embryogenesis where the mother wants to 
um, allocate resources equally to all of her offspring. And so she would uh, tamp down on paternal gene activity early on. So the, I'm going to talk about work, obviously, today in plants. And there's people have been studying this topic in plants now for about 20 years. Um, and we're still trying to get to a consensus about how this works. Um, there were early hypotheses, really two. Um, one was, a situ uh, was uh, similar to animals, where early embryogenesis in plants is under maternal control, and after a few days, uh, the zygotic genome takes over. Other evidence supported very early zygotic regulation of, of embryogenesis in plants, so almost the role of maternal regulation would be very, very short. I mean, that's what I'm going to talk about today. Let's see here. Hmm. Okay. So um, here's an outline for my talk. Um, it's very important to distinguish between studies that people have done using isogenic embryos and using hybrid embryos that you need to do parent of origin transcriptome profiling. So in the first part, I'm going to talk about like studies of zygotic genome activation in isogenic embryos. So transcriptomes and functional analyses using embryo defective mutants. The next part, I'm going to talk about genome activation in hybrid embryos, also transcriptomes and, and functional analysis with embryo defective mutants. And in the last part, I'm going to talk about a recent meta-analysis we've done of transcriptome data from hybrid different studies of hybrid zygotes and embryos. So as to when uh, transcription starts in the zygote in plants, I think pretty much everyone agrees now that it starts very early. Um, so these are studies from maize, rice, and Arabidopsis over the last few years. And they all came to the conclusion. So these are studies where they were comparing egg cells and zygotes, isogenic, okay, so self self plants, and they found that about 10% of the genome, the transcriptome is upregulated in the zygote compared to the egg cell within a few hours of fertilization. So transcription of a good portion of the genome starts early, but it's not the whole genome. It's really about 10% about according to these studies. So there were also, um, from a number of years ago, other experiments using enhancer trap and different kinds of markers where they found signal um, for the markers very early, but the observation was that it was the maternal allele that was more highly expressed than the paternal allele. So those first observations were from Jean-Philippe Vier about 20 years ago. Then uh, Daphne Autron made other observations about uh, 10 years later. Um, looking a little bit more carefully. And, and it's not that there's no expression of the of paternal markers, but it was less than maternal markers. So, but the idea that there might be um, more expression of maternal alleles in early embryos was, was controversial from the beginning. There are a number of examples of markers where they were expressed essentially equally between the maternal and paternal alleles. Here's a bunch of references. And I think also um, people were skeptical about um, a more important maternal role early on because of the large collection of embryo defective mutants, which exist in Arabidopsis. There, there are about 500. Um, this is work from David Meinke's lab over many years, as well as others. And if you, so embryo defective genes are genes that are absolutely required for embryogenesis. Um, and so in the absence of gene function, you get phenotypes, the embryo could die or it could continue growing, but just be abnormal. And if you look, if you take a heterozygous mutant plant and you self it, and you look um, at Salik's like that I'm showing here of a late stage Salik, um, you see about 25% mutants consistent with a zygotic effect. So if they were maternal effects, you would see 50% mutants because the plant is heterozygous. Um, and so it was about this time that, that, that I started my lab and we started thinking about this issue. And one of the first things that we did was to order a bunch of embryo defective mutants from the, the Arabidopsis Stock Center. And um, this is work by my former PhD student, Gerardo del Toro. And 
um, what he did was to start, he grew all these embryo defective mutants and looked carefully for phenotypes starting at two days after pollination, two, three, five in mature embryos, and to look at segregation ratios. And what he found is uh, there's a lot of variation, of course, because you're looking here at penetrance, expressibility, all kinds of things are going on. But there were some of these embryo defective mutants in selfed plants where at two days after pollination, you get more than 25% mutants. Some of them actually have 30 or 40 or almost 50% mutant phenotypes during a short window. And then late, during development, the embryos, uh, the percentage of mutant embryos decreases to where it's about 25% later on. So this suggested that something a little bit more complicated is going on. It's not just purely a zygotic effect. Um, but the a more clear way of testing for um, maternal effects, yeah, and another way of putting it is to test if the paternal allele has full activity, is to take an embryo defective mutant as a mother and cross it with wild type of pollen um, as a father. And in, in the case that the wild type alleles are fully active, fully transcribed, fully translated, et cetera, um, these wild type alleles, unless there's haploid insufficiency, should be able to cover the lack of a mutant, uh, the lack of a functional maternal allele. And so in the case we have full paternal activity, uh, if you look at the embryos after developing, after doing this cross, you won't see any mutant phenotypes because they'll all be either heterozygous or wild type. 50% will be heterozygous, 50% will be wild type. But in the case where there may be less paternal allele activity, um, what you would expect and the, the paternal alleles might not be able to compensate for the lack of a maternal allele. And then you'll get some mutant phenotypes that you see, but the percentage of phenotypes uh, that is segregating a sleek actually decreases uh, during development. And so um, Gerardo did this, this fairly giant experiment where he crossed, um, in the end, it was 49 embryo defective mutants. He crossed them with wild, this is all in Columbia ecotype. Um, he crossed them with wild type pollen and he found, this is a heat map summarizing his results right here. And these are uh, clearing preps. So these are what the embryos look like when he's doing this assay. Here's an example for ATSY3A where the wild type allele from Columbia can complement the lack of a mat functional maternal allele. Essentially all the embryos look normal. Here's another example of BMB 2804, where the wild type paternal allele essentially uh, 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 at the beginning is not totally functional because you see mutant phenotypes 21% at two days, 4.9% at three days. By five days, there are very few um, mutant phenotypes. And so of these 49 embryo defective mutants, 80% um, showed maternal effects. So that's this purple here. So purple is 50% mutants and beige is 0% mutants. So 80% of them showed some kind of maternal effect, which was transient. Okay. While 20% of the genes that he tested showed no maternal effect whatsoever. So um, apparently the paternal allele here is perfectly capable of complementing a maternal allele um, in early embryogenesis. And more recently, um, Axel Orozco Nieto, a master's student in my lab, went back to these experiments and used 24 additional embryo defective mutants. And he found similar things. So here we have maternal effects on the left, paternal effects on the right. So he tested both maternal and paternal effects. So again, for a maternal effect, you take a heterozygous embryo defective mutant as a mother, you cross it with wild type as a father. To test a paternal effect, you take a wild type mother and you cross it with a heterozygous embryo defective as a father. And when the embryo defective was used as a mother, um, if, uh, we found um, a number of well maternal effects for all these mutants. When it was used as a father, some of them, about 10 of them had some paternal effect. The rest had essentially no paternal effect, but the paternal effects were always less uh, severe than the maternal effects. So from this first part of the talk, the conclusions um, are that, uh, that transcription of the genome does start soon after fertilization. It's not the whole genome, um, but it does start early. And the work with the maternal, uh, the embryo defective alleles 
shows that at least for these 73 genes that we tested, the maternal allele is, is, is um, initially more important than the paternal allele. So to talk about um, work in hybrid embryos, um, obviously to, to look at, at the GM level, you need to do transcriptomes. To assign uh, reads to a mother or father, you need to use polymorphic ecotypes. So for example, it could be Landsberg and Columbia, and you take advantage of the polymorphisms um, in the parents to assign reads in the zygote to one parent or the other. Okay, and so a number of labs have done these kinds of experiments. Um, one was published by Nodine, Nodine and Bartel um, in 2012 using the CVI Columbia hybrid, where they found essentially equal maternal and paternal reads um, at the one to two cell stage um, and at the octant stage and at the globular stage. Um, uh, uh, just a couple of years ago, another study was published by Zhao et al. in Developmental Cell, where they used a Columbia Landsberg hybrid, um, and they found at 14 hours after pollination, so quite early, they did find more maternal transcripts, but by 24 hours after pollination, the number of total transcripts was, was quite equal between the maternal and paternal genomes. Here's a study from Rice where they found some, uh, something quite different. They found a massive maternal bias um, in, in early zygotes. So, so these studies with hybrid embryos didn't all come to the same conclusion. Um, and especially just thinking about the, the Arabidopsis results, it's hard to reconcile equal maternal and paternal transcripts with the results that we found with functional results with embryo defective mutants, where we found more maternal effects than paternal effects. Um, one way to explain this might be that hybridization um, that's required for uh, produ producing these parent of origin transcriptomes has effects on paternal allele activity. And so to, to look at that, this is, this is data from Axel Orozco that analyzed by Jaime Alanis. And so uh, what, what this is showing is uh, it's taking Axel did crosses and instead of using wild type Columbia as the father when crossing to an embryo defective mutant in Columbia as the mother, he used different ecotypes. So he used CVI, Landsberg. So these are the two hybrids that I just showed you in the previous slide. He also used uh, TSU and Burr. Um, and what he found, this is a very nice result, um, as you might expect in Columbia CVI, especially, and also in Columbia Landsberg uh, hybrids, the maternal effects are less. So these have been normalized to the same cross, but using Columbia as the father. So one would be the hybrid is exactly the same as an isogenic cross. So these hybrids show uh, less maternal effects. They do have a maternal effect, but it's less, um, which or earlier paternal allele activation. Whereas these other two hybrids here um, showed maternal effects that are, were exactly the same as uh, isogenic Columbia. So um, luckily, or uh, uh, Raju Datla and Daquan Shang had actually um, produced a transcriptome from the, the Columbia 2 hybrid, which based on our functional analysis was very, very similar to isogenic Columbia in terms of maternal effects. Um, at several different stages, um, crosses in both directions, a good number of reads. Um, and so we analyzed, uh, this is Jaime Alanis analyzed this data, and we found something different um, compared to this Columbia CVI and Columbia Landsberg experiments, um, which is that uh, there's an early maternal bias uh, at the zygote one cell and octant stage, but beginning at the globular stage, there's essentially equal maternal and paternal rates. Um, and there's another way of showing it. This is looking a uh, statistical analysis, looking at the reads to see if they have and the different kinds of parent of origin uh, behavior you see here, thousands of genes at the zygote one cell stage and at the octant stage show a maternal bias in both directions, um, suggesting that again, there, yeah, there is a maternal bias in this hybrid in early embryos. We don't think this maternal bias is due to contaminating transcripts from the, uh, from the sporophyte, from the seed coat, for example, because when Jaime, um, he, he did these analysis where he graphed the maternal fraction of reads per gene, and then he divided the genes based on the zygote to ovule ratio. 
And there's no uh, relationship between genes which are expressed more highly in the ovule compared to genes that are more ex expressed more highly in the zygote. So uh, we think this is quite good evidence that our results are not swayed by maternal contamination. Um, another really interesting thing that he found um, is that the maternal bias of transcripts in the zygote is not correlated to the level of the relative level of the transcript in the egg. So su yeah, suggesting that uh, uh, this maternal bias might actually be due to active transcription um, in the zygote. Um, here, uh, Kaime looked at, uh, these are genes which are expressed in the zygote that are absent in the egg. They're highly maternal. Um, and he found a similar thing where he looked at genes that are expressed at 10 times higher in the zygote compared to the ovule. And then he had this very nice idea of looking at intron reads. So you can think of intron reads as a kind of proxy for active transcription um, because they're still nuclear. And he found that uh, in at the zygote and octant stages, the, the intron reads are also highly maternal, whereas at the globular stage, they're at about 50-50. So again, consistent with an early maternal transcript bias that may be due to active uh, a bias towards transcription of maternal alleles. So the conclusion of this part of the talk, um, embryo, embryo defective mutants uh, in crosses between Columbia and Sioux and Columbia and Burr show maternal effects that are indistinguishable from isogenic Columbia. Transcriptomes of Columbia and Sioux hybrids show a bias um, in maternal transcripts in early embryos. And this maternal transcript bias is likely or at least possibly due to preferential transcription of maternal alleles. So and just uh, for the last bit of my talk here, so getting back to these other transcriptomes, different scientists came to different conclusions. Here's a summary here of the total reads, okay? So again, Nodine and Bartel found 50% maternal and paternal reads at these stages. Zhao et al. found an early maternal bias, but it was 50-50 by 24 hours after pollination. Whereas, whereas in our analysis of the Tsu columbia hybrid, we found about 80% maternal reads um, at the one to two cell zygote stage, 73% uh, at the octant stage, and then about 50-50 at the globular stage. But these are total maternal and paternal reads, not reads per gene. So that's an important thing to, to keep in mind. And another um, source of difference between these studies could be the way you analyze the data and the way you represent it. So um, Nodine and Bartel and Zhao et al. represented their parent of origin data as log two fold change of one ecotype over the other. Um, and you get these very nice um, curves here, which, which are centered around zero, which is equal maternal and paternal transcripts. Here in Zhao, um, these ones that are a little bit uh, set off, offset from zero at 14 hours when there are more maternal transcripts, and then by 24 hours, it's exactly at, at zero. When we analyze our own data, uh, graphed our own data using this log two full change, we also found that at the zygote one cell and, and octant stages, there's a maternal bias, which is essentially gone by the glibus stage. Okay, but um, it turns so we it turns out that representing the data as log fold change makes um, genes which are transcribed from one allele and not the other disappear. You don't see them, and so when we graph the nodine data and the Jawadal data and our data also as maternal fraction, this is the same way that I showed you our data a little bit earlier. The conclusions of Noda and Bertel are essentially the same. There's almost no parent of origin behavior in this hybrid. Um, there's, there's small peaks here. So the, the, the maternal fraction is one is uh, the gene, the reads are exclusively maternal and zero would be the reads are exclusively paternal and 0.5 is equal maternal and paternal. So Nodine consistent with their conclusions, they're almost, there's almost no parent of origin behavior in Columbia CVI hybrids at all. However, in the Zhao data, um, we saw what they saw, which is that there is a maternal bias here at 14 days. And then by 24 days, there's nice peaks here at 0.5, which is equal transcripts. But there are also very prominent peaks 
of, of reads that are either exclusively maternal or exclusively paternal. Um, and in the case of our data, we saw uh, there's a maternal bias here early on, uh, which shifts to being uh, more biallelic during early embryo development and very little um, genes with paternal bias. So this was kind of unexpected. Um, the Just looking a little bit more at this data and these reads that are either uh, highly maternal or highly paternal, they're actually a very large part of the data set. Um, at the 14 hours after pollination stage, there are about 42% of the reads are unidirectional and at the 20, and 24 hours after pollination, about 24%. And so this is really, uh, was a little bit surprising, um, but does go, I think, a long way in reconciling um, the previous conclusions from this transcriptome with our conclusions from functional data. Um, and it just also uh, looking at uh, intron reads, so as a, as a marker of active transcription, um, it's, it's quite interesting. Here in the Zhao data at 14 hours after pollination, you do see a, a large bias towards maternal transcripts, these are intron reads, whereas at 24 hours after pollination, um, the different directions of the cross are quite different. When Landsberg is the mother and Columbia is the father, the reads are more distributed evenly between equal maternal and paternal transcripts or only paternal or only maternal. Whereas when Columbia is the mother, you see actually very strong biases towards either being uh, maternal or paternal, but not both. Um, and in the Columbia 2 transcriptome, we saw something active transcription that actually looks quite a bit like total transcripts, again, suggesting that these biases may be due to active transcription. So uh, the, from the third part of the talk, the conclusions here, um, there are thousands of genes in Columbia Landsberg hybrid zygotes that are transcribed from either the maternal or the paternal allele, but not both. Um, so it's a scenario that's closer to non-equivalent uh, parental contrib contributions to the zygote. Columbia CVI hybrids show almost no parent of origin behavior at all, so more like equal transcripts. And Columbia 2 hybrids show a maternal bias in transcripts and zygotic transcripts transcription early on. So just to kind of sum up here, this is a model that we published a number of years ago. Um, and if we look at the, and, and the idea of the model was there's differences between isogenic embryos and hybrid embryos. In isogenic embryos, um, the maternal con contribution here in green um, starts quite early and is quite significant. Whereas paternal contributions on a gene by gene basis, many of them are initially lower and then increase to being equal to maternal while there are other genes whose paternal alleles are active early on. And the, the idea of this model is that this trend that you see in isogenic embryos um, is, can be deregulated or changed in different hybrid combinations. And so we think that Columbia 2, the hybrid that we used, that Raju Dotless Lab used for the transcription piling, is, is, shows delayed paternal activation and is most similar to isogenic Columbia, where you have on the other end of the spectrum, Columbia CVI hybrids, where they have early paternal genome activation and Columbia Landsberg, where it seems to vary um, depending on the gene. Um, so just to sum up, um, it's kind of a twist on the model that I presented at the beginning of my talk, where again, it depends on the hybrid, but we think in uh, isogenic Columbia and in Columbia 2 hybrids, there is um, more maternal regulation of early embryogenesis, but it's zygotic maternal activity, not inherited maternal transcripts um, that are playing a more important role in regulating early embryogenesis. And um, so the people that did this work, Gerardo de Toro um, started this project when he was a PhD student in my lab. He did the first part of the experiments. Uh, Axel Orozco um, followed up with more functional analysis of embryo defective mutants. Uh, Jaime Alaniz, Axel was a master's student. Jaime Alaniz, who's currently a PhD student in my lab, has done all the computational analysis. And Daniel Lepe actually worked on another aspect of this project that I didn't have time to talk about. So I'll be happy to, I think maybe I have a little bit of time. I'll be happy to take any questions. Maybe one question.
There's plenty of time. We're we're running up into a break. So if oh, oh has- great, okay, <laughs> good. But uh, raise your hand if you have a question, or if you feel more comfortable, you can write it in the chat, and we can ask Stuart. See, there's a number of chat questions here. Um, oh, I think these. Might- oh, maybe it's one. Ch- oh no, sorry, I don't. Maybe there's one chat question from Julian Peña Castro. If you can read it, Stuart, I've been direct messaging too many people. Do you think these observations may be based on transcription factors and our promoter boxes competition? Mm. Hmm. Well, they're certainly related to transcription. I think they're probably more related to epigenetics and um, what's going on in the the gametes and what's going on after fertilization. Um, and it, our results suggest that, I guess, like a lot of things in biology, it's less simple and more complicated than it originally was going to be. Um, and so we think that probably in different hybrids, there may be different things going on. And we're really interested in understanding it better, obviously. I have a question. You, you were mentioning at the very end that different genotypes behave very differently with respect to maternal and paternal contributions. And I know it's probably a very open-ended question, but you focus so strongly on transcriptomics and developmental biology. How does that tie in back to genetics itself? And is, is there ties with like hybrid vigor or how does that connection between the genetics and development play out? Right. So I would love to have a better answer for you than the one that I have, which is that we, for, uh, for years, we wanted to actually look um, at different hybrids to see if there are differences in cell division in the embryo. All these hybrid embryos, it's not like they die. They're all, you know, okay. Um, so uh, um, Meng Shan Sun's lab recently published a paper where they showed that the suspensor length um, in hybrids corresponded with the maternal ecotype that you used in the cross, you know, that Landsberg has a slightly shorter suspensor when you cross with Columbia, the suspensor length depends on the maternal genotype. Um, I think actually the most interesting thing that we've discovered is this hybridization effect because it was, well, it was quite unexpected for me. Um, and I would like to better understand what is going on. Is it a kind of heterosis that starts really early? That would be really cool. Um, I, we need to do the experiments. I don't, but yeah, I, I, I think the hybridization aspect is actually the most significant part of our work. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from um, Cano Bravo. Um, oh, I'm trying to ask. I'm trying to ask Cano to unmute, but it doesn't look like it's working. Oh, can you unmute Cano? Hi, good morning. Yes, uh, my question is, is there any way to know which will be the dominant gene and the recessive gene in the embryo or not? It's indistinct. Uh, you mean depending on the parent of origin? I mean, uh, we, so if you're, if you're bringing up um, haploinsufficiency, that is a very good question. Um, so all of the embryo defective mutants that we use are recessive. Um, well, they're recessive in later embryogenesis. I didn't show this, but I think I mentioned this in some of the experiments that Axel did. We did find g- mutants where there, there were maternal and paternal effects. The maternal effects were always stronger. So that suggests that there is haploinsufficiency also, which basically haploinsufficiency just means that one copy of the gene is not enough to cover the function. And so that's, that's the null hypothesis for all the maternal effects that, uh, it's, it, that is actually haploid insufficiency, but we did quite a few experiments to look at paternal alleles. Um, so, but yeah, the only way you can determine recessivity of a gene is by crossing with the wild type and, and looking at the phenotype. Um, that, that's a good question. It looks like Mario has a question. Yeah, it's a really quick one. So how, how do you uh, take into, into account heterosis when you do your analysis? Do you go, let's say, for one generation and then when you look at the hybrids and then 
can you go for a second generation to try to uh, to see what's the contribution of heterosis to the phenomena you're studying? We have never done that experiment because we're always looking, we're, we're taking, a, you know, we're crossing one. Okay, so to do that, we would have to use a heterozygous plant as a father and cross it with, we've never done that kind of experiment. Um, hmm. It might be interesting to do, although it's a little bit tricky how we can conclude, because again, we're, the hybrids we're looking at are just in embryogenesis and really just for about five days. Although the hybrid plants grow perfectly fine. And I'll think about that, Mario. That's a good question. Let's take uh, the next question in the chat from uh, Takehiro Ozawa. He right. writes, how is it correlated the hybrid vigor and whether there is a maternal, a maternal bias effect or not during plant early embryogenesis? Yeah, so that's um, what Dan was asking me. And it's sort of a pipe dream of mine is that you could use this kind of analysis um, because people still don't completely understand how heterosis works and wh which combinations of isogenic lines are going to be most heterotic. Um, it would be great if you could somehow do an early assay looking at crossing um, different, different lines and looking at embryogenesis to see if there was a hetero heterotic effect in embryos. We would love to figure out how to do that. And again, we could do experiments just quantifying the growth of um, embryos in these hybrids. There's not a huge effect, I can say, because we would have noticed it, but we haven't looked carefully enough to see if there are small effects. And now we have one last question from the president of the symposium himself, okay. uh, Felipe. <laughs> Felipe. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, my question is if there are some paternal differences in the endosperm development at the beginning of this. Have we ever noticed, like, for example, phenotypes in the endosperm of embryo defective mutants? Um, is, that, is that what you're wondering about? Yep. Or, so actually, I had a student, um, Karina Rosco, who was started looking at that, the pandemic kind of got in the, in the way. And actually her project is to look to see if paternal delayed paternal gene activation also happens in the endosperm. Um, we have some preliminary results that it does using um, some enhanced, some, some gene expression markers. And I think Daphne Ultron had looked at this a little bit. So we have a little bit of preliminary evidence that that there is silencing of paternal alleles in early, in early endosperm development. Also, it's something I'm, we're very interested in because um, delayed paternal genome activation, you could think of it as a kind of, um, of, of just temporary imprinting. And we're interested in whether, if we can separate genome activation and imprinting in the endosperm. So that's, that's one project that we're working on, but I don't have a better answer except to say that we're interested in it. And we think there is um, some paternal allele silencing. Almost all or all, well, pretty much all of the experiments that have been done to look at imprinting in the endosperm, to look at genes that are maternally biased or paternally biased, they're all done. I think Gerardo del Toro did one at four days after pollination. All the other ones have been done at six or after, and that's too late to catch genome activation. By then, at least in the embryo, it's over. Um, so that's something we're very interested in, look, in looking at ourselves and profiling gene activation in early endosperms and, and looking at what's going on in hybrids. Thank you. I want to mention to everybody that technically we're on break. Maria Hazmin Abraham Juarez uh, speaks at noon in 10 minutes, but we're on break. So sorry, Stuart, if people are going to keep on asking questions, okay. we'll go through them. We have one from Itzel Amasinde, and she says, right. hi, Stuart. What is your opinion about the zygote genome activation in apomictic species? Which lack of parental contribution to the formation of an embryo? Right. Hmm. Well, so it depends on the kind of apomixis, um, but you know, you have some kinds where the egg cell just does the does the whole thing itself. Um, you have other kinds where you differentiate an embryo from the new cellular tissue that's around the the embryo sac. Um, since, well, let's see, I, that's a really good question. I think it might 
what you see might depend on the kind of apomixis you're talking about. If you're just if if an if an embryo is is getting generated from sporophytic tissue, it's you should already have equal maternal and paternal expression. So there's probably no difference in the egg cell. Good question. I mean, there it's exclusively maternal. Um, and you know, there are results um, from Sundar's lab showing that you can achieve with just a little bit of uh, paternal contribution, egg cells to develop. So um, it might not even be, I guess it's relevant in that in lots of kinds of apomixis, you're getting maternal generation of zygote and our results support the fact that the maternal genome is a little bit more important, but there are also other studies that show that the paternal genome is absolutely essential to get things going. So yeah, I don't know. It's definitely some relevance there, but I'm not sure. In the big picture, I think it's relevant in that, yeah, it, there's the maternal genome is more important than early embryogenesis. Just waving, waving my, waving my hands here. Sorry, Dan, yeah. just uh, to pitch in really quick. So I want to make a quick reminder that we're sending an unmute request that you need to accept in order to be able to, be able to ask a question. Therefore, the speed at uh, which you can ask a question relies entirely on both the speed of your fingers and the speed of your internet. So please remember, first, you need to accept the unmute request and then you can ask your question. Thank you. Um, well, if people aren't getting tired of hearing me talk, someone else has a, Gerardo Valdez Eluterio says, if you mind, what about transparental plasticity? Um, I don't quite understand what you mean. Uh, like of genes in particular or epigenetic inheritance or? Yeah, perhaps they mean, um, yeah, uh, transgenerational. Oh, I guess it's transparental. I was I was interpreting it as uh, parental contributions to transgenerational uh, inheritance. So I mean, it definitely it's definitely highly related to epigenetic marks that are inherited from the gametes. Um, I mean, and that's always so the no in, 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 at least in hybrids where you see delayed paternal genome activation, and we think in isogenic Columbia also. So you have paternal alleles are not quite active early on. The null hypothesis would be that it's just because sperm cell chromatin is so highly packed that you need a couple of cell divisions um, to reset the epigenetic landscape so that things can take off. Um, that might be true. Um, there are, actually, I have another slide that I didn't show, and, uh, but in the Zhao et al. 2020 paper where they um, have very nice transcriptomes of, of apical and basal cells after the first division. There's something super interesting there. So you have, so in their transcriptomes, you, you have the zygote, which they published in 2019. Then they have the apical and basal cell, and then the globular embryo and suspensor, um, all parent of origin. And we analyzed their data also, and to put it, uh, and, and they did, they looked at this also, but in a way that I think is a little bit more complicated. What we saw is that in the basal lineage, so the suspensor, the parent of origin gene expression is essentially, is very similar to the zygote. Whereas in the apical cell, it's reset and you start to have more biallelic transcription, whereas in the suspensor lineage, it stays more um, either maternal or paternal, depending on the gene. So that's a good uh, example of how you have a, a change in cell fate um, must be due to epigenetics, probably. Well, with that, thank you, Stuart, for a great talk. It was a great uh, question uh, session too. And how about we take a well-deserved seven minute break <laughs> sure. Jasmine uh, Abraham Morris will be speaking in seven minutes and see you all soon. Thank you. Thanks Stuart. a lot, Dan. Take care. Bye.
Thank you, Dan. Hi, everyone. Can you see my screen? Yes, it looks great. OK. First, uh, thanks to the committee for this invitation. Uh, today, I am going to talk about uh, novel protein interactions in maize, which reveal a cross talk between development and immunity. This project has been carried out in the University of California in Berkeley, in EPC, and in Langevio Simvestab. First, uh, maize is one of, of the most important crops in the world. And and um, plant architecture has been studied using different mutants. Uh, here uh, you can see the white type in the 73 background and mutants affected in vegetative uh, development. Uh, for example, uh, the ligule uh, mutants and other affected in plant size. Uh, all of, many of them have been very helpful to improve the um, uh, plant architecture in the field, uh, like the um, leaf angle uh, and the overall uh, plant size. But some mutants uh, uh, show a different phenotype depending on the genetic background. Uh, here you can see the not mutant, uh, which uh, shows a very extreme uh, affected phenotype in the V73, uh, but in the Missouri 17, it is uh, very mild, very similar to the wild type. And uh, presumably these differences are due to genetic modifiers. Uh, here, I will be focused on the uh, narrow path dwarf mutant. This is an EMS uh, mutant, uh, which uh, shows uh, a pleiotropic developmental phenotype. As you can see here, since very early stages of development, uh, it is uh, smaller compared with the wild type. And in the maturity, uh, the size is strongly reduced and uh, making a phenotypic analysis we know uh, that it is because um, reduction in uh, the cell size and also in the number of uh, the cells in the organs. And, but also this mutant shows uh, defects in, in patterning, like in stomachal uh, defects. And also in the ligule formation here, you can see the ligule in the mutant compared with the wild type. And here in these pictures, uh, mm, I am showing some uh, stomachal uh, defects in leaf development. So these phenotypes suggest that this mutant plays, um, this gene plays a very important role in tissue patterning at the cellular level. Um, the not protein was first identified in the cell number uh, regulator uh, family. In, in maize, and in this tree, uh, I am showing that in, in grasses, this is a single copy gene, but in the most of dicots, it has two copies. And then uh, it was uh, characterized in, in Arabidopsis. Uh, it, it, the, this gene is um, MCA1 uh, family because it is a mid complementing activity in, in Arabidopsis, and it is related with a calcium transport and also with mechanosensing. And now we know it is a um, transmembrane um, protein, uh, but the most of the uh, structure of the protein is in the cytoplasm. And here 
You can see the phenotypes in Arabidopsis, even with the double mutant, the, the phenotype is not so affected like in mice. And also in rice, um, there's a, um, a mutant, but uh, it is only affected in size. Uh, but in mice, um, it, it is showing um, many, many defects uh, related with patterning. So to study the function of this protein, we um, want to explore the um, uh, protein interactions. And here you can see that in the um, public databases, uh, the information about the uh, interactions uh, uh, either in Arabidopsis, the MCA1 protein, or in maize, um, all the information, uh, the most of information is based on text mining. Um, there is no information based in experimentally in, in experiments. So we decide to explore uh, these uh, interactions by using a specific antibody recognizing the not protein. Uh, we have uh, two different alleles, but only the not one uh, is a, a null mutant. So we use this one for all the experiments as a negative control. Here, um, you can see the immunoprecipitation of this protein uh, from uh, should apical some tissues because uh, in here is where it, this uh, protein is more abundant. And then we analyze that complex by my mass spectrometry. Um, here I am showing you the number of proteins found in, in, the, in three replicates. And also in, in parallel, we made um, a GIST to hybrid screening uh, using a, a library from uh, male and female inflorescence and from the shoot apical medicine tissues. Um, so we identified a, a group of uh, proteins um, which are very strong uh, interactors, um, not interactors uh, based on this, all of these replicates. And the most of them are related with um, signaling and immune response. Here you can see uh, the pathway with uh, the proteins we found in that replicates, but uh, many of them don't have orthologs in Arabidopsis or in other uh, model plants. Um, so if we see the same uh, pathway, but using orthologs uh, from Arabidopsis, we can see these uh, interesting categories uh, related with uh, endocytosis, membrane trafficking, out of IG and in also immune response and, and, and brassinosteroid signaling. So uh, focus on the uh, protein kinases uh, found in these uh, categories. Here I am showing the DC experiments to um, confirm the physical interaction between the not protein with these two protein kinases. The positive control is uh, the not protein forming uh, homodimers in here in the first line. And the negative control is a mutant version of the protein which uh, lost the interaction. And here you, know, you can see the signal in the, in the membrane um, with these two uh, protein kinases, which are uh, grass specific uh, uh, kinases related um, with a autoimmune response or with a brassinosteroid signaling. Then to test if um, these proteins are a uh, phosphorylating uh, not, uh, we use it a uh, recombinant proteins and um, in vitro phosphorylation uh, assays, as you can see here, um, the Ligulal snarl protein is a phosphorylating itself, and the negative control is a version of this protein, which is a kinase death. And uh, then we tested the, the not protein with 
the legal snare of tangents, and we can see here the phosphorylation of a knot. Then to confirm this uh, uh, result, we use it a uh, analysis by mass spectrometry, and here and you can see the um, the phosphocytes found in the knot protein after the phosphorylation reaction and and here before the phosphorylation. And the negative control is the kinase dead, ligulose narrow, and the positive is the, the ligulose narrow white type. So from here, we, we know that uh, not is in, uh, interacting with some uh, protein kinases at the plasma membrane, and the ligulose narrow is phosphorylating not. But um, as these uh, two kinases uh, don't have uh, orthologs in, in the other models plants, and we don't have any other information about uh, that uh, function. We decide to explore the function by using a transcriptome analysis and phosphoproteome at the ligulus narrow mutant and making the double mutant, not ligulus narrow. Here, um, I am showing the, the results about the uh, RNA seq analysis. Uh, and we found uh, that uh, they have a constitutive activation of biotic different responses, which is a characteristic of a autoimmune um, mutants. Also, they have uh, other traits like uh, dwarfins, uh, phenotype variance depending on the background, and also different phenotypes depending on the temperature. Here, you can see the very similar uh, phenotype in the single mutants uh, compared with the white type. And here, uh, the most uh, represent, represented uh, categories, um, differential, in differential expressed genes uh, from the RNA-seq. And in stress, um, the biotic stress is very highly uh, represented. And so we want to um, analyze the changing in expression of the pathogenesis related proteins. Uh, here you can see uh, up regulation of many of them in the, uh, the, uh, in the two single mutants. But very interestingly, as I uh, showed you in the first slides, uh, in this uh, permissive background, Missouri 17, the phenotypes are mild. Here, the, the not uh, mutant is mm, very similar to the white type. And here, the ligule is narrow mutant, in the, which is very affected in the ligule formation, um, is almost uh, not affected in the Missouri 17 uh, background. Um, so as you may know, uh, this uh, phosphorylation in MAP kinases uh, three and six is a classic um, a marker to identify uh, a biotic stress induced by uh, BAMs or DAMs. And here, uh, many, many reports have, been, have shown a rapid induction with uh, BAM treatments like flagellin 22. Here at the five minutes or five to 10, we can see very high induction of this uh, phosphorylation, these proteins. So uh, also it, these uh, reports are from anabidopsis analysis and also some uh, reports have shown even we can separate a uh, PTI from TI effect using a uh, inducible systems. Uh, and, but also we can see the very fast uh, response with uh, PAMS uh, induction. So in maize, we used the same uh, antibody uh, used here in Arabidopsis to test our mutants uh, in, in these uh, phosphorylations. And here in B73 background, you can see a very high induction of these uh, 
um, label, but it is not in the Missouri 17 uh, permissive um, background. So uh, we have uh, the question of uh, about if this uh, PTI is um, inducing in the V73, but is not in other backgrounds. And which uh, makes a thing about a genetic modifiers present in the Missouri 17, but not present in other backgrounds. Related with, with that um, result, um, Alisa Anderson published uh, in uh, two years two years ago um, the identification of one uh, ligulose narrow modifier in Missouri 17, which uh, was called a uh, sympathy for the ligule because it rescues the uh, ligule defect in the mutant ligulose narrow. And then we found that um, this modifier is an ortholog of the enhanced disease resist resistance for uh, from Arabidopsis. And like this one, when, when plants are treated with a chitin, the transcriptional induction of the gene uh, can be observed at a uh, very uh, rapid, like uh, 30, 30 to 60 minutes. Uh, and this um, response is very similar to the pathogenesis related uh, genes. But also this mutant, the ligulus narrow, uh, is rescued uh, either by uh, growing at low temperatures or uh, having the version from Missouri 17 of this modifier. As you can see here in these near isogenic lines, um, the phenotype is very similar to the white type um, in the low temperature and in the high temperature, uh, this uh, new isogenic line is uh, recovered compared with the mutant. So then, um, uh, with the, all the information we had about the transcriptome and the phosphoproteome uh, in this mutant, we have this model uh, with which is showing that ligulus narrow is a negative regulator in an immune signaling cascade. Uh, and also it is affected by um, the virtue and uh, also is affecting uh, the development. But in the mutant, a map kinase cascade is activated leading to the PTI response, which can be uh, dampened either by uh, low temperature, uh, cool temperature, or for the presence of the Missouri 17 uh, modifier sol. Also, it is uh, all of this information we are generating is related with the hypothesis about the uh, legal involvement in development and in immunity, which uh, Establish that a phosphorylation brassinosteroid signal propagates from the ligule to the leaf uh, margin and it is affecting the shape. And this signaling cascade is involved in establishment of developmental patterns and also in immunity. Uh, from other mutants um, in affected in genes related with brassinosteroid signaling, and also with these uh, mutants we are uh, finding in maize, uh, we are helping to uh, make a strong uh, this uh, hypothesis. And now uh, we have uh, more uh, mutants uh, because now already we have the double mutant and not ligulus narrow, which you can see here in this picture. This is in a um, different background. This is in A618, with, which is a um, mirror phenotype between the very severe B73 and the mild in Missouri 17. Uh, but the double mutant is 
uh, strongly affected, as you can see here in the pictures. And here in, in this plot, you can see the, the height the, of the plant and the size, the leaf size. And here in, in these in red dots, you can see the, the double mutant. And also, it is uh, very affected in the ligure formation compared with the uh, single mutants or with the wild type. And the um, RNA seq analysis is showing uh, an even stronger induction of immune response in this mutant. And now uh, we already have the specific antibodies uh, recognizing uh, the legal narrow uh, protein and also the SOL, which is the modifier. Uh, and now we are making another experiment um, exploring the proteome and the um, phosphoproteome and also more intera uh, interactions, protein interactions to try to uh, find what is the molecular function of these uh, protein kinases and also the modifiers found in the permissive uh, backgrounds. In summary, these results uh, suggest that not ambiguous narrow are novel developmental regulators in a cross-talk with immunity. Also, that maize mutants are a powerful tool for the identification of new protein interactions pathways in crop species. And these uh, novel protein interactions may contribute to the identification of a key factors in crops, regulating uh, the development and also the stress response. I would like to acknowledge uh, Sarah Haig from the University of California in Berkeley, uh, who is a very important part of this project. And also Alisa Anderson, who was working with the modifier, and Jacob Brunker from the University of Wisconsin in Madison, who is now uh, helping to understand the results about the RNA seq and the phosphoproteome and also uh, funding, which is very important uh, for this uh, project. Thanks, uh, if you have any question, please ask. Thank you, Jasmine. Uh, great talk. We have uh, plenty of time for questions. Our first question comes from um, Arturo Guevara Garcia. And hopefully you can unmute yourself, Arturo. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, nice talk, Jasmine. Thank you. Uh, in, in the phosphorylation size that you showed, how do you know if phosphorylated form correspond to MPK3 or MPK6? Uh, we still, uh, yeah. In the in vitro phosphorylation size, we only just see our interest proteins, the not and the legal is narrow. And the, that you mentioned is using an, a specific antibody recognizing the phosphorylation in the MAP kinases 3 and 6. And this is a generic uh, antibody used in animals and in plants because it, this is a very conserved uh, response in stress, um, mostly uh, biotic stress. So, um, we don't, we don't, uh, we, we haven't done any in vitro phosphorylation with this specific uh, map kinases. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. I, I, I know the, the, the functionality of the antibody, but uh, my question is, do you think that could be important to know if it's NPK3 or NPK6? Or is or doesn't matter? Oh, um, in this um, in this point, it is not uh, very important to distinguish between them because um, in other species have been shown that uh, both of them are induced. The phosphorylation of them are induced uh, 
Um, so I think uh, it it is a not um, a specific. We 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 cannot uh, say which one is induced. Only the uh, mix of them. We because we are not very sure which one is it is. Do we have more questions for Jasmine? Well, more people are asking. I have one, Jasmine. Um, you show so clearly that um, these mutants are so important for the ligule and for the development, the proper development of the leaf. And they have these connections to disease and to heat and stress. Um, do you think that the changes in leaf shape are adaptive with respect to disease and stress? Or is it just a developmental constraint or consequence of how these pathways just happen to be? Um, I, I think they, they, they are uh, mostly um, related with, with development in changes in development and patterning. And the connection with immunity is, um, is a parallel function which uh, in maize, maybe it is important to um, propagate the signal from the ligule. Uh, because, um, well, uh, up till now in, in maize, we don't have very much information about a uh, immune response. Uh, and so uh, these proteins, the ligule, the working in the ligule um, are uh, first, changing the, the architecture of the plant. But uh, then also related with immunity, which is not still very clear uh, how uh, it is working with the adaptation. I see, thank you. We have a thank question you. from uh, Naftali Cruz. Let me unmute you. You should be able to unmute yourself, Naftali. Hi. Um Hi, Jasmine. Very nice talk. Thank you very much. And uh, my question is, um, if you have studied the uh, phosphocytes of uh, ligulus narrow, and if you have complemented with, I don't know, phosphomimetic and phosphodet alleles of this protein, and if it could complement the phenotype of the mutant that you have, I don't know if you have considered these type of experiments to understand the role of the phosphocytes that you identify by uh, mass spectrometry. Uh, sure, you are right. Um, these uh, phosphocytes are a very important to study using phosphomimetics, but we haven't done yet. Uh, we only know um, some of them are uh, in vivo phosphorylated because uh, based, based on the phosphoproteomics data. And also uh, in, in the North mutant, uh, some some of the affected uh, phosphocytes are uh, changing the shape of the uh, protein uh, because they are uh, also affecting the um, interaction with itself or with other proteins made. So um, uh, in the future experiments, uh, of course, we are planning to analyze uh, the uh, phosphocytes using uh, we have a few more minutes. Any more questions for Jasmine? Just one last question, Jasmine. Uh, you talk a lot about steroids and it's the ligulus narrow. Um, I'm thinking of, of like the work of Mike Scanlon and the growth of the maize leaf margin and how, um, and a lot of times it's like adaxial, abaxial, but there's a lot of evidence that like this margin outgrowth is independent of adaxial, abaxial patterning. Um, do you think it's, yeah, how do you interpret the, um, the lack of blade outgrowth in some of your mutants? Yeah, um, the, um, the ligule um, is not affected in all the, um, the blade. Uh, in this ligule, it's narrow mutant is affected only in the mid, in the, in the middle of the leaf. So that's why the hypothesis uh, 
uh, says that this signal is propagating from the uh, center of the lip to the uh, edges. Uh, so um, we also have another mutants uh, like the guac one, which is uh, affected in apaxial adaxial um, auricle uh, structure. And um, they are now um, uh, used for making double mutants with a deliculous narrow to try to elucidate what is happening uh, with this patterning, establishing the, the wave in, the, in this structure. But we don't know yet. Thank you. Fascinating work. Thank you, Jasmine. And uh, we should get on to the next speaker. So Mario, we'll take it from here. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Okay, so our next speaker is Jose Lopez Bucio from the Universidad Michoacana de San Nicolás de Hidalgo here in Mexico. The title of his talk is Cell Death and Regeneration Within the Root Meristem. Jose, if you're ready, could you please share your screen with us? Well, thank you, Mario, for your kind presentation. Um, and I would like to thank the organizers for, for the opportunity to be here. Uh, we are, uh, there are several reasons to, to, to study plants, uh, particularly plant roots. Here we have uh, some of the functions that these uh, uh, organs play. And uh, you see that they are they're very important for, uh, for ensure the photosynthetic and reproductive tissues to the soil to the substrate, and also to take up water and nutrients. Uh, the photosynthesis process, in fact, uh, makes uh, sugars and uh, other uh, nutritional compounds for microorganisms, which inhabit the rhizosphere, the, the part of the soil which is in close contact with the roots. And the, in this manner, uh, the, the roots uh, support the, the most of the, of the plant microbiome. And uh, by all of these characteristics, uh, the roots uh, have been considered a major target in the search uh, of the next green revolution. Uh, in fact, in order to perform this, uh, all these functions, um, uh, uh, the root system is always producing new, new branches. Uh, a single plant may have, in fact, uh, thousands of, of root branches uh, performing uh, all of these, of these functions. So every, every root has, uh, has uh, a meristem. What is a meristem? Well, I think the, the, the very uh, basic property of, of the meristem is, is the, the, the cell division process, which is uh, uh, continuous and uh, uh, which happens uh, over the entire life cycle of the plant. So uh, you can see here uh, a few photographs of the, of the meristem, in this case of uh, Arabidopsis, where you can see the, the uh, mitotic cells, okay? And uh, this region is also related to, to oxygen gradients, shown here in, in, in blue color. Uh, these uh, uh, hormonal gradients, in fact, are uh, responsible of the uh, identity of cells within the primary root tip, okay, shown here. Uh, here we have the root cap, uh, four cell layers of uh, columella cells are protecting the meristem uh, locate, located upstream, and the inner within the meristem we have the stem cell niche. But uh, what is the stem cell niche? Well, we have a magnification here. You see that there is a quiescent center, a few cells which are somewhat mitotically uh, inactive cells. Uh, around the quiescent center, we, 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 we find uh, most initial cells which proliferate and produce uh, all tissues that uh, take part in the mature uh, root uh, uh, in this case. So the meristems are uh, very interesting uh, uh, zones regarding the basic cellular programs, cell division, uh, cell differentiation, cell uh, uh, elongation, 
and also cell viability, because these, these cells are uh, involved in rapid DNA replication. And you know that DNA replication is uh, is, is always presenting a problem because uh, the cells are exposed in the DNA and there, there may be opportunity for mutations. So the merit stems are uh, regions that are very sensitive to, to, to environmental stimuli, particularly those uh, related to genotoxic stress. Okay, so uh, there are many uh, environmental stimuli which can uh, modulate the shape, the the branches, the length of the root system of plants. Uh, here we have, uh, uh, in order to compare these uh, strategies to grow, we, we have the normal uh, uh, indeterminate growth of the primary root, which makes a long dominant uh, axis. In the case of Arabidopsis, this, this is named the, the primary root. The first structure, what, what, what is produced after germination, but in the case of uh, limitation of phosphate, you see that there is no more growth uh, in the primary root, and the growth changes. The root uh, indeed forms many branches, and the root system is believed to, to be more efficient in the take up of phosphate, particularly from the upper uh, soil layers. So uh, there are other uh, stimuli, such as, for instance, uh, molecules, secondary metabolites, volatiles, which are produced by microbes, and also by, by uh, stressors, uh, abiotic stressors, such as salt, pollutants, metals, uh, uh, to mention a few. So th there, is, uh, there is a very huge developmental plasticity, uh, just uh, shown here, uh, and this uh, uh, always depend on the activity of, of the merit stems here. We have a normal meristem, which is proliferating, which, which is showing the hormonal gradients are, are around the root tip. But the, when, when, the, when the primary root en encounters problems, there is a change to the terminate growth. The, the, the mitosis is, uh, is uh, inhibited, and then there are uh, stimulate, uh, and then there, there is an stimulation of the differentiation process, which gives rise to the formation of the root hairs or lateral roots. Here uh, we have a very nice comparison uh, of the structure of the meristem. Here we have a meristem uh, in, 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 in a plant which is growing with a high supplement of phosphate, a macronutrient, an essential macronutrient. And uh, we have here uh, uh, the same region, but in, in this case in a plant that is growing under limitation of phosphate. So you can see here that, that the, we have no more meristem here. We have no more cell division here. We have differentiation. We have production of root hairs. We have differentiation of the vascular tissue, which uh, approaches the, the, the very root tip here. And we cannot see anymore the, uh, the, the root cap or the columella cell layers. So this happens just by changing the availability of an essential macronutrient uh, within the soil. So we have been working in this in this in this topic for several years, and uh, uh, we uh, recently started a, a, a screening in order to try to identify genetic factors that are involved in the growth of the primary root. In this case, uh, 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 using Arabidopsis and in vitro systems, where we can control the availability of phosphate uh, in the in the medium, and uh, uh, you see that we 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 have a mutant we, we, which is named. Uh, HPR1, uh, 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 which refers to the, to the inhibited growth uh, in the primary root. Here we have a comparison of the growth of the primary root with, uh, of the primary root with, uh, between the, the wild type uh, uh, parent and also the HPR1 mutants. You see the, the constant growth of the primary root, and, and here we have the inhibition uh, uh, in the growth of the primary root in the mutants. Uh, when we check the, the, the phenotype of the roots, uh, you, you, we have here the, the root tips. Uh, in the case of the wild type uh, seedlings, we have the meristem, the cell elongation and differentiation regions. But in the case uh, of the HPR1 uh, mutants, we, we cannot see the meristem or the cell elongation region. And instead, we have uh, root hairs covering the, the, the root tip and also lateral roots. Uh, in fact, when we observe the phenotype of the lateral roots, we again see these changes. 
in the mutants, we have uh, uh, affective uh, uh, meristems in the, in the lateral roots. Uh, these uh, structures, in fact, look like uh, callus-like uh, structures instead of normal lateral roots. So, uh, um, as auxin uh, is uh, important for the activity of, of, the, of the root meristem, we uh, tested whether uh, there will be uh, an alteration in, in the auxin response in, in the mutants. Uh, uh, and to, to answer this, uh, this question, we uh, performed experiments supplying very low concentrations, increasing concentrations of indolacetic acid. You see the, 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 the location of the auxin response at the primary root. And uh, uh, in the wild type seedlings, which were, uh, uh, which expressed the DR5 uh, reporter uh, uh, gene, we see that there is an increase in the expression as the concentration of auxin in the medium uh, increases. In the case of the mutants, uh, we can see that there, we have uh, uh, two, uh, two different uh, uh, expression domains. The first one that is shared with the, with the wild type seedlings, and uh, a second one here, which is located in provasculature cells. And uh, uh, upon addition of auxin, you can see that there is a magnification in the response, particularly at this second auxin maximum within the primary root. And this also correlates with the formation of root hairs with differentiation processes at the very root tip. So what, uh, uh, what is uh, interesting is that uh, uh, when we compare the structure of the primary root in the wild type, you see five days uh, after germination or 10 days after germination, the uh, structure of the meristem is uh, comparable. We, we, we have here the root cap, okay, and, and the meristem here. But uh, in the mutants, you can see that uh, five days after germination, we have an almost normal structure of the meristem. And later on, all the root tip is complete, completely disorganized. But uh, if you observe this region, okay, where, where, the, where, the, where the second auxin maximum was, was observable, we see that there is a, a red patch. This red color here is produced by propidium iodide uh, uh, staining. Propidium iodide, in fact, can penetrate uh, damaged tissue. Those cells which are dying are, uh, are, are, are uh, received the, 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 the propidium iodide, and therefore we see th this red patch, which is uh, indicative of cell death or damage. This damage was also present in lateral roots, as you can see here, and, and this uh, correlates again with the, uh, with the transit from, from normal meristem to distorted abnormal meristems. So the, this, this was an indication that, uh, that uh, there was a problem with the cell division that later on uh, is, uh, uh, is uh, correlated with the, with, the, with the inhibition of, of, of the growth of the primary. So to try to, to support this, uh, this, uh, this hypothesis, we, uh, we isolated uh, uh, mutants which manifest not really, uh, not really determinate growth, but uh, instead the, the, the primary roots, the, the, the primary roots grow slowly in these mutants, and uh, uh, this uh, uh, slow growth is sufficient to induce the formation of branches, and the branches also grow very well, as you can see here. The, so the phenotype is not exactly uh, uh, is not just comparable to the HPR1. And uh, 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 these mutants are defective in the mediator 18 subunit of the mediator complex. What is the mediator complex? Well, this is, an, this is a transcriptional coactivator, which uh, uh, plays a critical role in, in, in the transcription of genes in, 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 in eukaryotes from yeast to humans. Uh, the mediator complex, uh, helps the RNA polymerase II to find out the promoters and to, and to, and to, to start the transcription of, of, of genes. 
So this, uh, uh, this particular subunit is critical for, for the configuration of the root architecture. When we uh, tested the phenotypes uh, at several uh, days after germination in the, in the normal plants and in the mutants, uh, you see that in the case of the mutants, we have, again, the same problem. We have this red patch showing uh, the, the, the cell death uh, area. And uh, uh, this, uh, is, uh, this problem is, exacerba is exacerbated with time. By seven days, when we have uh, fully photosynthetic leaves, uh, uh, this uh, uh, light signaling uh, is part of the, uh, of the exacerbation of this, uh, of, of this phenotype in, in both the primary roots and also in lateral roots. Uh, in fact, this was published uh, recently by, uh, this work was done, in fact, mostly by Javier Raya in, in, in our lab. And, and uh, this was correlated with the DNA damage uh, response, this, uh, this particular uh, cell death phenotype. So by, by, the, by, by the same time, we were working, uh, trying to understand uh, the effects of, the, uh, of environmental pollutants on the activity of meristems. A few years, years ago, we reported in a nice collaboration with, with Miguel Martinez in order to, 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 to understand how chromate uh, uh, could be affecting the growth of the primary root in Arabidopsis. Oh, oh, oh. It has been, uh, it, it, it is thought that chromate is, is a very toxic pollutant. It is accumulated in water bodies, uh, particularly in, 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 industrial, in industrial zones. So when we uh, tested the effects of low concentrations of, chr of chromate, 20 micromolar, for instance, we uh, see that there is an stimulation of growth and uh, uh, higher concentrations, we see uh, an, a strong repression of growth, as you can see here. Uh, it was, it was of, of interest to, to, to see that the repression of growth was related to oxygen signaling because uh, oxygen mutants, which are, uh, uh, insensitive to, 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 to oxygen, in this case, the solitary root one. This is an oxygen repressor, and the mutation in solitary root is dominant. So we have here a strong repression in the oxygen signaling. As you can see here in this comparison, in the wild type, we, we have no growth because we are uh, growing the plants with a very high toxic uh, concentration of chromate. But uh, in contrast, the solitary root mutants grows very well. As you can see here, the roots are growing very well, and later on, they are inhibited by, uh, there is a much more concentration of chromate needed, needed in, in order to have this growth repression. So the, the, the surprise uh, came here. We expected, actually, that uh, if, the, if, if the MET-18 mutants had a problem in the meristem, the, their cells are dying. So the, the hypothesis was that if, if we provide chromate to these mutants, there will be an exacerbation of the seal death phenotype. This, in fact, was not the case. We compared side by side four, four plants, mutants, and four wild type seedlings side, side by side in medium without chromate. And when we add 60 micromolar of chromate, we see that there is a 50% inhibition in the primary root growth, okay, in the wild type, and then there is a further inhibition in the mutants. But when we check the primary root tip in the mutants, surprisingly, we did not find a single primary root. We find a couple of root tips, which under the confocal microscope looks practically identical. So it seems that the chromate triggered the process to convert a single meristem into a twin meristem through a process of splitting the pattern uh, root meristem. So this was a very nice opportunity to, 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 to investigate how can a single meristem uh, uh, be converted into uh, twin meristems. And we uh, uh, check it by uh, several genes involved in, uh, in, uh, in the cell death process. This is uh, uh, the ethylene response factor 115, which uh, as you can see is uh, uh, very uh, uh, nicely expressed uh, at the center of the meristem where the cell death uh, uh, takes place in the, in the mutants, but not in the, in, the wild, in the wild type. 
And uh, in the case of the mutants, you can see that supplementation of 60 micromolar of chromate at several times after uh, after treatment with with this uh, with, with chromate, you see that three days, four days, five days uh, uh, until seven days, and you see that at all stages there is a, a marked expression of the of the of, of the of the of, of, of this transcriptional factor until we have the couple root tips already formed in uh, the previous region occupied by the meristem. So the Kiesen Center is a is a is a very uh, nice marker of the of the stem cell niche. You see the Kiesen Center here in the control in in in, in normal plants, and you see also the, the the red patch here in the mutants and the the, the location of the Kiesen Center. What happens with the Kiesen Center is when we supplemented chromate, we see the formation of a wither primary root, of course. And by this stage, five days after germination, we see the formation of two opposite zones where the, the Kiesen center is, is, uh, is located. And later on, you see the twin roots with AH, each with uh, its own Kiesen center uh, uh, already formed. When we analyze the, the, the oxygen response, uh, we see the comparison in the control and, and in the mutants. We see that there is a, a, an increase in the in the response in the oxygen response in the mutants. Here we have the, the, the red patch. And uh, the, the, the oxygen response is very dynamically controlled during the process of twin root formation in the case of the mutants. By this time, we you can see here the formation of a pyramid-like structure. Okay. Later on, you see. Uh, the separation of the oxygen streams at the center of the root. And later on, you see the formation of both uh, uh, twin roots. So this, uh, uh, these results uh, suggest that th there may be uh, an important role of oxygen in this uh, organo organogenesis, or organogenesis process. Uh, and uh, we have the advantage uh, in the case of, of uh, research with oxygen that we have at hand uh, inhibitors in order to check whether oxygen transport will be important or not in the uh, transition from a single from a single meristem into uh, a twin root. So we uh, performed the analysis using the DR5 gas uh, reporter uh, uh, gene. And apply the 60 micromolar of chromate, uh, we see nicely the formation of the twin roots in the mutants. But when we supplied four micromolar of NPA together with chromate, we did not see the separation of the, of the twin roots. Uh, in contrast, you can see the very different phenotype of these roots when compared with, with, with this one. All pictures are at the same magnification. You see. Uh, uh, an increase in the in the in the expression domain uh, of the DR5 uh, reporter here. This is a very wide meristem. We have very wide roots, and we have the formation of long root hairs along this new structure, which is formed uh, after application of NPA, NPA and chromate. Of course, we have an induction of the cell division process and also the coordination with differentiation processes, which will give rise to this change in the root phenotype. This was also verified uh, using a, 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 different, a different reporter gene, the cyclin B1, which is an excellent marker of the transition from the, uh, from the, uh, from, uh, for the transition to, to mitosis. You see again that we have the formation of the twin roots here. Later on, when we supply uh, MPA with chromate, we see, you can see the meristem, just compare this meristem with this one. Of course, we have perhaps 10 times uh, uh, greater meristems here just by supplementation of chromate. And uh, uh, you also see that the root is uh, very robust when compared with, with this one. This might be a, a, an interesting model in order to check or, or to, to analyze organogenesis. Okay? We don't know if we have more, more cell layers uh, forming here. Or we don't know what is the identity of these, of these, of these cell layers. And this is, uh, I, I think, an interesting, uh, uh, an interesting research 
to perform in the in the next in the next weeks. So, uh, as you remember, we uh, initially identified the solitary root as an important genetic factor in the response to chromate, in the response to the to the inhibition of the primary root uh, 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 to chromate. So we made the double mutant, in this case, the, the, the med 18 and the solitary root uh, uh, double mutants were, were generated. And uh, uh, you see here, supplementation of chromate uh, uh, induces the twinning of the, of the, of the meristem. And uh, when we check this in the solitary root mutant and the med 18 double mutants, you see that there is no, uh, uh, there is, uh, uh, there, there is no transition from the single meristem into the uh, splitting that gives rise to these twin roots. So this confirms, in fact, that auxin uh, is very important uh, by both strategies, uh, either pharmacological using MPA, and in this case, genetic uh, uh, using the solitary root uh, mutant. So uh, what, what, is the, what, what is the importance of this uh, organogenesis process? Uh, well, I think, I think that the, 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 this is a curiosity, in fact. Uh, uh, there are a few, report that, a few reports in the literature that have been uh, related to the, the, the formation of these uh, twin roots. This is, in fact, called uh, dichotomous root branching. Uh, a few families in plants, particularly uh, uh, in, in, in Selaginella, in the genus Selaginella, and in the bryo, bryo, bryophytes, the, 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 the root branching process, in fact, uh, occurs in this manner by formation twin roots. So uh, uh, this is uh, one of the, of the first cases uh, in, in angiosperms, in this case in Arabidopsis. And uh, it, it will be of interest to check whether this, uh, this process is, is also or has an, an important adaptive advantage in the conditions of phosphate limitation, nutrient limitation, or perhaps the presence of toxins around roots, or perhaps as a response to conditions in the environment that, that impose a strong, a, a strong uh, stress to, uh, uh, to, to plant roots. When we transfer the, 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 the plants that, uh, that uh, form it between roots to chromate free medium, you see that these, uh, these roots are able to grow independently, uh, which indicates that their meristems are uh, functioning in an adequate manner. So I think uh, we are close to finish uh, this, uh, this talk. Let's see. Okay, so uh, just a summary. I, I don't want to repeat uh, the, the main uh, the main results that, that you have you have you have uh, seen. Uh, just that uh, the chromate seems to be an important factor in the organogenesis process, which uh, in conditions that, that impose uh, uh, genotoxic or cell death pressure to tissues, we can have the transition from cell death and uh, to, to, for development of, of, of this beautiful process of uh, twin root formation. Of course, this is, this is uh, at the center of, of cell regeneration. Uh, hopefully, uh, something like this, like this process will be happening in, in, in animal or humans in order to try to, to, to test whether we could regenerate complete organs by just applying uh, treatments in uh, uh, cell cultures or cell uh, uh, tissues in, in, in laboratory conditions. Uh, well, just to thank the, the people to, to, have, uh, uh, to have supported this project, many students, particularly Javi, Javier Raya, and uh, Miguel in the, in the case of Chromate, uh, Professor De Beilder, Luis Herrera, and Arturo Guevara also supported this research at uh, several stages. And the financial, uh, from several institutions are also uh, uh, are also presented here in order to recognize the important uh, support to this research. 
So thank you so much for your attention. If you have uh, some questions, I, 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 I will try to answer them. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jose. Um, we have time for one quick question. Uh, so uh, please, you can unmute now, uh, Professor Dubrovsky. Yes, thank you. Uh, Jose, thank you very much. I, I have a question related to stability of this, fen of this phenotype. Let's say how many, what is the percentage of seedlings you have? You have this uh, dichotomy and whether this dichotomously branched uh, uh, apex can, can uh, repeat uh, this dichotomy, dichotomous branching after it's already formed and whether lateral roots also are capable to do that. Well, both, both, both questions are, are, are interesting. The, the, first, the first one, uh, I, I, I think uh, the, the process is very, very reproducible, as, as you could, could see. Uh, this, 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 uh, uh, this allow to check several genes, several, several, several markers uh, during the transition from the single meristem into the, 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 the splitting. Of, of, of the of the parent meristem, uh, so the, the the percent of, of the roots that uh, start this pro this program upon supplementation of chromate in the mutants is higher than ninety percent, close to to thousand percent, I think. So it is very reproducible. Uh, the, the other question is uh, well, we we don't know. O sea, how this dichotomous root branching process influences the lateral root formation program? We don't know. This is, I think, a, a very interesting uh, uh, question to, to, to follow, and we need to, 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 to check this. Right, but lateral root can, can branch also dichotomously? Uh, we don't know, Professor Dubrovsky. We, we don't know. We, we have just fo focus uh, uh, at this stage of the, of, of the project. We have, a, uh, we have just uh, focus uh, on the primary root. Okay. We have to check, right. to check it. Yeah, thank, thank you, you. Jose. Thank you for your question. Thank you so much, Jose. That was a wonderful talk and really interesting. And uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Mario. Thank you all. Okay, moving on to the next talk. Our next speaker will be uh, Nayeli Marsh Martinez from Sindestav and Ira Puato. And the title of her talk is Dual Cytokinin Regulation by Transcription Factors that Control Development. This talk is a recording, so give us one sec to start the recording. Hello, I am Nayeli Marsh. I work at the Biotechnology and Biochemistry Department at Simvestav Irapuato in Guanajuato, Mexico. Thank you for connecting today to this talk. Also, many thanks to the organizers of this nice symposium for the invitation to present our work. This time, I want to talk to you about the role of the transcription factor no transmitting tract, also named GWP2, as a connector of hormonal pathways. I want to start thanking the people that were involved in this work that was mainly done by David Diaz in collaboration with more people at Simvesta. Here we see Yolanda, Rosa Esmeralda, Eric and Umberto and more collaborations at other institutions. This work has not yet been published, so please treat the information as so. The role and importance of hormones in many plant processes is well established. From them, auxin and cytokinins are considered to be two of the most important hormones that guide plant development. They have been considered to have an antagonistic relation However, as more research has been done in the last years, it is clear that they act more in a complementary way. I really like the title of a review that was published in 2015 but by Schaller and collaborators, where they, when, where they compared the cytokinin and auxin interactions with the concept of the, of the yin yang, because it, it reflects the interconnections and complementarity of these pathways. At the end of each pathway, 
that includes biosynthesis, inactivation, transport, perception, signaling and signaling steps. There are transcription factors that regulate the transcriptional response to each hormone. For auxin, these are auxin response factors. And though there has been a lot of research, there's still also a lot to understand about what is downstream of them. We work in the lab with a different kind of transcription factors. This is one of them, GWP2 or no transmitting tract. It can remodel plant architecture when it's expressed, as you can see here. It belongs to a family of six members in Arabidopsis, characterized by the WIP domain that starts with these three amino acids and contains four zinc fingers. In Arabidopsis taliana, the lack of entity function causes the loss of the transmitting tract. This is a tissue inside the pistil that is necessary for proper pollen growth to reach the ovules. Therefore, mutants present this phenotype of fruits that are not completely full of seed. NTT is also involved in replum development. This is a tissue that divides, that divides the valves of the Arabidopsis fruit. We have studied some of the mechanisms of NTT action, finding that it interacts with different regulators that guide dynesium and fruit development. Also, together with one of them, called seed stick, NTT regulates genes involving lipid metabolism and transport and cell wall remodeling. Here we see the phenotype of the loss of function of one of these genes that produces a very striking gynesium phenotype. Because of this phenotype, Umberto named this gene Kawak, that means storm or thunder in Mayan. NTT has also been found to play a redundant but key function in root development. The triple mutant of NTT or WIP2 with its closely related genes WIP4 and WIP5, named NWW, does not develop properly. What happens is that in the embryo, the first division of a cell called the hypophysis does not occur properly. In a wild-type embryo, the hypophysis divides asymmetrically and gives rise to the root apical meristem. But this does not occur as it should in the NWW triple mutant. The authors of this work noticed that this defect was similar to another mutant called Monopterus, here indicated as MP, and that while NTT was expressed in the cells that give rise to the root apical meristem in a wild type embryo, it was absent in the Monopterus mutant. They found that NTT was a target of Monopterus, which is an auxin response factor, ARF5, indicated that NTT acts downstream of the auxin pathway. If NTT is downstream of the auxin pathway, which genes are acting downstream NTT? We wanted to have a broad view of these genes, and for that, we used the inducible line 35S NTTGR, where we can induce the entrance of NTT to the nucleus when dexamethasone is applied, to compare the transcriptomes of induced versus non-induced plants. When NTT was induced, as we had seen before, lips developed in a very, very different way than wild-type plants, produce, producing very clear serrations or even a sort of projections at their margin. Here we are looking at induced plants plus dexamethasone and without dexamethasone. And here we are looking to um, constitutive overexpressors. This leaf phenotype reminded us of plants that have been treated with cytokinins. And though the phenotype is not exactly the same, we thought that it was worth to explore whether these hormones could be related to NTT. Root development was also affected when NTT was induced. As you can see here, the root presents a severe reduction in growth after induction. The blue arrow indicates the length of the root at the moment of induction, either with a mock solution, when the plants were treated with a mock solution or with dexamethasone. 
The green arrow indicates the length of the route three days after the treatment, and as you can see, there is a clear reduction in growth, which is quantified in this graph, comparing also wild-type plants that were treated with or without dexamethasone. You can see the severe reduction here. Interestingly, root growth is also affected when plants are treated with cytokinin. Entity is not only expressed in the gynesium or the embryo, it is also expressed at the vegetative stage in the vasculature of different organs, as we can see here, the leaves, hypocotyl, roots, and in this line, we also see expression at the shoot apical meristem region and at its incipient lateral roots. And because these are all different tissues, we wondered whether it, would be re it could be regulating different genes depending on the context in which it is expressed. Therefore, for the global expression analysis, we decided to separate the aerial from the root tissues, also to reduce the problem of masking differential expression due to the mix of tissues. We were also very interested in finding early and somewhat late downstream genes. For this, we took samples 30 minutes and 8 hours after induction. And for the samples taken at 30 minutes, we also added cyclohexamide. That is a translation inhibitor to reduce the secondary effects of other genes after entity induction. We got the data for four comparisons, roots and shoots, at 30 minutes and 8 hours. And we found that a different number of genes had changed expression depending on the tissue and the time. We also analyzed enriched GO categories. Here I only show some hormone related categories. We found that some were present in all the contrasts, but other, others were only found in some of them, as occurred also with many genes. We can see this clearly in this heat map depicting auxin related genes. Because NTT is a target of R5 monop or monopteros, we decided to look first to auxin related genes and found that genes that participate at different steps of the pathway were differentially expressed. Most of these genes presented moderate changes of their ex in their expression. And actually, the genes that had the most change in, exp in expression were genes that are known to be early auxin response genes, such as GH3, that are genes that code for enzymes that conjugate auxin to amino acids, small auxin upregulated RNAs, also called SAURs, and the ARF negative regulators IAA ox. Since the auxin and cytokinin pathways are often interconnected, and because of the entity phenotypes that we have observed, we also looked to cytokinin-related genes. Again, genes involved at different steps of the pathway were affected. So genes that code for enzymes that are involved in cytokinin metabolism, or for cytokinin transporters, and also components of the signaling pathway an important cytokinin receptor, phosphotransfer proteins, and both the transcription factors that regulate the response and their negative regulators. Some of these genes had higher changes in expression, like this, for example, or were affected in at least three of the conditions that we studied. Therefore, we chose three genes to study further. One of them, one of them uh, is involved in cytokinin biosynthesis. This is the IPT5 gene. One involved in cytokinin degradation. This is CKX7. And the negative regulator of cytokinin signaling, AHP6. Both AHP6 and CKX7 would have a negative effect in the cytokinin pathway, while IPT5 would have a positive effect. First, we wanted to confirm the changes in expression of these genes after entity induction. For this, we cross the inducible line to marker lines. When we cross the inducible line to an IPT5 GOS marker line, we observed, we observed that GOS staining 
increased after entity induction, as you can see here and here. Conversely, the induction of entity in the cross of the inducible line to an HP6 GFP marker line caused a reduction in AHP6 expression, and this was coincident with what we found in the transcriptome data. As we have seen in the crosses and in the transcriptome, QRT-PCR analysis confirmed further that AHP6 expression decreased 30 minutes and 8 hours after entity induction. On the other hand, IPT5 increased expression 30 minutes and 8 hours after entity induction, and something similar occurred with CKX7, which rapidly and strongly increased its expression after entity induction. After observing the changes in expression of these cytokinin-related genes, we wanted to know what was the effect of MTT induction in the cytokinin reporter line TCSN GFP. For this, we crossed this reporter line to our NTT inducible line. We found that the induction of NTT altered the expression of this reporter line, as we can see here. When we analyzed the root apical merge stem of the main root two days after induction, the changes were very subtle. But one week, one week after, all TCS signal was lost in induced roots. However, GFP signal was still detected in emerging lateral roots of these same plants. And when we looked a little bit above the root apical merge stem of the main root, two days after induction, GFP signal was detected at the region above it in induced plants, in contrast with not induced plants, where the signal was not detected. It also seemed that the size of the meristem was affected. The mature region of the root also showed GFP signals that were not present in the non-induced plants. Therefore, we concluded that NTT induction caused alterations in cytokinin signaling. It was clear that the expression of CKX7, IPT5, and AHP6 was changing when NTT was induced. So we also wanted to know whether NTT was able to bind regulatory or genomic regions of these genes. We used different fragments, either complete promoters or smaller fragments to test this. First, we used a GIST-1 hybrid assay. And while some fragments could not be used because of autoactivation, the rest produced positive results, as we can see here. We also tested the regulation of entity in these genes using a bioluminescence transactivation assay. This picture was actually taken in one of those experiments. We tested the promoters alone, as indicated here, and in combination with entity, and found that entity was able to regulate the expression of these three promoters in the same sense as we found, ha, have found for the transcriptome or the, cro the crosses or the QRT-PCR experiments. Finally, since CKX7 is one of the genes that was activated the most at the early time, we tested whether it played a role in the misexpression phenotype of entity-induced plants. For this, we crossed the inducible entity line to the CKX7 loss of function mutant. Here we see both the inducible line in the wild type background and in the muted background treated with a mock solution. They actually don't seem very different from each other. However, when induced, while the inducible line presents again the serrations or these projections in its leaf margin, these serrations or projections are lost or are very attenuated in the CKX7 mutant background. 
indicating that this gene is very relevant for this phenotype and suggesting that cytokinin homeostasis plays a role in it. We also treated these plants with cytokinin and they responded also differently. You can see the big difference in the shape of the leaves of these plants. In a way, this was expected because CKX7 is a mutant that is impaired in, CK, in cytokinin degradation. Therefore, we would expect that it's more sensitive to cytokinin treatment. Regarding the roots, the induction of NTT in a CKX7 mutant background produced a new phenotype. The development of Kali along them, as you can see here. This was not observed before in the wild type background. And when cytokinin was added to the induced plants, Kali developed also in the inducible line in the wild type background suggesting that the excess cytokinin that results from CKX7 inactivation plays a role in the formation of this Kali. This also suggests that there are other genes that are being regulated by NTT that are able to trigger the formation of Kali when CKX7 is not present. Based on the results that I just presented to you, we have concluded that NTT connects an auxin input signal through R5 or monopterols to a cytokinin output through the regulation at different steps in the pathway, as we can see here. Here is our working model, where auxin input or other inputs will affect the activity of R5, also called monopter, monopteros, which in turn will regulate NTT. And downstream NTT, besides other genes, we can find different cytokinin-related genes that will affect this pathway, either in a positive or negative way. We also found many other genes in the transcriptome that are worth being further studied. And Therefore, the, the um, regulation of entity in the cytokinin pathway is complex and it seems to affect cytokinin homeostasis at different levels. Well, this is the end of the story for the moment. Of course, there are many questions open now and we would really like to keep on working on them. Thanks a lot for listening to this talk. Also, thanks to all the people that collaborated in this work that were presented at the beginning. And I would also like to thank Simvestab, the institute where I work, CONACYT, who provided the funding for this work. And um, recently, I started participating in this international consortium with the European Union. Please let me know if there are questions. I will be happy to hear them and try to answer them the, the, the best I can. Uh, if there is no time, you can also write to me. Um, I put my email in the screen. Thanks again. Excellent talk, Nayeli. Uh, we have plenty of time for questions. <laughs> Thanks a lot, Dan. Thanks to, to everybody. I yeah, Sorry, I was worried that my internet would not work, so I prefer to, to record <laughs> the, the talk. Seems like it's working great now. We have a quick first question in the chat from Luis Cardenas. Okay. NTT overexpression seems to induce big trichomes in the leaves. Is this correct? Yes. Yeah, yeah. We didn't look further to it, but yes. Yeah, yeah. You look to have very good eyes. <laughs> Uh, anybody can raise their, oh, we have uh, one from uh, Professor Dubrov, uh, Dubrovsky. Um, let me unmute. Can you talk? Yes. Uh, Nayeli, thank you very much. Very interesting talk. I would like to ask you if you have verified in, in CKX7 mutant background when you have this callus formation, is that related to lateral root primordia or it is independent? 
We think, we, we have not checked very carefully, but we think it's related to lateral root primordia. We think that the lateral roots, instead of becoming lateral roots, that's, they start to develop as, as cali. But we need to look, uh, yeah, more carefully to that. It, it from the for the from the position, it seems that they are lateral roots that, that change. Okay. Uh, but in the case when we add uh, cytokines, then the whole root starts to become a, a callus. Oh, okay, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any more questions for Nigeli? I have one. Also looking at your uh, leaves. Um, I love leaf shape, of course, uh, but the serrations are just so prominent. And in your overall model, you start with oxen and the arfs, but then it goes to cytokinin and things like cali. And it seems like, like and when I think of oxen and arfs, I think more of like actual patterning of serrations. Whereas when it goes to like cytokinin and callus, I start thinking more of like meristems or like compound leaves. Um, what is your interpretation of those like serrations or like leaflets? Yes, I always thought they were serrations, but recently I have started to think more as, as leaflets. Actually, I didn't put all the genes that we found in the transcriptomes, but we also found cop genes, for example. So then, yes, maybe they are starting to become kind of, of leaflets. And even sometimes in the, in the leaf lamina, we have seen some cases in which you also get some growths there. Uh, but no, we have not really um, used markers, for example, to see what, what is that. But the, the presence of, of the cut genes suggests that it may be more related to, uh, yeah, like, like a small leaflet. Um, on the other hand, I, I don't think this is the only thing that NTT does. Probably it's, it's orchestrating very different processes at the same time, and this is only one of them. Thank you. And uh, let's, Mario, we'll get to you, but let's first go to uh, Patricia. Can you unmute, Patricia? Try it now. Yes, I think I can now. Uh, I have a question, Natalia, about the serrations and the leaf shape. Do you know if any environmental conditions such as light might change the serrations phenotype or is completely independent of what light conditions uh, have? Do you know something about this? Thanks, Patty. Thanks a lot for the question because actually, uh, we do see changes, so sometimes there are super pronounced serrations, and sometimes they can be just undulations. Um, this depends more on the line, on, on the transformant itself, but actually we have never checked if it also depends on the light conditions, for example, uh, for example sorry. And thinking about cytokinins, um, yeah, it's known that actually cytokinin signaling is affected by light. So actually it would be very interesting to check this in, in the transformants in the inducible lines. And next we will go to Mario. Thank you. Thanks, Nayeli. That was a really good talk. Um, I have a good question regarding, uh, again, about the shape of the, the plants. So the shape of the, of the leaf also remind me about uh, some classical uh, smaller name mutants, just like serrate and some other, because you not only have serrations, if actually those are serrations, but also the shape, it's kind of uh, uh, narrowed, like in uh, RDR6 mutants. And have you looked for small RNA uh, uh, defects in, in, your, uh, in your plants? Thanks, Mario. Very, very interesting question. A long time ago, we started to do some crosses. Um, we also thought they were related. And now we focus more in the transcriptome. We did not see something so general. I, I think now maybe it's more related to, to the cut genes um, that can also be regulated by, by uh, microRNA. So maybe, maybe that's um, what it's affected. But I think we should look closer to our transcriptomes in, in any case. I think it's a very nice suggestion. Thanks. Thank you, uh, Nayeli. A beautiful talk and great questions, everybody. Uh, we move on. Uh, Mario will introduce the uh, next speaker. Thank you, Dan. 
Okay, well, um, it is now my great pleasure and honor to introduce our second and last keynote speaker of the day. We have Roberto Solano from the Centro Nacional de Biotecnología del Consejo Superior de Investigaciones Científicas in Spain. The title of his talk is Evolution of Jasmonates in Land Plants and the Role in Thermal Tolerance. Roberto, if you're ready, could you please share your screen with us? Yes, okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Mario. Um, can you see it? Yes. Okay. All right. So thank you very much for the invitation, Mario. It's a pleasure to be here, and I really enjoy the talks of the sessions today. Uh, so today I'm going to be talking about um, evolution of jasmonites and basically how we discover that the hormone that activates the jasmonite pathway is different in um, uh, bryophytes and vascular plants, right? And I will be talking about the evolutionary implications that this, this discovery has to understand the evolution of jasmonites. So we have been, uh, uh, yes, now. So we have been working on jasmonites for quite some time already, and because jasmonites are uh, very important hormones for plant survival in nature, and because they regulate many aspects of growth and development, and that ha I have divided here in three main uh, uh, topics. So basically, jasmines regulate fertility. Without jasmines, uh, plants won't set seeds, and what? Uh, so we basically won't see any plant on Earth. Uh, in addition to fertility, jasmonates are very well known for regulation of defenses, so against insects and also necrotrophic pathogens. And uh, jasmonates also regulate growth, they inhibit growth at the same time that they activate defenses. So they are very important in this trade-off between growth and defense that has uh, very deep implications in agronomy and uh, in crop yield. Um, one of the reasons why jasmonates uh, regulate defenses is because they regulate the secondary metabolism, the accumulation of secondary metabolites, which are different in different species. And here are uh, four examples that are very interesting uh, molecules or are uh, current anti-cancer drugs used in pharmacology, right? So these are uh, bimblastine, bincristine from Binca or paclitaxel and taxol from Taxus. So basically what we want to do in the lab is to try to understand jasmine biology and try to derive from this knowledge uh, biotech applications that may be interesting in agronomy or even in pharmacology, as I will show you at the end of the talk. Um, okay, I need to introduce very briefly the biosynthesis of jasmine because it's going to be key for this talk today. And uh, jasmonate uh, come from uh, different fatty acids from the memory of, of chloroplasts, mainly linolenic acid, and through a series of reactions that I'm not going to detail today, give rise to this important molecule for the talk, OPDA. And OPDA travels to the peroxisome, and there, uh, through, uh, by the action of this key enzyme, OPR3, that reduces this double bond here, funnels the OPDA molecule to the beta oxidation pathway and after three cycles give rise to jasmonic acid. And then jasmonic acid is conjugated to isoleucine in the cytoplasm by JAR1. This is another key enzyme, so keep it in mind, OPR3 and JAR1. And uh, jasmine isoleucine is the real bioactive form of the hormone, actually not any um, epimer of jasmine isoleucine, there are two in the, in the cell, the cis isomer plus 7 isojasmine solution is the active molecule that inactivates after uh, epimerization to this um, trans isomer, minus jasmine solution. And basically, this is the molecule that binds the receptor and activates uh, the jasmine responses. In the, in the nature, there is another molecule called coronatin, and coronatin is produced by certain strains of Pseudomonas syringae, uh, which is a very neat example of how evolution has uh, uh, produced a, a molecule in Pseudomonas to cheat the plant in the other benefit. And basically, I introduced coronatin because this is a molecule that mimics jasmine solution and we use indistinctly in our experiments uh, to activate the jasmine pathway. So you will be uh, hearing uh, me to talk about coronatin or jasmine solution indistinctly. Uh, regarding the 
signaling pathway. These slides summarizes about or more than 20 years of research. Uh, very long time ago, we discovered a family of transcription factors mix that uh, activated jasmine responses through binding to this G-box element in the promoters of those genes. Now we know many other genes, other transcription factors from different families that activate these responses, but these were the first ones. And uh, invasive conditions in all transition factors are repressed by this uh, repressor complex formed by the just repressors that through this adapter protein ninja brings the co-repressor topless and, and its tone the acetylases to the chromatin to lock the chromatin, right? In the presence of the hormone, the hormone triggers the interaction between the two pieces of the co-receptor, which is uh, the, the jazz protein itself, the, the, the repressor itself, is, the, is also a, a co-receptor. And this co one protein, which is the F-box protein of the, this SCF type of E3 ubiquitin ligases. And so the interaction leads to the ubiquitination of uh, jazz repressor and then uh, the degradation by the proteasome. So this liberates the transition factors from the repressor complex that now can activate transcription through uh, interaction to the um, general machinery through this uh, subunit of the mediator complex. So in this um, couple of decades, we uh, have uh, identified not only these components, but also many different mechanisms. Um, so I think I lost the, the uh, all right here. So <clears throat> many different, I was saying, that we have identified not only the components, but also different mechanisms to regulate those components. And uh, But I want to focus my talk today in two issues that were worrying me <coughs> in uh, the current model Arabiopsis Italiana. One of these issues is redundancy. All the components of the pathway or even the new mechanisms that we are identifying that regulate these components of the pathway uh, are genes belonging to um, medium to large gene families that share partial redundant functions, right? And this difficult very much the genetic analysis. So basically it slow down the, 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 the rate, the pace of discovery, right? The speed of discovery. So since a few years ago, I was looking for a different system, much simpler, that could overcome this redundancy problem. And the other issue I want to, to discuss today is representativity, right? And with representativity, what I mean is that all these details of the pathway, we have discovered those, we and of course many other laboratories, by using one single model species, which is Arabiopsis thaliana. And of course, don't take me wrong, Arabiopsis has been a wonderful model system for plant molecular biology, but it's just one species out of the 400,000 species that are out there on Earth, right? And these species are very different. So, for instance, if you compare Arabiopsis to a sequoia, it is very clear that these, uh, these plants are very different, right? So I don't expect that the details that we discover in the pathway or in any other pathway uh, are exactly the same in these different species, right? So uh, if we don't want to end having a very narrow view of plant biology, we actually need to understand how these details are in different species. And uh, we have actually a wonderful opportunity now because um, we have a genome sequence already of uh, many representative of these species or these lineages in the tree of life, right? So just to summarize this, I think understanding conservation of the pathways is very important to broaden our view of uh, plant biology, not only uh, to understand or broaden this view, but also because this could be uh, used as an approach to uh, find specificities or new mechanisms that uh, are present in different species that may help us to overcome the redundancy, uh, the, the problem I was introducing before. Right? And even if we don't find these specificities, studying the, the pathways, our favorite pathways in different uh, plant lineages, at least we will understand how, how current pathways appear in evolution and how they evolve, right? So with this simple idea in mind, I was starting to look for uh, the, our favorite genes uh, of the jasmine signaling pathway in different important steps in evolution from Arabiopsis to lower algae. And with this simple analysis, what I found was something 
quite interesting to me because I found that um, you know the whole set of components of the jazz machine learning pathway appear with land colonization, so they only uh, appear in land plants, not in algae. And uh, there was a species, Marcatia polymorpha, where uh, all these components were represented by only one gene, one representative. Later in evolution, each of these functions became more complicated with gene duplication, etc., and became uh, small to medium gene families, right? So this is why I became interested in, in this species, Marcatia polymorpha, because the simplicity, the low redundancy. Marcantia is a liverwort, and therefore one of the three classes of bryophytes, which are sister to all uh, vascular plants and are separated by uh, more than 450 million years of independent evolution. And this is very powerful in terms of uh, evolutionary studies. Uh, at that time, I, I was very lucky to participate in this project of the characterization of the genome of Marcatia polymorpha, that was led by John Bowman, Takayuki Kochi, Tony Yamato. And, and actually, Mario, I think, uh, was also participating in this project. And this was very, in, very interesting to our uh, laboratory because in addition to, the, to set up the, the model system in the lab, I learned that uh, this low gene redundancy not only applied to the JASMARI signaling genes, but all kind of regulatory and signaling genes in the genome of Marcantia. So Marcantia is a very neat model system for uh, understanding regulatory processes, right? And in addition to that, uh, and to the, this key evolutionary position or the power of evolutionary analysis in Marcantia, all kind of tools for transformation, CRISPR, et cetera, Marcantia has homologue recombination, et cetera, were very well set up already, right? So this was a very mm, nice system to start working in the lab. And uh, so we established this uh, Marcantia in the lab as a new model system. And um, so in addition to, um, so the first thing we did was to uh, analyze the conservation of our favorite pathways. As I was saying at the beginning, we uh, all the components of the signaling pathway was, were conserved. Now, when we analyze the conservation of the biosynthesis of the hormone, turns out that the chloroplastic part was conserved. So we expected that OPDA could be produced, but these two key enzymes that I was introduced at the beginning, OPR3 and JAR1, were not conserved in the, in the genome, were not present in the genome. So it was very unlikely that this uh, peroxisomal and uh, cytoplasmic part of the synthesis occur, and therefore it was very unlikely that Marcantia could synthesize just my solution. And actually, we um, measure these compounds after bonding, which is one of the stress signals that uh, activate the accumulation of these compounds in Arabiopsis. And we found that uh, OPDA accumulated very nice, uh, nicely and transiently, very quickly in, in uh, Marcantia, but we could not detect jasmonic acid or jasmine solution, right? And not only that, uh, Marcantia does not produce um, uh, jasmine solution, but also does not resp respond to exogenous treatment of jasmine solution or jasmonic acid. So in fact, none of, uh, of the three classes of bryophytes, uh, liverworts, mosses, or horworts, uh, respond to jasmine solution, whereas they all respond to OPDA inhibiting growth, right? So Marcantia or bryophytes in general do not produce jasmine solution and do not respond to exogenous treatments. Um, Oops. And so this raised this very interesting situation in which we have a group of plants, bryophytes, that contain all components of the jasmine selenium pathway, but they don't contain the hormone to activate this pathway, right? And therefore, uh, we decided to try to identify this, uh, the molecule that activated this pathway, but first we needed to make sure that the signaling pathway, these components were functionally conserved, right? And for this, we set uh, a series of uh, combined approaches. We first identified or localized all components of the pathway in the right compartments. We tested all possible interactions between the components of the pathway to make sure or based in the, uh, the information that we had in Arabidopsis. And we also um, 
we also obtain uh, mutants of all components to make sure that the phenotype that we uh, show were consistent with the uh, information that we had of those uh, homologous genes in Abiopsis. And basically, this is the example of, of just mutants. These are two alleles, and they are uh, string dwarfs, which is consistent with a constitutive inhibition of the of growth by a constitutive activation of the pathway when we eliminate the repressor. The same thing with the transcription factor. If we eliminate the transcription factor, then we don't get response to the hormone, and these uh, mutants in the transcription factor are insensitive to the hormone. And the same thing with the receptor. We obtain different mutants in the female or male background uh, of the receptor co one and these uh, mutants were completely insensitive to the hormone compared to the wild type male or female plants, right? And once we have these mutants, we could ask whether the processes regulated by this pathway are the same as in Arvidopsis. And uh, here you can see that uh, growth, inhibition of growth is regulated by the CO1 pathway. Defenses are regulated by the CO1 pathway. You can see here that the CO1 mutant is extremely susceptible to insect feeding compared to wild type plants. And they are also much more susceptible to fungal infection than wild type plants. You can see here this, um, this uh, affected, uh, more affected CO1 mutants than the wild type plants by by a, a fungi. But what is different in uh, between Marcanti and Abiopsis is the regulation of fertility, because uh, fertility is not affected in the in this uh, mutant. So we can cross COI1 male with female plants and obtain perfectly fertile sporophytes and that set um, spores in same numbers as in, uh, in, the, in the crosses with wild type plants. So what this means is that uh, this pathway was co-opted later on in evolution to regulate pollen development, which is what is basically regulated in Abiopsis. But uh, the gamete development itself is not affected uh, by the pathway. And, and, and therefore, of course, Marcantia doesn't have pollen, so uh, fertility, pollen development uh, does not affect the fertility in Marcantia. And in terms of gene expression, and the type of genes or, or, or gene ontology terms that are regulated by uh, this pathway in Marcanti are pretty much the same as uh, in Abidopsis. So the same uh, gene ontology term as uh, responses to stress, wounding, and GA, secondary metabolism, etc. These are the same terms that we obtain uh, in Abidopsis. But probably the best uh, proof of functional conservation of the pathway is that we can complement the CoI1 mutant, which is, as I was saying, insensitive to the treatment with OPDA compared to the wild type. We can partially complement this defect by expressing the receptor from Arabiopsis. Now, the streaking uh, or the interesting result here is that now these plants are able to respond to coronatin or jasmine solution, uh, which are, as I was saying before, uh, are uh, the, the wild type plants are completely insensitive or coi one mutants, right? So what this means is that the whole pathway is conserved. The responses activated by this pathway are the same in Marcantia and Abiopsis, but the receptor is slightly different and determines the specificity or the molecule that is going to activate the, the pathway, right? In the case of uh, Marcantia receptor, OPDA, or as I will show you later on, other derivative of OPDA, Act is the, the, the ligand activating the pathway, whereas in <coughs> Arabidopsis um, is just monitor solution or coronary, right? So to try to identify the uh, molecular determinants in the COI-1 protein that determine this uh, ligand specificity, we uh, complemented the COI-1 mutant with chimeras that express different parts of uh, COI-1 from Arabidopsis or Marcantia. And what we found was that the C terminus of, uh, of COI1 was determining the ligand specificity because if we had the C terminus from Arabidopsis, for instance, in this case, then we get the same response at the full length uh, Arabidopsis COI1. So response to both OPDA and uh, Germany solution. But if we have the uh, C terminus from Marcantia, then we get the same response as the wild type uh, full length Marcantia COI1. Right? So we focus on trying to analyze this um, 
the C terminal part, and of course, uh, using the, the all sequences that we could find in this uh, 1KP database. So there are uh, hundreds of sequences from Brave Fights, quite one from Brave Fights, and also uh, about 900 sequences uh, from uh, vascular plants. And of course, we found many differences in the in this C terminus part, but we focus on a particular amino acid that was this one here, an alanine in all koi ones from all vascular plants, right? So always an alanine in this particular position, but never an alanine in this position in any koi of any bryophyte, right? Most uh, usually valine or isoleucin, valine in the case of uh, MP koi one, the Marcantia koi one. And this was a very interesting uh, residue because actually uh, this residue contacts the hormones in the binding pocket and contacts the hormones. So we thought that this could be relevant for determination of the specificity of the ligand. So what we did was to uh, complement the koi one mutant with uh, a mutant version of Marcantia koi one in which we substitute the valin in this position to an alanine, right? And uh, this protein was functional because could complement the insensitivity of koi one to OPDA, but now the transgenic plants also responded to jasmine solution and coronating, right? So what this means is that one single amino acid was sufficient to switch a specificity or to broaden the specificity from the Marcantia koi one receptor to the Arabidopsis koi one receptor. And probably the reason is that being a smaller alanine here in this position makes a bigger binding pocket that allows coronatine or jasmine solution to fit in here. Whereas uh, in the case of valine, which is slightly bigger, uh, doesn't or makes a, a smaller uh, binding pocket and doesn't allow the, the fitting of this molecule. What is interesting here is that this, this bigger or a smaller uh, binding pocket suggested that the molecule binding uh, or the hormone, the ligand of the Marcantia koi one should be smaller in size than the hormone in Abidopsis. Um, we knew that OPDA was not the ligand. Uh, this is the typical pull-down experiment that we use to, to show that a ligand is really a ligand of, of the receptor. So we, we try to pull down, uh, we use extracts of Arabidopsis uh, plants that express koi one flag and try to pull down this koi one flag using uh, a just gene fused to MVP in a column, right? So uh, in the absence of any molecule, there is no interaction, so we can pull down uh, koi one but if we use just my solution or coronatine, then they, they trigger the interaction and we can pull down COI-1. OPDA was not a ligand of COI-1, uh, just in, in Abidopsis, and none of these molecules were ligand in Marcantia. So we thought that, uh, of course, the, the, the ligand in Marcantia should be a derivative of OPDA, and to try to find out what this ligand was, uh, we actually uh, searched in the literature for all possible molecules that we thought uh, that had been described in, in any system, in any plant, and that we thought could be derivatives of OPDA. We ordered those in different catabolic pathways. And thanks to a collaboration with uh, Max Humber in the Karolinska Institute, he synthesized most of these molecules for us. So we were able to test the activity of these molecules and also to use them as standards in mass spec experiments to quantify the accumulation after bonding of this molecule. So what we were looking for was a molecule specific of Marcantia and not present in Arabidopsis that, that was induced after bonding, accumulated after bonding. And of course, we didn't find any. Uh, actually, what we found was a very well-known molecule for us, DynoPDA, that because DynoPDA is, uh, we know it because it's a precursor of uh, just my solution in, in vascular plants. This molecule was present both in uh, Marcantia and Abiopsis, but in Marcantia had this isomer, dinor iso PDA, that was a specific Marcantia not present in Abiopsis. And this isomer uh, accumulated very nicely after bonding, after five or 30 minutes of bonding, very transiently, and uh, more than dinor PDA or OPDA itself. And when we treat plants, with uh, these molecules, actually with all the molecules that uh, Max Humber synthesized for us, we found that only dinoisopda or dinoopda inhibited growth similar to 
OPDA in a COI-1 dependent manner, right? So these uh, molecules were not inhibiting growth in COI-1. So this suggested that these molecules could be actually the ligands that the, of COI-1 that we were looking for. And uh, using different kind of protein-protein uh, interaction assays, we were able to demonstrate that actually dinorizo PDA is the, the most, the, the, the strongest uh, ligand of uh, COI-1, although dinorcis PDA uh, can also be a ligand of uh, COI-1. Although we think that the real um, final molecule accumulating and activating the pathway, the real ligand of COI-1 uh, is dinorized OPDA because, uh, as you will see later on, is the final, the end product of the biosynthetic pathway and is also accumulating more than uh, any other molecule, any other uh, isomer in the, um, in the cell, right? So with this, uh, we found the, the molecule, the, the ligand of COI-1 in Marcantia to be dinorized OPDA. And uh, here is the reason why the Arabidopsis COI-1 can complement the uh, Marcantia COI-1 mutant. And this is because dinor PDA can trigger the uh, formation of complexes between Arabidopsis COI-1 and Marcantia yes, right? However, what is interesting is that when we use a uh, jazz from Arabidopsis, in this case, just nine, but we have tested all jazzes, dino PDA is unable to promote this interaction. So this experiment was suggesting that the specificity for the ligand is not only uh, dependent on uh, COI-1, on this residue that I introduced before, but also depends on the nature of the JAS protein that, uh, or the core receptor JAS, right? And this is not only uh, as, um, based on this um, in vitro uh, assay, but uh, also in vivo, we can completely switch the specificity of the, uh, the response of the pathway or the hormone by uh, switching both uh, the COI and JAS um, uh, core receptors in a double mutant COI-1 JAS, right? So as I was saying before, uh, in, the, in the case of the uh, COI-1 mutant Marcantia, we can complement the specificity, sorry, the, the, the defect, uh, the insensitivity uh, to OPDA by expressing the Arabidopsis COI-1, but still the, there is some response uh, to OPDA, right? It's not complete, but there is some, some response. If we change also the uh, JAS uh, gene, the JAS repressor by a JAS, in this case, JAS3, then we don't get, uh, we get plants that do not respond at all to OPDA and now only respond to JAS my solution or conant, right? So we completely switch the specificity from the uh, natural hormone to the, um, the hormone from uh, vascular plants by switching both, only by switching both uh, um, uh, pieces of the core receptor. Um, okay, we also wanted to understand how these molecules are synthesized in the cell because in the case of Arabidopsis, uh, OPDA linolenic acid that I was introducing at the beginning gave rise to OPDA and then OPDA, OPDA followed this pathway to produce jasmonic acid and jasmonic solution in the presence and or requires OPR3, right? But in the in Marcantia, there is no OPR3. So therefore we thought, well, maybe there is a direct conversion of OPDA into dinor OPDA or dinorized OPDA. And to try to test this hypothesis, we use deuterated and derivatives of linolenic acid and uh, OPDA and measure the deuterated uh, products that uh, after uh, exogenous treatment. And just to give you simply an example, if we treated the plants with uh, deuterated OPDA, then we saw accumulation of both dinor OPDA and dinorized OPDA after very quickly, right? Uh, but not OPC6, which is a marker of this other pathway. And if we treat with deuterated dinor OPDA, then we only saw uh, dinorized OPDA, deuterated dinorized OPDA. So basically what this suggested is that this is the pathway for the biosynthesis of the hormone, and this uh, dinorized OPDA is the final product of the biosynthetic pathway. And now, um, there is this has important implications in the terms uh, in terms of uh, uh, Arabidopsis, also uh, biology. This is not a specific of Marcantia, and this is, a, I think, a good example of how understanding. Uh, 
processes in a different plan can also help when you go back to Arabidopsis to identify new processes that uh, were previously hidden or at least unknown for us, right? And, and the example is here. So at, at the same time that we discovered this uh, biosynthetic pathway in Marcantia, uh, Andrea Kini in my laboratory was uh, trying to understand why OPR3, which is this mutant that blocks the OPDI conversion and the synthesis of jasmonic acid, actually accumulated some jasmonic acid and was able to activate defenses to, to different kind of pathogens. So, and what he discovered uh, was that also in Arabidopsis, OPDA can convert into dinor OPDA, but in this species, instead of going further to dinorized OPDA, uh, dinor OPDA is transformed to dinor, uh, sorry, tetranor OPDA and 4 5 dihydrogea And then this molecule is reduced to jasmonic acid in the cytoplasm by different uh, OPR proteins, right? So with this, Andrea actually discovered a new pathway for um, the biosynthesis of GA in Avidopsis that uh, was previously unnoticed. And this pathway actually turns out to be the ancestral, we think is the ancestral pathway, the original pathway for biosynthesis of GA, because when he analyzed the presence of this intermediate tetranor and for the, the hydro GA in different algae and bryophytes, uh, he found that there was, this was the only, uh, I mean, the, 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 the intermediates were present in, in, in this uh, species that he analyzed. And this was the only pathway to produce jasmonic acid in this species. So what we think is that the renal pathway, the ancestral pathway for, for jasmonic acid was actually a catabolic pathway from OPDA by beta oxidation to get energy. So at that time, uh, jasmonic acid was not a, a hormone, was just uh, a product of the catabolism of, uh, of, the, of the degradation of, of OPDA. And, uh, and then later on in evolution, uh, OPR3 was invented and therefore uh, appeared this other, what we thought was the canonical pathway actually is a newly invented pathway in evolution uh, uh, to produce jasmonic acid in a more efficient way. And, Okay, so just to summarize what I just said, what we discovered is that uh, dinor OPDA is a key molecule that gives rise to the hormone dinorized OPDA in bryophytes to activate this pathway. Um, and later on in evolution, uh, with the invention of OPA3 and JAR1 in vascular plants, this hormone switched to germline solution, which required this complication of the, uh, of the biosynthetic pathway uh, uh, to produce uh, jasmonic acid and jasmine solution more efficient, right? And this also involved the, uh, a switch of one amino acid in CoI1 and uh, also a modification in uh, jazz proteins that restricted the capacity of this jazz to recognize dinorized OPA. Right? Now, the, the other question that was also interesting from these um, uh, conclusions was that dino OPDA is actually present in all plants, right? So uh, we know that dino OPDA is not a hormone in, uh, in vascular plants, but uh, we knew that dino OPDA was also present in um, carophytes, right? Because uh, actually we measure, for instance, in the, in the case of Clesomidium is a, is a carophyte. We measure these molecules and found that uh, Clesomidium can synthesize dino OPDA. So the question or the situation was, uh, actually, the opposite, as I was introducing at the beginning, now we have uh, a series of uh, uh, some plants that uh, have a, a hormone or a precursor of a hormone, but do not have the uh, signaling pathway that uh, this hormone activates, right? So the question was, what is the function of dinero PDA in these plants? And to try to identify this function, what we did was to uh, study or to analyze the transcriptional response of um, Clepsor medium uh, and also Marcantia and Avidopsis COI1 mutants because we wanted to avoid the COI1 dependent responses. Uh, so the response of these three plants to dinor OPDA, so a sojinous treatment to dinor OPDA. And what we found common in all of them was uh, geoterms that have to do with uh, different kinds of stresses, but mainly uh, temperature or heat stress, right? So we uh, thought that maybe this molecule had an ancestral role in 
activation of stress responses or even in thermotolerance. And to try to test this, we set these conditions in which we can uh, kill Marcantia, uh, wild type plants, by growing the plants uh, about two hours at 37 degrees. The plants die, and this is also happening in, in Koi-1. So this is a Koi-1 independent response. And, but these plants survive if we pretreat the, the place with OPDA or dinor OPDA, right? And this not only happened in uh, Marcantia, but also in Clesal medium. So uh, Clesal medium dies at 45 degrees, but not if we pretreat the, the plants with, or the plates with OPDA or dinor uh, OPDA, right? So just to summarize this, uh, what we think is that uh, dinor OPDA was a molecule present in the ancestor of all streptophytes that invented this molecule for activation or for to cope with uh, different stress responses, including thermotolerance. Later on in evolution, when uh, algae uh, conquered the land and, and gave rise to the, the, uh, the, the current land plants, uh, they invented the signaling pathway and dinopia acquired a new function as a hormone activating a particular receptor. And later on in evolution, this hormone switched to a different one by complication of the uh, biosynthetic pathway, right? And <clears throat> this is all I wanted to, to tell about <clears throat> the evolution of jasmonates. And since I have a few minutes, I would like to explain or to uh, share with you a project that we have been um, uh, working on in the last year. So I don't need to explain to you how bad has been the, the pandemic of, uh, of COVID-19, right? So um, with over al almost 5 million deaths already worldwide, uh, now in Europe, we have a lot of, uh, uh, again, new infections. So the situation, even with vaccinated, uh, uh, highly vaccinated population, is uh, still very bad. There haven't been, um, until very recently, uh, any drug for treatment of the, of the COVID-19. Remdesivir has been the only one that was not very active, actually. And a couple of weeks ago, I heard about the um, the approval of uh, a new drug from Merck and another one from Pfizer that is coming. But anyway, still, uh, at least one year ago, there was a need for drugs uh, to treat um, uh, the COVID-19. Um, and one year ago, I was thinking, as a uh, plant scientist, how could I uh, contribute to, to fight the disease, right? Uh, could we do something in our lab to, to try to help uh, humanity, right? And, uh, well, as I was introduced at the beginning, although liver goals are very simple in terms of uh, regulatory processes, they are very complex in terms of secondary metabolism. And uh, liver goals have an uh, enormously rich diversity of secondary metabolites. So, for instance, they have they produce more or have been described more than 1,600 uh, terpenoids in, in liver words. And, uh, and, well, Marcantia is one of them uh, that produces many different uh, secondary metabolites. So we thought, well, maybe we should uh, search for antiviral uh, compounds in Marcantia. And uh, I was very lucky at that time because... Um, uh, I could collaborate with a group of virologists in, in our institute, in the CMB in Madrid, that had set up these uh, conditions. We had a, a high security lab in the center, so they could make infections with SARS-CoV-2. And uh, these are monkey cells grown in, in plates in which uh, well, they, they had this color in, in when they are monkey infected. But when they infect it with uh, SARS-CoV-2, the cells die and have this lighter color, right? So when we pre-treat the, the cells or we treated the cells with extra, different extra from uh, our favorite plant or with mutants, wild type or, or different mutants, actually very low concentrations of the extract were protecting the, the cells and avoiding the accumulation of the virus. And actually we can measure the RNA from the virus and um, the reduction was uh, huge and comparable to that of the, um, the um, Rendesivir, which is this uh, approved drug for the COVID-19. So we decided to go ahead 
and um, and fractionate the extracts to try to find out what the, the, the this antiviral was. And you can see different fractions without uh, uh, activity. Some of the fractions concentrate the activity. Actually, the activity was very good, reducing the amount of infection. And, and what something that was important was that uh, cell number or cell viability was, were not affected. So this antiviral uh, or these fractions were very safe, were non-toxic for the cells. And uh, just to cut a very long story short, uh, we keep fractionating. And actually, we ended with a fraction in which there was a huge accumulation of a compound that was uh, less accumulated in other less active fractions. And uh, we could uh, determine the exact max mass of this compound. And with the exact max, uh, we uh, derive this uh, formula and, and the idea that, or the hypothesis that this compound could be filled for by day. And as you can see here, filled for by day is basically a, a catabolite of uh, chlorophyll, so not a secondary metabolite as we expected, but a primary metabolite. And this is chlorophyll A without the, the magnesium that become magnesium of chlorophyll A, so present in all plants. And, and uh, so fair for by day was commercially available. So we bought fair for by day to confirm that this was the molecule with antiviral activity and using different kind of uh, either monkey cells or human lung cells. Uh, we were able to demonstrate that fear for by day, in fact, is the uh, is a potent antiviral uh, that uh, that is very safe and does not um, affect cell viability with an activity that is very close or very similar to Remdesivir. And not only that, but uh, fear for by day has a broad spectrum antiviral activity against other viruses like uh, hepatitis C virus or other, uh, this cough coronavirus or West Nile, etc. So different kind of virus. So in conclusion, um, we are very excited that uh, to have uh, identified this uh, fail for by day, the crawfield derivative as a potent antiviral against SARS-CoV-2, uh, at least in vitro in, in culture cells. Uh, fear for bite has a broad spectrum activity against plus strand RNA virus, and we think it's a good candidate for antiviral therapies against uh, COVID-19 because uh, actually fear for bite A has already passed um, clinical trials in humans because it has been previously used in anti-cancer therapies because it's a photoactivable um, uh, uh, molecule and therefore has been using photoactivable uh, therapy. So it has been already proved that it's not toxic in humans. And therefore, um, I think the application in the clinic could be um, kind of straightforward. And uh, with this, I just want to, sorry, I don't know why. Yeah, I, I just want to um, thank you very much for your attention and acknowledge the people that has done this work. So. Uh, in the case of uh, the, the evolution of jasmonates, uh, uh, Isabel Monte and uh, Andrea Kini and Sophie Nisho had a prominent role. Uh, Guillermo has done the, the work with uh, COVID, the, the, the Fear for by Day. And of course, I, I want to um, uh, thank our collaborators in the antiviral platform of the CMB and all of our collaborators in the in the uh, jasmonate field. Of course, I, I, I want to thank the, the funding agencies and, uh, and you for your attention. I will be very happy to take any question that, that you want to place. Thank you very much. Thank you, Roberto. That was amazing. Um, so we have time for questions. Okay, so I'm gonna read one from the chat. That was the first one that, that came in. It's from Najeli Marsh. Uh, great talk, wonderful work, thanks. I would like to ask, what do you think that was the adaptive, adaptive advantage of changing to jasmonic acid in plants like Arabidopsis? And also, how do you think that DN OPDA protects organisms from heat stress? Yeah, <clears throat> okay, so these are good questions. And the first one is what I would like to know, and I, I, I can only guess, right? So uh, so there is one 
very key important issue, which is that uh, jasmonic acid and jasmine solution are more polar than dinor or PDA, right? So what we think is that, uh, of course, the hormone was originally dinor PDA. In plants that are not uh, vascular, then that's okay. But in plants that uh, invented vasculature, having a more polar molecule that could uh, move through vasculature could have been a, a very important advantage, right? So we think that this may be the key. Uh, of course, uh, we don't have any data to support this uh, hypothesis, and, and I would like to to design experiment, but it's not easy to to do. And regarding the second question, how DynoPDA protects organism? Uh, yeah, I, I haven't explained that, but this is because um, DynoPDA has a particularly uh, DynoCiso PDA and also OPDA had a. Uh, has a, in the structure, chemical structure, has a double bond and an alpha beta insaturation, which makes this electrophilic uh, character of the molecule. So these molecules are electrophiles. And uh, I think uh, probably what they are doing is to modify molecules by directly uh, binding to these molecules. So uh, we are actually trying to find uh, targets of this uh, molecule modified by different uh, chemical methods. So, uh, yeah, um, probably they could modify transition factors, but also uh, transport proteins or anything, right? So they are very, actually, this is also very important because these molecules are very reactive, right? And this is why the, the plant uh, don't want to use dinor OPDA or to have OPDA free and this is probably why the, the plant invented dinor PDA, which is much less um, reactive and much less, much less electrophilic. And so th this is why probably why dinor PDA is the hormone in bryophytes and uh, jasmine solution in vascular plants. And dinor PDA and OPDA are molecules that need to be controlled. Thank you. Thanks. We have a question from uh, Patricia Leon. Hi. Uh, first of all, congratulations. It was a great talk. And I have two general yeah. questions. One of them is, in many cases, the uh, proteins in Martantia or the open breeding frames are bigger than those that we can observe in Arabidopsis. And I was wondering if this is the case for the jasmonic acid biosynthetic pathway that you analyze. Um, so you mean bigger and bigger? Uh, bigger in size. Yeah. yeah. Um, actually, <clears throat> the proteins are not bigger. The proteins in the, um, or, or the, the genes are much bigger. Um, you're right. But the proteins are not bigger. Oh, no. um, so what is bigger are, are the the introns and the um, uh, five prime and three prime uh, um, non-coding regions. But so the genes are really big, but the proteins are pretty much the same. Are not much no, bigger. Than okay. Okay. And my second question is regarding to um, the secondary metabolites. Do you have an idea if most of these metabolites come from the plastidial uh, terpenoids or they're coming from the uh, cytoplasmic terpenoids? Um, yeah, I don't know. When actually, uh, Marcantia, there are in liverworts in general, there are uh, specific uh, organelles that accumulate all terpenoids, and these are the oil bodies. So this doesn't exist in Arabidopsis and are specific or liverworts and and yeah uh, this is the, the biosynthesis and the accumulation of cool there in in oil bodies okay but the oil bodies are inside cytoplasm or are inside the plastids sorry say it again they are in the cytoplasm the oil bodies or they are inside the plastids no 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 are in the cytoplasm okay 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 so they probably come in for this mevalonic pathway isoprenoid and not from the MEP pathway from the part of, um. Yeah, well, actually, 
What I don't know is whether all terpenoids are accumulating in oil bodies or there may be part of the terpenoids accumulating elsewhere, right? So, but yeah, most uh, or many are accumulated there. They are especially organelles. Okay, thank you. Thanks to you. Okay. Um, so we're now uh, running into lunchtime. I just have a, one quick question regarding uh, the activity of uh, OPDA or the derivative. Uh, do you know if any of these uh, molecules can induce epigenetic changes? Not that I'm aware. Uh, you mean by directly by by modifying something or? Yeah, or uh, by indirectly by changing, for example, if, if they are so reactive, probably by uh, altering uh, some protein that might be involved in DNA methylation or histone modification. This is this is perfectly possible. Yeah, this is perfectly possible. I, we don't have data yet because we are, as I was saying, uh, we are trying to identify targets uh, by purification, different kind of um, uh, purification methods. But we still don't have uh, good results. And so we don't know the nature of the proteins that they are going to be modifying. But uh, my guess is that there will be many targets. And of course, proteins or uh, yeah, chromatin um, related proteins, etc., are perfectly uh, good targets, yes. Perfect. Thank you so much, Roberto. Uh, I think that we will close our uh, right. session. And thank you again for accepting our invitation. And thank you again for your great talk. OK. Thank you, you Mario. Thank you very much. Bye bye now. OK, so we have now uh, lunch. So I'll see you back at 2.45 for the uh, first flash talk session of the day. Thank you, everybody, and see you later.
session of the day. And uh, if everything is ready, let's go. Thank you. I'm going to present genome evolution and phylogenetic relationships in Opuntia Tehuacana. As background, Opuntia has multiple taxonomic problems, mainly due to hybridization and polyploidy. In Mexico, there are approximately 93 species, from which 15 are in the Tehuacan Huicatlán Valley. Only four of these species have been included in phylogenetic analysis. Furthermore, their chromosome numbers remain unknown. Opuntia tehuacana is a wild species endemic to the Tehuacan Cuicatlan Valley. It has variable characteristics throughout its distribution, such as the flower color, the shape of the stem, and the length and number of the spines. The aim of this work was to infer the phylogenetic position of Opuntia tehuacana in the context of its sympatric species and analyze their genome evolution by estimating ploidy levels and genome size in five populations. What we found in a broad phylogenetic context using three plastid markers, the species from the Tehuacan Huicatlan Valley are in the clades Nopalea and Bacillares. Opuntia tehuacana is nested within Bacillares and all of its terminals form a monophyletic group. Uh, about the genome size and the ploidy level in Opuntia tehuacana, Opuntia tehuacana is on decaploid and dodecaploid, the highest reported so far for the genus, and our results show significant differences between the two C nuclear DNA content, and this is probably due to allopolyploidy, satellite DNA transposable elements, or ribosomal genes in different genomes. Uh, finally, about the chromosome pairing and gene flow, in Opuntia tehuacana occurs a nuploidy, which may implicate gene flow from other species, and the pollen mother cells present rings and univalent, which have been observed in neoallopolyploids. Finally, we can conclude that multiple polyploidization events in Opuntia tehuacana are related to their ongoing genome size evolution. And this differentiation between the localities could also be related to their highly variable characteristics, but further studies should be performed to confirm this hypothesis. Finally, I would like to thank to all the institutions and people who helped to this work. Thank you. Hi, my name is Luis Gerardo Ortega. The topic is characterization and pharmacological evaluation of calistemon citrinus leaf herbosomes. Calistemon citrinus leaf extract has shown its potential effect as a possible anti-obesogenic agent. The biological activity of calistemon citrinus has been mainly attributed to phenolic compounds and terpenoids previously reported in vivo studies. The phytoconstituents, due to molecular weight and intrinsic instability in some physiological fluids, phenolic compounds passage through biological membranes is very limited. Carriers like phytosomes are promising systems to optimize oral absorption of encapsulated extracts. The phytosomes is a technology developed to complex standardize plant extracts or water-soluble phytoconstituents with phospholipids to produce lipid-compatible vesicular structures named herbosomes or phytosomes. The aim of this work was the standardization and pharmacological evaluation of calistemon strinus leaf herbosomes was evaluated. The calistemon strinus leaf herbosomes at dose 200 mg per kilogram show vesicular structures under the light microscope and the weight uh, analyzer particle showed aside from 100 13 nanometers with great similarity in terms of the size of the vesicular particles. Regarding solubility, it was found that the solubility of calistemon citrinus leaf herbosomes was much higher than the of calistemon citrinus leaf. Finally, it was found that the encapsulation efficiency 
of the herbosomes was the 80.49% represented by the concentration of the unbound Callistum serinus lead extract. With these results, the optimization of the herbosome preparation technique was optimized in terms of conditions of such as reaction time and temperature. The results highlight the potential of Callistum serinus compounds as supplements or pharmacological tools, suggesting a promising and safe phytosomal formulation containing bioactive agents of Callistum serinus that could lead to health benefits during obesity. Thanks for your attention. Hi, my name is Alfonso Sierra and my PhD project is titled Amerigaro Truncatula Mirutoni 199 Coordinates Environmental Responses. Well, we know that plant microRNAs participate in multiple processes, in the, including development, stress responses, and their own biogenesis. Their activity is exerted through cleavage of target mRNA or by translation or inhibition. Several plant microRNAs regulate transcripts, encoding uh, for transcription factors, thus, thus amplifying the microRNA effects through regulation of downstream genes. We previously identified MIR2199 in Medicao truncatula and other phalaxia species. In Medicao truncatula, four BHLH mRNAs encoding for basic helix, helix transcription factors are targeted by Medicago MIR2199. One of them, SAR1, is a key transcriptional activator of saponin biosynthesis a pathway previously shown to enhance symbiotic modulation. In this work, we determined that Medicago MIR2199 increases its abundance in roots and leaves, while SAR1 mRNA abundance is reduced upon water deficit. We are employing genome editing, header root transient transformation, and mutant lines to determine the molecular and phenotypical consequences of affecting MIR2199 and SAR1 levels, and in turn identified downstream genes networks regulated by this model involved in water deficit response and during root development. Our aim is to understand how SAR1 silencing mediated by MIR2199 is involved in the plant response to water deficit and root development. SAR1 role in saponin biosynthesis is known to promote plant bacteria symbiosis, which represents an expensive process for the plant in terms of carbon usage, while at the same, at the same time this element becomes one of the first affecting nutritional fluxes under a water deficit condition. How this process are coordinated could be addressed by studying the gene expression changes caused by MIR2199 and SAR1 regulation. Well, uh, I want to say thank you for listening to my talk, and uh, I will be glad to answer all the questions. Thank you, and bye. Currently, bioinformatics tools allow us to simulate molecular processes in a reliable way. However, before being used as a suitable method for the specific research, it is necessary to evaluate, validate its feasibility by experimental data. This work aims to evaluate the use of simulations to analyze the effect of the mutations and the delta delta G to be used as a selection method for target potential sites to increase the catalytic activity of the enzyme like about synthase or, or, or LOS in the hydrocarbon production process. LOS is the key enzyme for the lycoparine biosynthesis in the microalgae Botrococcus brownie eye arrays and has been demonstrated to be substrate promiscuous. We have adapted an in vivo system that allow us to evaluate the role of a specific residues and the substrate binding process of LOS based on the hydrocarbon production rate using E. coli as a host. In this slide, I show the estimated delta delta G of each amino acid of loss mutated to 20 amino acids. To validate this method, we analyzed the hydrocarbons and discovered that low delta-delta G increased the total hydrocarbon production and high 
alta, alta, delta G, decrease the hydrocarbon production. The lowest alta delta G was estimated on the serine 276. Interestingly, we noticed that high delta delta G increased the amount of lycopalcaine in the samples. With these results, we were able to demonstrate the reliability of the selection of in silico target sites and in a fast, easy, and economical way. We are at this moment working on the evaluation of in vivo hydrocarbons from other sites selected by Delta Delta G analysis, and we are confident that these sites will be determinant in the pursuit of the highly efficient LOS structures. Thank you for, so much for your attention, and thank you to everybody on the DevArens lab. Hello, my name is Julian Peña, and I'm going to present this research work by Lucy Medina, Pillada Junta Wong, and Blanca Barrera. We titled this Summergen Stress Affects the Expression of the Evening Complex Genes and Produces Altered Transcriptomic Outputs of the Diurnal Cycle. We are very interested on the impact of flooding on crops, which is brought to the field by hurricanes, and Mexico and the USA are in the middle of one of the most active sites of hurricane activity. Uh, submergence and drought stress compete every year to be number one stress causing economic damage on crops. So to learn more about this phenomena, we use Brachypodium distachium. We submerge this model grass at CT13, leave it underwater and started collecting plants uh, the next day at early dawn, middle of the day, evening, middle of the night and the next dawn. We did RNA-seq and gene ontology analysis to catch some genes like fluorine locust tea, which has a normal peak in the night, but under submergence is strongly downregulated. For that, we use sensitive and tolerant ecotypes such as BD21, as you can see, is the sensitive ecotype, and BD213, which is the tolerant ecotype. When we quantify this, we can see that BD213 stays green for longer periods of time when compared with BD21. So the first thing we observed when we did gene ontology analysis was that the evening complex genes in special PRR5, which is the master inhibitor of the clock genes is very upregulated. So if the master inhibitor is upregulated, then the rest of the clock genes could be expected to be downregulated. And such was the case as you can see here. Let's do another zoom on circadian clock associated and giantia. And these genes are also downregulated here in the gray line. What was the result of these alterations? For example, some of them were exclusive of the sensitive ecotypes such as cellulose synthesis. So this plant continues growing while the other one keeps the energy. The tolerant ecotype had, for example, pyruvate kinase upregulated, which is very important to keep the plant extracting energy for carbohydrates. We found many others in other time of the day, for example, polyamine biosynthesis and phenylalanine catabolism genes upregulated in the tolerant ecotype these both are new actors. We could also find older actors, such as nitric oxide regulation by means of upregulation of hemoglobin in the tolerant ecotype. So our conclusion is that submergent stress affects the expression of the evening complex genes, especially PRR5, and produce an altered transcriptome of the diurnal cycle. Some outputs are exclusive of the sensitive, some others of the tolerant ecotypes, and we are learning what all these results mean for plant survival. Thank you all. Flash talk, analysis of pitaya fruit exocar transcriptome to our identification of cuticle biosynthesis genes. The plant cuticle protects the fruit during development of ripening of harsh environmental conditions and extends the profile shelf life of fruit by reducing the water loss. Cactus are plants adapted to survive in environments with low water and low relative humidity cuticle plays an important role in the adaptation to these conditions. Nevertheless, there is no information about transcripts or proteins that plays a role in cuticle biosynthesis in cactus. Stenocerus turberi is a cactus endemic from Sonoran Desert, which produces a fleshy fruit named pitaya. In this work, we carry out the sequencing of the pitaya fruit exocar transcriptome 
to elucidate the molecular mechanisms of cuticle biosynthesis. This information could help in designing protocols to reduce water loss in other fruits. Trinity default parameters were used to assemble 243 million of reeds with a minimum prep quality score of 25. The assemble includes 174,000 transcripts with an N50 value of 2,110. 85% of complete transcripts and only 11 and 4% of fragmented and missing transcripts, respectively. Homology searching by alignment to different protein database shows that the percentage of homologous ranges from 37 to 49 for the protein database includes in this analysis, and for proteins from model plants and commercial fruits. In the case of cactus, percentage range from 44 to 66 percent, with the exception of Illucerius polyrhesus. All the cactus database included in this analysis show the highest amount of homologous transcript of strawberry transcriptome. This could be due to a higher conservation of sequences among the cactaceae family. 19% of transcripts neither show open reading frame nor homology, which represent a valuable resource for searching long non coding RNAs. We have already identified orthologous genes playing a role in cuticle biosynthesis in other species and reference genes for the quantification of the expression by real-time PCR. This information will be helpful for further studies about the molecular pathway of cuticle biosynthesis and response to abiotic stress in cactus. Thank you. Hello, my name is Oliver Rafin Magaña Rodriguez, and the name of this project is Antipancreatic Lipase Effect of Edible and Medicinal Plants. The strategies in the prevention of obesity can be controlling food intake or altering lipid metabolism by innovating fat absorption. Pancreatic lipase is the most important enzyme in the digestion of 50 to 70% of fat diet. It is responsible for the hydrolysis of triacylglycerols to monoacylglycerols and free fatty acids. Or is that a derivative of lipstatin obtained from Streptomyces toxitrini is the only pancreatic lipase inhibitor currently approved for the treatment of long term obesity. Its use can result in up to 10% weight loss when used in combination with diet and physical activity. However, this drug can cause adverse liver effects. One of the options to combat obesity is finding plants that have a strong activity to reduce the digestion of lipids from the diets. The main of this study is evaluating 30 70 ethanol. Ethanolic extract of plants, some edible, medicinal, or belonging to a family that have the inhibitory activity of pancreatic lipase to found a new anti-obesity agent. We collect the plant and separate the plant tissue, grind and macerate in ethanol, evaporate the solvent to obtain the pure extract to proceed to spectrophotometric anti-lipase assay in each extract. The degree of the Inhibition of pancreatic lipase in vitro was compared using Orlistat as a control. Results revealed that nine plants had a low percentage of inhibition of lipase activity, 41 or less percent. Nine extract with moderate percentage of inhibition, 41 to 50 percent. Eight extract, eight extract in high inhibition range, 51 to 60 percent. And 11 extract with the highest percentage of lipase inhibition greater or equal to 61%. Ethanolic extract of Ibisco transcendences of, left, of dry left display the highest inhibitory activity of pancreatic lipase, 72% at 400 milligrams per milliliter, very similar to our list. When performing the enzyme kinetic of Ibisco transcendences, it was found that it has an uncompetitive inhibition. That is the the extract can inhibit both the enzyme and the substrate enzyme complex, unlike the early set, which presents a competitive, a competitive inhibition. As a conclusion, the plant analysis have pancreatic lipase inhibitory activity. If this could show the, a very high anti lipase capacity, very similar to early set, so it could be a natural alternative for the prevention and control of hyperlipidemia and obesity. Thank you.
Hello, my name is Maria Guadalupe Frias Muñoz. I'm student in Universidad Autónoma de Zacatecas, and I'm doing my thesis in Tecnológico de Monterrey. So we have this breed that has renamed in silico characterization of one carbon metabolic genes during the post-harvest ripening of primitive fruits. First, American and Solanomico persicum. So let's start with folates. Folates, known as folic acid, they are essential in all the cells, and they are related with the several aspects in plants, just like development. And they're important because they donate one carbon for the biosynthesis of purines, stimulate, or amino acid, just like methionine. So uh, they assist the ripening process in climateric fruits. So we have this uh, folate that donate one carbon for the production of ethylene. And there's a previous work that says that ethylene affects the pools of folates in climateric fruits. So we have this uh, table. So we can see um at least one ortologous gene for one of arabidopsis taliana and this sequences in this alignment we can see a signal peptide for subcellular localization so uh we have this uh, phylogenetic tree so we can see that they come from the same family and we predict the subcellular localization so we can see with this little imaginis and uh right here we have this alignment so we compare these sequences and we can see they are highly conserved because the black part means that they're equal. So we can see the identity. And for methionine, it's more than 72%. And for um, SAMS, it's more than 77%. So right here, we have the expression of the hands, chance. Uh, and we get this information from the transcript done from Ibarra Laclet. And we can see how the um, genes are expressed in every stage in the ripening, so they're upregulated. And this is the same for uh, tomatoes, so we can see the impact for methionine and SAMS in the production of ethylene. Just uh, to finish, we have this conclusion, so we get at least one ortology gene from avocado and tomato genomes, fruit genomes. And these plants have one cytoplasmic and one organellar plastidic or mitochondrial predicted uh, methionine is support. And these proteins are highly conserved, just like we see in the alignment. And methionine and some expression was modulated temporarily in the ripening of avocado and tomato fruits during the perclimatory stage. Methionine synthase 1, the cytoplasmic is support and SAMs were expressed according to the meth and SAM requirements for ethylene synthesis. Finally, in the climatric and post climatric stage, ACS and ACO were expressed. Thank you so much, and I hope you that you like it. Hello, my name is Luis Angel Choca Orozco. I'm going to present the work titled RNA-seq analysis of the Dilemicus dispatchy alien sativum interaction. As collaborators, we have Donald Chamagleo, Carlos Gonzalez, Julio Mezcua, and Alejandra Rogon as corresponding authors. Dilemicus is a phytoparasite nematode considered with any top 10 more damaging nematodes for crops. Nematode is capable of surviving severe freezing in humid conditions, as well as being able to survive for a long time in soil and the host absence. This nematode causes significant economic losses in garlic cultivars. Garlic contains various substances with antimicrobial activity in even with nematicidal activity against some nematodes. However, this defense machine does not work against the invasion of the dipsasi. That is why our aim was to analyze the dipsasi garlic interaction to elucidate which are the mechanisms uh, what cause defense and nematode attack. For this purpose, we isolated in Tifica and cultural nematodes inside garlic buds. Mock and nematodes were included in healthy garlic slices and drinking times. The inoculation was carried out with 10,000 nematodes, mainly in juvenile stage. Issues were measured in liquid nitrogen followed by crystal RNA extraction. DNA Pirate libraries were sequenced from the plat Illumina platform. Expression analysis involved comparison of transcript of Allium versus Allium plus nematode and the different time points. We found that in the host 
some of the differentially expressed transcriptions that are related to disease resistances are inducing time zero, which was taken 10 seconds after inoculation, whereas at 24 and 72 hours they are in the basal state. Likewise, some transcripts related to the alinase biosynthesis have the same behavior. For the nematode expression profile, the result shows that many transcripts related to effectors are induced in the early stages as well and as infection progress, they reduce their expression, whereas others have the opposite behavior. Finally, <clears throat> many candidate genes related to the fencing garlic in the parasitins and the delinquents were found in this world. We found that the many over regulated transcripts are shown in early stage of the interaction in both organisms. For the analysis, I require to confirm the role of candidate genes during this interaction. Thank you. My name is Mama Cecilia Morales. I am PhD student at the College of Postgraduates in the state of Mexico. Playground in gel are dependent on the photosynthetic filtration of carbon and optimal location growing in thin tissues. However, in common being in reproductive states, products fruit with different signs. Several evidence indicates that part of the allowed carbon is ordered in pericolized storage suggesting that particles play important role on reserve of carbon. We wonder in the planes, the change in wireability will modify the distribution of photosimulate in fruits. In this study, we explored the carbon distribution of planes of common being genotype OT during pollen filling stayed under three levels of water averaging. Using 14 carbon, pole chains, the carbon distribution, were measured collecting plane at one, three, and seven days. However, the fruit were divided in three sizes. Here we can see the total carbon distribution. The accumulation of the carbon-14 label in the pericarps changed during time, almost absent in the pericarps of the small and large fruits. In many of the pericarps, discrete while in the seed increased with the edge of the fruit. These results show that particles play the important and dynamic role in the responsibility to mature restriction. In the pericarp, the fructose concentration doubles the that of the glucose in this case with the pole each. The sucrose decrease only in the little pericarps on day seven, as well as the start concentration that destroys by half in the 50% field capacity condition. The lady coincided with the highest amyolytic activity as evaluated in neighbor health. We concluded the sure restriction modified the distribution of photosimulate and obstruct their allocation to early fruit that understood just the reserve store in the pericarp and soluble sugar and starch. In this article, you can review all the complete research. Finally, we would like to acknowledge all the institutions and the people who made this research possible. Thank you.
Okay, that ends our flash talk uh, session. We're going to end with the last talk today from uh, Dr. Prasinkovich um, from the University of Calgary in Canada. Uh, you probably all know his wonderful work on all sorts of wonderful mathematical modeling and philotaxis, but the talk today is philotaxis beyond the standard theory. So we're looking forward to your talk. You can take it from here, Dr. P. Thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me well? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, let me share the screen. And, okay. okay. And <clears throat> just a check. Uh, can you uh, see also my opening slide? Yes, the slide looks great. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so thank you again for the introduction and thank you very much for uh, the invitation for me to present. Um, I will talk today about Philotaxis and it is a work which um, has been done jointly with uh, Dr. Um, Paula, Paula um, Eloma from the University of Helsinki and her group there. So what is um, the problem? And um, before getting to the problem itself, uh, let me to uh, introduce a little bit uh, the key ideas pertinent to philotaxis. So philotaxis is um, the arrangement of organs on their supporting axis. And um, often it has a particularly interesting geometric features, feature. For example, in this case, we are dealing with distichus philotaxis, where individual florets are uh, arranged in a single plane to the left and to the right. And here is, there is another example of the cassette philotaxis, where leaves are issued in pairs, and each pair is rotated by 90 degrees or is perpendicular to the previous one. And this is a yet another example, which is uh, called spiral philotaxis. And if sort of the most prominent cases of spiral philotaxis are found in, in flower heads. So you can see some spirals here. And if you look more carefully, you can see that there, there are uh, two families of spirals going clockwise and counterclockwise. And well, the spirals are called parastichies. And if we count them, if, well, in this case, it turns out that there is 21 parastichies going one way and 34 parastichies going the other way. Now, there's lots of history going to uh, this work on philotaxis. In particular, um, Leonardo da Vinci is credited for having been the first who observed the presence of spirals there. And uh, Johannes Kepler um, was uh, the first one to pay attention to the numbers. And he discovered that very often, very frequently, the numbers of these uh, spirals of, of uh, Prastikis are consecutive Fibonacci numbers. So, uh, what are Fibonacci numbers? Um, they are described by this kind of formula, which may look a little bit cryptic, but all it means is that we start from two numbers, one and two, and then keep adding the last two numbers to get the next one. So one plus two is three. Now we take two last numbers, two and three is five. Again, three plus five is eight. Five plus eight is 13. A plus 13 is 21, and so on and so on. And you can see that these numbers which we have seen in sunflower head, 21 and 34, are represented here. So this leads to the key question, how do plants create spiral philotactic patterns? And the basic model is based on the idea that existing primordia in the meristem are inhibiting if, um, the emergence of new primordia nearby if they are too close. 
So let's look how it works. This is a um, shoot apical merit stem. And in the shoot apical merit stem, we distinguish if a structure is called active ring. This is where new organs or young organs primordia may uh, emerge. Let's suppose that we have uh, well the first primordium to start with. Um, as the meristem grows, this um, primordium inhibits the uh, presence of uh, other primordia nearby until to the growth, it is too far from those uh, created uh, before. This enables another primordium to be formed. And the process in this way uh, continues. So now another pri uh, primordium is going to be formed either here or there. This is called breaking of symmetry. And it is easiest to see how things work in a simulation. So first primordium has been uh, created and the strength of inhibition is the color. So if the whiter it gets, the less inhibition it is and the new primordium can uh, appear when a threshold has been reached. And you can see that new primordia are emerging in a uh, spiral pattern. So um, this is kind of the basic mechanism which has been um, figured out uh, relatively a uh, long time ago. This uh, particular simulation was done by my then postdoc, Johannes Batius, in, in 1996. And if this model over time has been um, if, uh, perfected um, quite a lot, in particular, it has been uh, the mechanism of uh, inhibition has been explained in terms of uh, plant hormone uh, auxin. So it turns out that the inhibition is not some factors which is positively inhibiting, but this lack of auxin which is absorbed by existing primordia. And then if, if it is not enough of it, the new primordium cannot be formed. Without going into these details, uh, which have been described among others by in a paper by uh, Richard Smith and others in PNS 2006. You can see here the uh, microphotograph of shoot uh, uh, apical meristem of Arabidopsis. And here is the result of simulation, which will um, at least visually shows that it is possible to get close to uh, modeling for taxis via this inhibitory mechanism if at the level of meristems. And you can go further if by uh, looking at the um, mature structures. And again, here is photograph. And on the right, you can see if the model of, uh, of um, Philotaxis arabidopsis now if in more mature plants. It turns out that this mechanism can be uh, further simplified and uh, expressed in geometric terms. And the simplification belongs to uh, Hofmeister, Wilhelm Hofmeister, who uh, um, observed or who postulated that new organs emerge as a circumference of the growing apex, so in, in this active ring, where there's enough space for them. And then later, uh, Snow and Snow added that this if new, merista, new, new primordia appear as soon as there is enough uh, space for them. So um, basically, this is how this mechanism works. New uh, primordia are uh, created as the tip, and then as the apex grows, a philotactic pattern is created. So it would seem that everything is now clear. However, uh, well, as it is often the case, nature is much more complex than this. This is the uh, scanning electron uh, microphotograph micro photograph of a young Gerbera head. And you can see a philotactic pattern, but the point is that this pattern is emerging from the outside in. And this is well, a common phenomenon in uh, all flower heads. And it is very fascinating how this pattern can be formed from the outside in 
in violation of the mechanism which we discussed so far, what is supposed to be happening uh, near the tip of the meristem. And in particular, this inhibitory mechanism, which I mentioned before, cannot work as well if in the large head because, well, there is this empty space in between which sort of prevents communication between primordia across uh, the circumference. So this is a key question, which, um, well, Paula Eloma and, and I and our groups uh, set up to solve. If, however, this question uh, has some um, history as well, and in particular, in the 1990s, the late professor Paul uh, Green uh, from, from the Stanford University was very fascinated by the same problem. And he proposed a biomechanical theory according to which this um, emergence of primordia takes place on the, if, well, is active ring due to buckling. That is to the fact that if sort of due to uh, disproportions of growth rates, ondulations uh, mechanically occur, and then they propagate inwards. And uh, Paul Green created a model which explains this, and the model works, except that it explains the emergence of worlds and not philotactic patterns, in, uh, especially with Fibonacci numbers. So this problem remained unsolved. And if with, with the Helsinki group, we looked at this uh, in more detail using a Gerbera hybrida as a plant model to, uh, to consider. And there were several reasons for choosing this plant, but one important uh, reason is that, as you can see, flower heads are supported by very long naked stalks, which suggests their, their phyllotactic pattern is emerging de novo and not, is not inherited from the leaf, uh, leaves underneath. And this uh, phyllotactic pattern has nice spirals, and actually, uh, well, it turns out that the numbers of primordia can uh, come close to 1,000. So it is a very elaborate pattern. So in order to uh, see what happens, we looked uh, carefully into the development of heads. And here you can see the development of sequence. So those are uh, micro CTs of uh, heads in different developmental stages. And those are the kind of, well, um, virtual cross sections. So you can see the progression of shapes. And if uh, sort of coloring shows the part which is uh, covered by, uh, by primordia. So um, this process can be divided into uh, three phases. The first, in the first phase, well, um, well first is the if, uh, meristem or the young uh, flower head is naked. There are no uh, primordia there. And then first primordia appear on the rim. In the next stage, new primordia are being inserted between previous ones as the head grows. And we can see that there are some, uh, that the newest primordia are a little bit offset towards the center of the head compared to the older ones. So there is a, almost kind of like, well, the pattern is no longer one dimensional as it was on the rim. It has two dimensional aspects. And then if, if they gradually in phase three, the head is filled. This is when parastitis can be observed and their number decreases according to the reverse Fibonacci sequence. And eventually this active zone if basically disappears or convergence in the center, and then is there near the center, the pattern becomes chaotic. So the most intriguing part was uh, this emergence of primordia on the active ring, on the rim of the, uh, of the young head. To understand it better, if, well, Teng Zhang from uh, Paula's group if has um, taken a number of if, um, confocal microphotographs if, in which a presence of oxen was uh, reported using the 
DR5 um, reporter. So you can see here these heads, and it turned out that several things were interesting. First, that if among these random numbers, if majority of heads if, um, showed Fibonacci number of primordia. This indicated that primordia are inserted in bursts. And also, uh, basically, both chiralities uh, occur, so the spirals kind of could be uh, oriented uh, well to the left or to the right. However, if we reflected them, it turned out if to, so that, that we uh, ab abstracted from these differences in chirality. It turned out that the development is highly uh, stereotypical, and also we, we could not follow the development of individual heads over an uh, extended period of time. We could see if the, we could reconstruct the progression from if actually either individual heads cherry picked or by superimposing uh, heads in the same developmental stage. So what we see here is that this is a process in which patterning is basically taking place on the rim of the head. However, if the numbers of primordia jump according to Fibonacci uh, sequence. And the question is, how is this possible? So, well, the first thing is to start was to start straight Hofmeister's, Hofmeister's hypothesis. Well, to assume that if um, new primordia are emerging on the rim whenever is enough space for them. So this is a simulation of this process. Whenever there is enough space between existing primordia along the rim, a new primordium occurs. So, yes, we have increased of number of uh, primordia on the rim, but if, if the numbers do not increase according to, to Fibonacci sequence, but just uh, increase according to power series, one, two, four, eight, uh, um, 16, and so on. As actually, this is very intuitive. So this is, uh, this is a question if, well, that something different must be happening. And in order to find what is happening, we looked at these heads in a further detail. So this is how we analyze it. So this is a head with a primordium. There's, well, basically just a single, we can say that there's a single interval, single ring kind of around the air uh, from, from this head, from this primordium to itself. Now, when you have two uh, primordia, interestingly, the pattern is asymmetric. We have a shorter gap between primordia here and longer gap there. We can symbolically write it S short, long, if we scan this head from this first primordium going in the counterclockwise direction. Now with three primordia, we have S, L, L, or L, sorry, L, L, S. And then we proceed if we're well, constructing this in the same way, getting a sequence of uh, sequences of L's and S's. So the question is whether there's pattern to this. So I, here I wrote the first eight uh, sequences. And here I sup superimpose them on sort of uh, the ring, which is kind of straight, straightened. So it is kind of, well, this is the ring, this is the ring, but it's drawn as a straight line. And we see that what happens is that if you have a long gap between primordia, then in the next developmental stage, it's going to be divided into short and long. But if you have a short gap, then at the same time, it is just going to grow and become long. So we can replace, uh, uh, describe this process using rules that long uh, gap produces short and long, and short just becomes long. And it turns out, as you can see here, that this process described by these rules always needs to uh, Fibonacci sequence that can be mathematically proven that, that it is uh, the case. And if, however, there is a caveat there. We can see that, for example, here, long uh, segment has been divided into short and long, first short and long. 
But this long segment has been divided into long and short. So the question is that sometimes short is on the left side, sometimes on the right side of uh, during the division. So the question is how this can be captured. And it turns out that it can be captured by assuming that the intervals have polarity. And kind of further analysis shows that shorter gap is always at the stage, at, at the side of the older uh, neighbor, older primordial. So now the question is how this kind of asymmetry can occur. And to analyze this, we looked into time lapse confocal microscopy of if, well heads, and we could only do this for a short period of time, but you can see it here. And looking at this part there, which is magnified here, we found out that this maximum of, of oxygen expression originally appears halfway between uh, the Bos primordia, but then propagates, tends towards the older one. So this is how asymmetry between intervals occurs. So here is going to be short interval, and here is going to be long interval. And we created a model of this process and superimposed on the images. So you can see that when primordium is introduced, it always tends towards its older neighbor. And in such a way, Fibonacci numbers of primordia occur. OK. So this is phase one. On the rim, if um, primordia appear in Fibonacci numbers. Now the question is, uh, what happens next? So we, if we um, looked into if the distribution of the um, Gerbera Clavata 3 gene, which we and others uh, assume that define if where is the we define the position of the active ring. And we can see that the expression of this uh, gene first grows with the head, but then gradually shrinks. So consequently, we introduce this mechanism to the model. First, things are happening on the rim as before, but then the active ring starts to move inwards. And you can see that now new primordia are being displaced a little bit inwards compared to uh, previous ones. Now let's focus on this pattern. And if we just connect the centers of primordia, we can see a zigzag line. And it turns out that the zigzag, zigzag line corresponds exactly to the distribution of this L and S segments if in, in, in the uh, model in the rim. And since the number of L and S segments are two consecutive Fibonacci numbers, as this zigzag uh, provides a template for the subsequent uh, formation of parastichis in the third phase. So those are the symbols S and L. And, and this zigzag pattern, which has uh, Fibonacci numbers of both this kind of intervals and this kind of intervals, serves as a template for, uh, for the formation of parastichis. So let's look at this. This is, if, again, the template. And now the active ring grows further. And according to Hofmeister rule, new primordia are formed whenever there's enough uh, room for them. And the pattern has emerged. And if we look at this, there are well, Fibonacci numbers of parastichis, as it can be observed. Moreover, as we move through the center, we can see that the numbers of parastichis decline. This is a well-known phenomenon if, well, okay, in models and, of course, in reality as well. And in the center, the pattern becomes chaotic, again, as observed in real heads. Moreover, if uh, it turns out that this uh, active ring does not, have it, does not have to be circular, and the pattern can uh, work uh, fine as well. This is interesting because as I'm going to elaborate towards the end of my talk in a few minutes, <laughs> um, the standard theory of flotaxis is very much preoccupied with the radial symmetry 
of, of everything which happened there. However, it is not essential. You can have perfectly nice patterns, even though in this case, active ring at some stages is not circular. So uh, we further tried to uh, create, a f um, this, uh, to, to show that we really understand what's going on. We try to create these patterns on the model of actual growing head. And if, to this extent, we took look again at this profile of the heads and superimpose them and extracted contours shown here as colorful lines of different colors. And then we interpolated between them. And in such a way, we got uh, a model of growing head where the red color uh, indicates the position of the active ring. So it is obtained by, uh, it is a data-driven model obtained by interpolating between uh, the measured shapes of the heads. In addition, we knew how the individual primordia develop and we combined these elements together to obtain a model of a growing head, if which is three-dimensional, not just flat, and with, with uh, primordia taking the same forms as they would be seen in an SEM. So you can compare this as a SEM of uh, actual head as a way of um, if, well, validation. There is more validation in the paper, which uh, when I referred to earlier uh, by uh, Teng Zhang and all, which was published earlier this year. However, it is not the end of the story because it turns out that some heads are not uh, round, can be actually even, well, quite elliptic. And if, so those are examples of uh, white type heads in, in Gerbera, which sometimes are like this. So it turns out that the model which, which I just described can capture this kind of uh, patterns as well, because nowhere in the model there is assumption of circularity uh, present. And here you can see where I just showed here the last stage, um, how this pattern can develop. The interesting thing is what happens when this uh, um, pattern collapses and well, we assume that in this case, there is necessary to have some uh, well, repositioning of primordia in the process of growth. Anyways, we can uh, recreate that kind of pattern. And you can see here that this parastichis kind of uh, have different form, kind of um, more um, elongated versus more curved. And again, we have Fibonacci numbers of parastichis. Um, this kind of patterns actually appear in different plants. And well, actually last summer, I have seen lots of uh, um, fleabane flowers, so this is erigeron which have this kind of patterns. So here is an example. And it interestingly has a very kind of uh, well linear pattern here. And this is the model. And this is well, <laughs> a smiling face uh, well, pattern. And here is the model. So to conclude, phyllotaxis in flower heads is no longer a mystery. If we found out that it is, um, can be explained as a superposition of three phases. The first one is patterning on the growing rim, which is basically a one-dimensional process with a lateral displacement of primordia. This lateral displacement is critical for Fibonacci numbers uh, emergence. Then uh, a zigzag pattern uh, occurs due to the gradual shrinking of the uh, active ring. And then as the, the active ring propagates further, uh, a centripetal pattern uh, occurs. If, and, and fills the head. Moreover, we observe the patterning if, does not need to be radially symmetric, and this offers a key to understanding uh, the question of patterning in faceted heads. And also, this means that uh, well, some key notion of phyllotaxis have to be updated because, well, even the terminology is so very much based uh, on the assumption of circularity, the presence of the center of the head, and so on, uh, that it is difficult even to describe uh, verbally, let alone mathematically, 
if what is uh, happening when this uh, uh, assumption of circularity is abandoned. There are also interesting questions. How does fascination emerge? Uh, what is the dynamics of the active ring propagation in uh, fasciating heads and how it is controlled? Why it is fasciated? Um, how uh, these processes are controlled at the molecular level? And um, there are also some kind of details re re related to what mathematically uh, does it mean that there must be enough uh, space for the uh, Hofmeister's uh, model to work. Hofmeister said that this, this must be enough space for a new primordium to be placed if, in the meristem, but actually how this availability is measured. So we are looking forward to, uh, to uh, address it. And I would like to thank, uh, thank well, um, uh, my collaborators and my own group in particular. So, so here is uh, Paula and myself, of course, and here is Teng Zhang, who uh, performed uh, pretty much all this experimental uh, well, obtained all this experimental data in the scope of his uh, PhD thesis, which we defended well um, not long time ago. And here are two of my students, uh, Andrew Owens and Mick Cieślak, who uh, did a lot of modeling uh, this. And, and other students are part of collaboration as well, but uh, they were not so much involved in the work which I described today. And here is more thanks to well organizations which well supported us and paid for all this fun. And this is it. Thank you very much. Thank you for that wonderful presentation, Dr. P. Uh, while people start asking uh, questions, uh, I'll start off really quickly with a question. Um, a long time ago, we approached you uh, for your. Uh, your cell and oxen-based models to ask questions about leaf asymmetry, how the source and sink relationships affected the asymmetry of leaves through oxen. And I was wondering, because for your, for your new, like very L systems based model of how this ring propagates, it's really fundamentally on that initial asymmetry of, of how it, it starts the long and short, right? And also the asymmetry plays a role there. Do you think if, like, as you go forward exploring the molecular mechanisms or applying your cell and oxen based models, that these sync source relationships might be very fundamental to setting up this pattern? Yes. So it is. It is excellent question. And if yes, I think that it is going to be uh, very, very essential, very much essential. Um, looking at uh, the distribution of pins in uh, heads is critical to, to uh, answer this question, to see what exactly happens. And if, but uh, we are working on uh, having, well, um, Gerbera heads or Gerbera plants with uh, well, a pin reporter, but it is long process. So, so, so we are still working on this, but if it is, it is well, uh, very much expected that there, if there's, that this asymmetry can be related to the if, well inherent directionality in of oxygen transport uh, via uh, via pin exporters. Incidentally, it is also interesting if we look into the fact that this uh, primordia appear in sort of asymmetric context. There is short space and long space there. Whether this may uh, have uh, some impact on the asymmetry of organs, petals, or leaves. And this would be well, kind of well, extension of the work which has been done well several uh, well, years ago by uh, I believe it was Chris Kulemeyer's group, where it was obtained ob observed that leaves are not exactly uh, symmetric, and this was related to the chirality of of the patterns. So um, yes, so this, this is very interesting, and we started looking into this, but unfortunately in Gerbera, if, well, bracts are very symmetric. It is it is difficult to to to, to um, so we, we need something which which would have more asymmetric blocks to find out whether this asymmetry can be related to this pattern of long and short intervals. Thank you, uh, Dr. Dabrowski. 
Yes. Hello, uh, Brzemislav. Uh, thank you very much. That's really amazing, amazing work you, you showed us. And uh, your proof of, uh, of that the patterning starts from, uh, from the periphery to the center is rather convincing. Still, we can think there is in center, there is some invisible signals that instruct periphery in certain way. So did you try to damage central part and see if the patterning is normal? So um, I haven't, but um, 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 Paula Eloma and Teng Zhang have, and the pattern, uh, and I, I believe that is also related to uh, the earlier experiments by I think, Palmer and Hernandez. And it turns out that if the center of the head is uh, damaged, for example, if a ring is cut in the head, then um, patterning up to the uh, to this damage is normal, but after this is not. Okay. So, mm -hmm. so this 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 indicates that uh, that the pattern really is progressing from outside in. Regarding signals, however, it is interesting uh, because well, we believe that that the signals uh, going from the center of the head, especially the presence of oxygen, which seems to be there but is not clear what it is doing may be uh, um, important for the development of vasculature in the heads. But this is just uh, well, something which we're still working on. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. That's very interesting. Thank you. Thank you again for a wonderful talk, Dr. Przenkiewicz. Um, let's move on to, the, to our last session for the day, the, uh, the flash talks from students. Thank you, Dr. P. Okay. Hi, my name is Angelique Jara, and I'm going to present my project about the Bofogras microbiome. Bofogras is the plant that you can see at the bottom, and it's a plant that has been introduced to deserts around the world and has wiped out endemic plant species. To do so, Bofogras uses a mechanism known as allelopathy, which consists, consists on the secretion of allochemical compounds that arrive to a recipient plant and affect its development. Allochemicals from the root exudates or from the aerial part of buffalo grass also seem to impair the growth of the same buffalo grass. Uh, however, we don't know the effect that these compounds have on the rhizospheric microbiome, and we also don't know which are the microorganisms that attach themselves to the roots of buffalo grass. So we used soil from the Sonoran Desert and we grew buffalo grass plants in PVC tubes and we treated them with root exudates or with leachates from the aerial part of different buffalo grass individuals. We took samples after 90 and 110 days of growth and we evaluated the microbiome composition. All our samples had a taxonomic profile dominated by actinobacteria, protobacteria, and acidobacteria, which agrees with previous reports of other desertic shrubs. Uh, we did not find strong differences among the allochemical treatments and the control. When we ran a cap analysis, we saw that time is the main factor shaping the microbiome, since all our samples from the first period are located at the bottom, and the samples from the second period are located at the upper left section of the, of the graph. And this is probably related to the development of buffalo grass, which entails changes in the exudates pattern, and therefore the bacteria that are recruited are different as the buffalo grass grows. This has also been reported for other plant species like uh, wheat or watermelon. And accordingly with this, we found four taxa enriched in the first period and four different taxa enriched in the second period. And finally, even though the yellow chemicals did not significantly influence the microbiome composition, we detected 12 taxa that are enriched in the different treatments. Uh, some of those taxa like saccharothrix are capable of metabolizing phenolic compounds, an allochemical that is produced by buffalo grass. Others, such as Caulobacter, uh, are capable of promoting growth in plants. So, so far, our conclusions are the composition of the rhizospheric microbiome of buffalo grass under different conditions, the fact that it's time and not the allochemicals, the factor that shapes the microbiome composition, and well, the microorganisms that buffalo grass recruits are capable of thriving under allochemical conditions. Thank you so much for listening. 
Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you very much to the organizers for the opportunity to present my work today. I'm Neftali. I'm a PhD student in Nick Talbot and Frank Menke Lab at the Sainsbury Laboratory in Norwich. Today, I'm going to talk to you about the fungal pathogen Magnaporte rice. Uh, this pathogen is a serious problem in every single country where rice is grown and causing losses of up to 30% of the global rice production. Here, I show you a picture of how rice plants looks like during infection. After a few days, uh, this pathogen kills the plants completely. Magnaporte rice infection starts in the surface of the rice leaf. To penetrate the leaf, Magnaporte spores germinate to form uh, this dome-shaped structure called an appressorium. In our lab, we have the new mutant of the MAP kinase, PMK1. After germination, this mutant never differentiates into an appressorium and therefore it doesn't generate infection. It is well known that PMK1 is involved in appressorium formation, but how this protein regulates these processes uh, remains unclear. Because PMK1 is a MAP kinase, we decided to study the magnaporte phosphoproteum during appressorium formation. Basically, uh, we decided to compare the phosphoproteins present in germinated spores of the wild type strain GAI11 and uh, the null mutant of PMK1. Using uh, a combination of discovery and targeted proteomics, we identified 30 proteins that could be involved in the PMK1 signaling pathway. These 30 proteins were differentially phosphorylated. One of these uh, putative targets is the sand domain containing protein BTS1. We identify that BTS1 is phosphorylated at three different residues, and by g 2 hybrid and coimono co precipitation experiments, we found that it associates to the MAP kinase PMK1. Because BTS1 hasn't been characterized in magna porterize, we generated a null mutant to study its role during infection. When we compare appressorium formation between wild type spores and BTS1 null mutants, we found that some appressoria have aberrant structures like these ones I, I, I'm showing you here. And uh, when we used BTS1 null mutant spores to infect rice, we found that around 85% of, the, of these uh, null mutant spores are less pathogenic compared to the wild type strain GAI11. So taken together, we have identified a novel component of the PMK1 signaling pathway using a phosphoproteomic approach. At the moment, we are defining the role of BTS1 in this cascade. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. I'm Joel Colchado, master's student at the Botanical Garden of the UNAM. I'm presenting preliminary results of a meta-analysis, studying the variation of rhizosphere prokaryotic communities in halophytes and xerophytes from arid environments. Rhizosphere is the soil region influenced by the secretion profile of root metabolic activity. This fibrous controls the establishment of micro-plant interactions, which are important for resource acquisition, thus affecting plant survival under stressful conditions. Due to this impact on plant survival, root microbiomes of arid plants have been recently studied, yet no work so far describes their assemblage of variations at a microgeographical scale. In this ongoing work, I described these patterns using previously published data from four countries, representing 10 host species from four families with diverse ecological strategies and life history traits. A question to answer is, how is variation across microbiomes related to plant host traits and its environment in arid communities? For this, I extracted the sequences from SRA and elaborated a pipeline in CHIME2 using SILVA database for taxonomic annotation and R for data visualization. Here I present some preliminary results. Microbial communities are taxonomically diverse at the class level. Here the 21 main classes are represented. Many of these were previously reported on the source work as globally abundant, such as Protobacteria or Bacilli, while others are site-specific, like the Pakistan-associated Archaean class, <coughs> Halobacteria, or the interesting POC 43F haline bacteria before unknown to inhabit rhizospheres. Based on the calculation of three alpha diversity indexes, ACE for species richness, 
phase phylogenetic diversity and Shannon Evans, we observe host specific differences, panel A, and country based patterns, panel B. But according to Crystal Wallis test, these differences don't seem to be related to the host ecological nor life history strategy, as shown in these box plots. Finally, beta diversity was calculated using Jacquard index and plotted with NMDS. The axis 1 seems to be related to pH, while the axis 2 correlates with temperature and precipitation. This pattern separates xerophytic from halophytic communities as well as distinct halophytic communities. Overall, these results show that the abiotic environment and host identity are the main key drivers for prokaryotic communities' composition. <coughs> it remains to be tested if there is a correlation between phylogenetic distances of hosts and their communities. That's all for now. Thanks for watching, and I will be extremely thankful for any feedback to improve this work. Good evening. Today I will present the talk titled Chemical and Physiological Perturbation as a Dissecting Tool of Arabidopsis Circadian Clock. The plant circadian clock, which is comprised of transcriptional and translational feedback loops, receives environmental stimuli as light and temperature, and as an output, the clock controls the plant physiology to a plethora of mechanisms. A circadian rhythm persists under constant conditions, either this light or continuous darkness. In this study, we use promoter luciferase reporters to evaluate gene expression under these conditions. Using a chemical biology approach, we found that hormones, vitamins, antibiotics, and other chemicals that induce oxidative stress affect clock period either in darkness, red light, or blue light conditions. From this screen, we focused on salicylic acid and we found that the expression of 5B was affected and that the period of it was reduced. Furthermore, the effect of salicylic acid on period shortening was restricted to the first hours of the morning. We also found that the effect of salicylic acid on period length was inhibited on the presence of sucrose with a concentration of 3%. Therefore, we assessed the effect of sucrose on period length. We found that the effect of period was dependent on the genotype. As we can see here in the Waldat background Basilesca, the period is reduced upon the addition of sucrose. However, in the mutant Gigantea, the period is increased. As an example, TOC1, a short period mutant, has a short period upon addition of sucrose, but not without sucrose. And in a media without sucrose, if a salicylic acid reduces its period on the red light conditions, but not blue light conditions. We can conclude that the compounds that alter the redox status affect the circadian clock periodicity in different ways. Also, salicylic acid reduces the period length in the presence of sucrose in the media. As a perspective, we hypothesize that salicylic acid may act as a sign number to the circadian clock through the action of phytochrome B. My name is Adolfo Aguilar Cruz. I am a PhD student, and I'm studying the function of the Dyser Light 1 gene in the liberal Marcanti polymorpha. Marcanti polymorpha can reproduce asexually by the formation of gemmae. Gemmae are vegetative propagules that can form a complete thallus, and gemmae are formed inside the gemma cups. The gemma development initiates when a cell from the floor of the gemma cup elongates and differentiates into a gemma initial cell. The gemma initial cell undergoes two asymmetrical divisions. The first one gives rise to the basal cell and the start cell, and the second one gives rise to the gemma primordial cell. The gemma primordial cell continues dividing to form a complete gemma, while the basal cell and the start cell do not divide anymore. And this is how a wild type gemma looks like. It's a flat disc with two apical notches, but this developmental process doesn't happen like this in the Dyser Ligon mutant. We use the CRISPR-Cas9 system to target the dyser light one gene in Marcantia polymorpha, and mutant plants produce gemmae that show differentiation of gemmae directly from the dorsal and ventral cells of the gemma surface. And this phenotype 
resembles the floor of the Gemma Cup because we can see different stages of Gemma development on the surface of the mutant Gemma. And here we can see the development of ectopic Gemma directly from the surface of the mutant Gemma. In land plants, Dicer light one controls micronase biogenesis. And in the Dicer light one mutant of Marcanti polymorpha, the biogenesis of microRNAs is abolished. We also perform RNA seq and we found a regulation of targets and precursors of microRNAs. We also found a regulation of genes involved in auxin biosynthesis and signaling and an overrepresentation of auxin responsive genes. We use a reported line that marks the site for auxin biosynthesis in Marcantia polymorpha. And when we express this marker in the Dicer Ligua mutant, we found new sites for auxin biosynthesis. And these new sites are the ectopic gemma. We also perform auxin immunolocalization. In white type gemma, the auxin maxima territories are the rhizos precursor cell and the apicarnoches. And in the Dicer Ligua mutant, new sites for auxin maxima territories are formed. And these new sites are the ectopic gemma. And what we propose is that the epidermis of the gemma in the Dicer Ligua mutant acquires the cell identity of the floor of the gemma cube. And in conclusion, Dicer Ligua 1 is a major contributor for the biogenesis of microRNAs in Marcantia polymorpha. And Dicer Ligua 1 regulates cell fate specification through a mechanism driven or influenced by auxin during gemma formation. Well, this is it, and thanks for watching. My name is Aran Sangulo, and the title of my work is Expression Analysis of Sugar Transporter Genes Induced by Mycorrhiza Colonization in Tomato. Arbuscular mycorrhiza is an important symbiotic association between plant roots and arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi. In this symbiosis, the plants provide the fungus with the carbon compounds, while the mycorrhizal fungus helps the plants to improve its nutritional status. Nevertheless, there is not much information about the sugar transporters involved in the carbohydrate movement from the leaves to the roots colonized by these fungus. So, we study the expression of some sugar transporter genes such as STP1, 2, 16, and SFP7, described as inducing leaves of mycorrhiza colonized tomato plants. In the genes encoding for sucrose transporter SUT1, 2, and 4 were also analyzed. The relative expression of all these transporters were determined in leaves at three different developmental stages in mycorrhiza colonized and no colonized tomato plants. Regarding monosaccharides transporters, STP2 showed induction of expression in leaves of no colonized plants compared to colonicides. Whereas for sucrose transporter, only SUT1 showed differential expression. This was observed in major leaves with fin ducts that since the monosaccharides in the apoplast, the sugar may be then used to form sucrose in the apoplast to be translocated to the root with the possible participation of SUT1. On the other hand, the sucrose transporter gene SUT4, which encodes for a protein that has been located in vacuolar membranes, was repressed in young foliar tissues of mycorrhizal plants. So we propose that since SUT4 expression is lower in young leaves of, colis, of colonicide plants, the sucrose is transported from the cytoplasm toward the vacuole of the leaf cells, so more sucrose could be directed to colonicide roots. The glucose content was also determined. Although no significant difference were observed in foliar tissues between colonicide and no colonicide plants, a significantly lower content of the sugar was found in colonicide roots. This supports the idea that glucose is a preferential transporter sugar from the plant to the mycorrhizal fungus. Hello everyone, my name is Seng Ling Li. I'm a PhD student working in Professor and he executed bonus lab at the University of Freiburg in Germany. The title of my presentation is the neural photochrome interacting protein F8 is a repress of light induced cis-germination in aerobidopsis. From a yeast trapezoidal library, we identified the F8 as a new interactor of photochrome A. Later, we verified the interaction between F8 and photochrome B. 
EF58 belongs to the AP2 EF transcription factor family, which has uh, several homologous, including EF15 and 5. With the combination of a physiological genetic and molecular assay analysis, we proved that EF58 is a negative compound in 5A and 5B mediated cis germination. In the cis germination experiment, we observed that EF15 and 58 double mutant showed a higher germination rate than the wild type Columbia in fetochrome off condition. Well, the opposite was true for EF58 O impression lines which exhibited a lower germination rate than the biotype Columbia in phytochrome active stage. P1 and SAM are two important proteins involved in 5A and 5B mediated determination. We found the expression levels of P1 and SAM are upregulated by ER58. Both in vivo and vitro assay in evidence that ER58 associated with the promoter of P1 and SAM and enhances the expression. Furthermore, we found that the binding capacity of ER58 to P1 and some promoters were disturbed by light activated phytochromes. So we observed that more activated phytochromes less ER58 binding to P1 promoter and some promoter. The phytohormonal ABA is an important inhibitor of cis-determination. The inhibitory effect of ABA on the germination is reduced in ER5558 double mutants, while it is increased in ER58 O impression lines compared to the wild type. At the molecular level, we found that ER58 inhibits cis germination by directly regulating ABA anabolic genes, increasing ABA level. In parallel, as reinforcing feedback mechanisms, ABA upregulated ER58 transcription level and protein stability. Moreover, ER58 represses cis germination partially dependent on ABI5 and uh, promotes JA catabolic genes involved in JA regulated cis germination process. With that, I want to thank you very much for your attention. Good morning. My name is Karina Cortez Fonseca and I'm going to present the work entitled Antifungic Activity of Mexican Mesonto, Leaf and Flower Extracts, Again to Sarium. As the careers, we have Carlos Luna Veronica Moreno, Gustavo Hernandez, and Luis Choca as corresponding author. Mesoto is a parasitic species that frequently grows at expenses of trees, causing serious forest damage in Mexico, as well as being considered the second agent of forest destruction. The advantage of mesotol is that it absorbs a large amount of nutrients of the host, which makes it a candidate to evaluate its antifungal capacity in vitro, whether it extracts against a phytoproxonic fungus of our interest, which is Ustarium. It has antioxidant, antihypertensive, and antimicrobial properties. Fusarium, it has a cosmopolitan distribution and is endemic in corn production areas throughout the world, causing great losses of crops that are of nutritional importance for humans and animals. In our methodology, we use a mesotol that was obtained from the product and natural area of the host Baloduce, while the fungus was insulated from the wing growing area of the region. The samples were separated into leaves and flowers and the produce Processed to dehydrate the, the them for subject green. All samples were subject to soil liquor extraction using methanol acetone water. After this, the antifungal evolution was made of three different concentrations, which were mixed with PDA medium and inoculate with the phytopoxonic fungus Pusarium. Each treatment was done in tropicate, and all treatments and controls were incubated at 28 centigrade in the dark until the control percent 100% mesial growth. The percent of mesial growth and the finer sporulation were calculated, as well as preliminary tests to determine the determination with the extracts. As results, we obtained that for both mesotols extracts, the highest innovation was present in treatments one and two with the highest inhibition for the leaf extract being 91%, while the flower extract was 96%.
Regarding a finance version, it was obtained that treatments one and two of flower and treatment two of leaf present a reduction of two labyrinths, while treatment one of leaf was the one that had the greatest reduction, presenting three, three labyrinths less, which means which present 99 0.7% reduction in expulsion. In addition, preliminary tests have been conducted where the stress has been found to inhibit carmination. However, such tests are still being deployed. It was found that both a flower extract and the leaf extract present antifocus activity to inhibit the deployment in vitro in prosadium. There was a great innovation of mesial growth using the flower extract, while the great reduction of spores was using the leaf extract. More research should be done to determine the possible mechanisms of action to innovate the different phytopoconics using the different mesial extracts. Thank you. Good day to the audience. My name is Fernanda Rosiles. The project I'm working on is protein characterization of MBF1 family in Solanum lycopersicum. It is supported by Instituto Potosino de Investigación Científica y Tecnológica and Laboratorio Nacional de Genómica para la Biodiversidad. First, tomato, or Solanum lycopersicum, represents one of the most economically important crops worldwide due to the higher content of important metabolites. Nevertheless, the tomato is also considered a model plant for the study of response to stress, especially those linked to transcriptional activation. What we know of tomato MBF1 family is that multiprotein breaching factor 1, or MBF1, is a family of proteins described as transcription cofactors. It is characterized for breaching transcription factors and the basal transcription machinery. Until now, Five members of this family have been identified in tomato, A, B, C, D, and E. The MBF1 family is ubiquitously expressed in tomato plants. They are directly related to stress response in plants, but its function is not well characterized yet. Specific detection is key for protein characterization. For this, we did gene cloning on PCR8 vector and protein projection using PTAS17 vector. And then we did protein affinity purification. And to gain more information about the MBF1 family, we produced and purified specific antibodies against these proteins. Finally, we did Western blood analysis for the antibody validation. For demonstrate that the specific antibody detects our protein with its Western blood analysis. Here, we can prove MBF1E purified antibodies have the ability to bind both non denaturing and denaturing structure of the protein on the expected weight. And then, the work to do. Once we validate the antibody, this will serve for carry out immunolocalization experiments in different tissues. And also, co-immunoprecipitation experiments that will help finding other protein partners for the MBF1 proteins. Finally, all the recovered information will help us to complete the characterization of these proteins in tomato. Thanks to all. Hi everyone, my name is Andrea Romero Reyes and I will be talking to you about how the increased cellulose synthesis in wheat plants can benefit photosynthesis and growth under drought stress. Trialose is a non reducing sugar and its accumulation provides desiccation tolerance in organisms like Selaginella lepidophila, which is a resurrection plant, as well as in Saccharomyces cerevisiae. Trialose is synthesized via the TPS TPP pathway by two enzymes, which are trialose phosphate synthase and trialose phosphate phosphatase. Many studies have shown that overexpressing these enzymes can enhance tolerance to drought and other radiotic stresses in crops like rice, tobacco, and tomato. So we worked with transgenic wheat plants overexpressing a bifunctional TPS TPP enzyme. We subjected these plants to a drought stress by, for five days, and we analyzed the photosynthetic performance of the plants, and then we rewarded the plants to analyze their biomass production. The drought treatment caused a reduction in the leaf relative water content, both in the wild type plants as well as in the transgenic lines. 
when we analyzed the photosynthetic parameters, we found that the transgenics were less affected by the drought stress compared to the white type, and they had a higher CO2 assimilation as well as a better efficiency of photosystem 2 under the drought stress. Here you can see a photo of the plant five days after we rewired them. You can notice how the transgenic lines had a greater biomass compared to the wild type plant. And this was maintained until the final harvest stage, when even if we saw a reduction in the aerial biomass caused by drought in the transgenics, they were less affected by the drought stress compared to the white type plant. So this result suggests that tree synthesis can support a better photosynthetic performance and protect plant growth during and after drought stress. And here I leave you my contact information in case that you have any question or comments. And thank you so much for your attention. Hi, today I'm talking about the project OPS DHD2, an acidic dehydrin ASK3 isolated from Opuntia streptacantha. The genus Opuntia represents an important economic source. The common name of cactus pear is used as forage, fruits, and green food, and it's adaptable to grow under arid and semi-arid environments. On the other hand, the hydrins belongs to group two of LIA protein family and highly hydrophilic and intrinsically structured proteins. Its expression induction was observed under drought, low temperatures, salinity, and ABA. The aim of this work is the characterization of the dehydrin to gene of Opuntia streptacantha. Previously, in our research group, the dehydrin 1 gene was isolated and characterized. The dehydrin 1 gene showed an induction in response to abiotic stress and the, its overexpression in Arabidopsis improved the tolerance to cold stress. Then the sequence of the dehydrin 2 gene from Opuntia streptacanta was obtained and it was compared with amino acid sequence of the dehydrin 1 and the 10 dehydrin of Arabidopsis and grouped with the ASK3 class. A clustal alignment confirmed the presence of the characteristic motifs in the dehydrin 2, the SK segment, and the nuclear localization signal. Uh, we carry out a expression analysis in three month old plants at five and 10 days of stress in cladote and in roots. We apply it treatments of saline stress, drought, heat, and cold. And we observed an increase of expression of dehydrin 2 in cladose treated with salt at five and 10 days. Similarly, in the drought and cold uh, conditions. Finally, the transiently transformed Nicotiana ventaniana leaves we are, were analyzed under confocal microscope. As observed, the fluorescent signal is located in the cytosol and the nuclei. We performed the overexpression in Arabidopsis and the beef set aside for the, for the dehydrin too. Thank you for the invitation and for uh, your time. Hi everyone, I'm Adrian Pulido from Dr. Dinkovo's lab at UNAM. Um, today I'm going to talk about how plants regulate gene expression under extreme temperatures, specifically the eukaryotic initiation factors, EIF, 4E, family-mediated responses. Um, translation initiation in plants take place in two main processes, formation of ternary complex and uh, mRNA activation. 4E family proteins are important because they interact with 5 prime end of mature mRNAs, recruiting the messenger RNAs and allowing 
the translation pre-initiation complex assemble to start the protein synthesis. Um, Arabidopsis talena has three main isoforms of 4E family proteins. The canonical isoforms 4E and iso4E and no canonical isoforms uh, isoform 4EHP. Um, by measuring the phenotypic damage, we found that the absence of either canonical isoforms 4E or iso4E results in susceptibility phenotype of five weeks old Arabidopsis taliana plants under freezing stress and altered selective stress related mRNA translation. 4EHP null mutant was affected in freezing tolerance too. And this happened even in acclimation response to low temperatures. As we can see when we previously treat the plants with acclimation period followed by cold stress. For this reason, we decided to explore transcription modification in 4EHP new mutant, which has altered transcriptional induction of important cold responsive genes as CORE15 or TCF. Finally, under high temperatures, the absence of 4E or ISO4E did not affect early seedling development. But surprisingly, the 4EHP null mutants seems to exhibit an improved response to heat stress when we compare them with white type responses. Uh, 4EHP null mutant also present altered accumulation of heat stress marker genes as these two chaperones. 4EHP orthos have been reported as no canonical since they are not directly involved in translation but rather participate in other aspects of RNA metabolism. Our current aim is to understand how regulatory networks mediated by no canonical 4EHP isoforms work under stress to achieve a tolerance response to extreme temperatures in Arabidopsis. Um, thank you for your attention. Hello, I'm Edgar Pascual. I come from the Biotechnology Institute in the Yunnan in Mexico. I want to talk to you about the role of lorelei protein in the nodulation process in the common bean. Lorelei and lorelei light proteins have an anticatalytic function, however, they have in the amino terminal a signal peptide that mobilizes them to the endoplasmic reticulum and in the carboxyl have an, have an hydrophilic amino acid tail that is replaced for a glycophosphatidylocytol anchor. In the reticulum, interact with the receptor like kinase and together draw the secretory pathway migrate to the outside of the plasma membrane and form part of the lipid drafts. Some phenotypes associated with LLG mutants impair cellular interaction process. For example, lorelei mutant ovules are unable to recognize pollen tubes that reach them, having low fertility rate. On the other hand, in the phytopathogenic interaction, LLG participate in the recognition of glomus through its interaction with the flanhelion receptor. LLG is also known to have rod head growth defect and low growth production. So, if lower layer regulate cell interaction process, could it participate in the mutualistic interactions? In beans, there are two genes that code for LLG proteins. One of them is expressed in the floral tissues and the other in vegetative tissues, particularly in the apex and in the root hairs. This expression that correlated with the tissues where the promoter activity is present. Then we want to know what happened with LLG gene under, under nodulation condition. We observed that the nucleator would present higher levels of transcripts of LLG, same to the mother nodules. Once again, this correlated with the promoter activity in the same tissues and in the infected root hairs. To explore the role of lorelei in the nodulation process, we generate genetic construction to silence and overexpress lorelei. RNA roots have a root head growth effect and also develop smaller nodules when the root overexpressing LRG for nodules even in the late stage of development. To test if the nodule development defects are related 
to the colonization process, we inoculate silence and overexpress root with a resolving propensity strain that express both reporter. We observe that the, in the silent nodules are colonized in a non-uniform way. In contrast, nodule overexpress have a normal development. In conclusion, allergy play an important role in the development of nodules. A uh, question to solve is determine if LLG interact with receptors that regulate the same body process and call LLG regulate other mutualistic interactions such as microvisualization and the result. Thank you. The title of my project is Volatile Organic Compounds Produced by Maize Plants on the Drop. Today, our agricultural model depends strongly on weather conditions, so climate change represents a serious problem to achieve high yield productions. One of the, of the most important abiotic stress for the maize plants is drought, which causes decrease in water potential to grow chlorophyll as well as in the availability and transport of nutrients. Furthermore, drought induce the accumulation for free radicals ethyl and ethylene biosynthesis. The box uh, are organic compounds that a normal temperature and pressure have a high vapor pressure. Their compo these compounds play an important role in communication, stress protection, growth, and development in plants. In this work, we focus on know and knowing the change in the box profiles emitted by maize plants without and under stress due to water deficit. Three stage of drought stress of seven, nine, and 11 days were induced in maize plants. The detection and identification of the box was carried out using the solid phase microextraction coupled to the gas chromatography mass spectrometry technique we were able to identif identify 16 compounds from the sesquiterpen, aromatic, alkane, ester, al alcohol, and fatty acid families. From the compounds identified, three of them show statistically significant differences in the percentage of normalized quantify, quantity. For example, emissions of the acetic acid to ethyl exyl ester and 2 ethyl 1 hexanol increase to a more severe stress will hexadecane emission decreased. We observe that maize plants under drought stress have changed in the box emission profile. This change can be seen in specific compounds or the majority of compounds of the same family. For example, the alkanes family stop their emissions in plants under 11 days of stress. Will the aromatic family increase its emission in plants under 9 and 11 days of stress? Thank you. Hello, my name is Amir Ortiz. I'm a graduate student at Tecnológico Nacional de México in Celaya, and I'm going to talk about the project title Analysis of Amaranthus Hypochondriacus Seed Development DNA Modulation Patterns by Whole Genome Specific Sequencing. There is a great interest in amaranth due to its nutritional benefits, agricultural advantages, and the potential it possesses to produce a wide variety of food products. Molecular information regarding amaranth endogenesis is very limited. And genomic data suggests that one of the molecular mechanisms that could be modulating this process is DNA methylation. The differences in the oval and seed methylation profiles during amaranth endogenesis could give indication of the molecular dynamics involved in this process. DNA methylation is produced by adding a methyl group at the cytosine's carbon 5 mediated by a DNA methyl transferase enzyme. In plants, DNA methylation can occur in the CG, CHG, and CHH context. Detection of methylation is essential to determine the effects of these regulatory mechanisms, and whole genome bisulfit sequencing is a technique used for the analysis of genome-wide DNA methylation patterns at a single base resolution. The experimental model was amaranth plants grown under greenhouse conditions. The experimental groups were divided into two stages. Germinal tissue, early and late embryo, were collected from a total of 18 plants. Then, 
The MRI implants were cultivated and recollected. The DNA structure and whole genomes of bit sequencing was performed. Subsequently, the alignment to the reference genome and analysis of the methylation levels were carried out. And finally, the level of methylation around all transcription start sites was analyzed. Regarding the results obtained, global DNA methylation levels for each tissue were very similar, but the differences in them could be found in the genomic regions where the methylation took place in addition to the context where it could have happened. For context, results showed that in all three stages, cytosines in the CG and CG context were methylated, in contrast to CHH context where a smaller fraction of cytosines were methylated. Further, statistical analysis confirmed that DNA methylation levels per context were independent of the type of tissue, as chi-square value was not significant, P was greater than 0.05. Around the transcription start sites in the CG context, a decrease in the methylation levels as the sample developed was observed. In CHH context, the oval had the lowest methylation levels, while in the early and late embryo, a progressive gain in methylation during the successive stages of seed development was observed. In conclusion, the decrease in methylation levels near the transcription start sites in the CG context could indicate the transcription of some genes important for seed development in the region. Also, the increased level of methylation in the CHH context suggests that there could be a differential regulation of methylation during the transition of the seed development stages. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Eduardo Luján. I'm from the Incovas lab, and I'm going to show you some results about microRNA-528 and its regulation in a maize Mexican variety called Tuxpeño. MIR-528 is a monocot-specific microRNA, and we characterize the accumulation profile of this microRNA in two particular models. During germination, we found that MIR-528 decreases its accumulation as seedling establishment occurs. By the other hand, during maize somatic embryogenesis, we found that this particular microRNA is highly accumulated during the proliferative stage of embryogenic alley. After this, we experimentally validate targets that only have been predicted by computational methods. With this, we obtained the accumulation levels of these targets. Many of them exhibit a clear inverse correlation with MIRNA levels in total RNA in both the germination process as well as during embryogenic callus induction, which might suggest that MIRNA-mediated cleavage is exerted over these targets. In addition, when performing sucrose gradient separation, we found that microRNA-528 is highly accumulated in heavy polysomal fractions. Here, we found that PLC1, a target that did not show an inverse correspondence in total RNA displayed a negative correspondence with the distribution of MIR-528, suggesting that this microRNA is also capable of regulating some targets by translation or repression. So after all of this, we decide to explore the upstream regulators of microRNA-528 using our germination model. So here we found that one of the precursors is present during the first 12 hours of imbibition. Moreover, we found that treatments with nitrate or exogenous auxins increased the accumulation of both pre- and mature form of MIR-528. In addition, we were able to corroborate that such increases resulted from pol 2 dependent transcriptional event as exposure to alpha manitin reverted the positive effect of both treatments on the MIRNA gene transcription. And finally, we found that the promoter region of MIR-528 harbors binding sites for transcription factors involved in the nitrate response and the auxin signaling pathway. So, this is our tentative model, which links the presence of both high nitrate concentrations and the auxin 2,4-D that increase MIR-528 transcriptions, which results in the regulation of several mRNA targets. Hi, everybody. I am the Dr. Ernesto Vázquez Chimalgua from Universidad Michoacana de San Nicolás de Hidalgo. I'm going to present you the work titled The Volatile Organic Compound Dimethylhexadecilamine represses Arabidopsis italiana primario root growth. 
through alteration of cellular differentiation and the regulation of cell size in meristematic cells. Dimethylhexadecilamine is a volatile immigrant by some rhizobacteria. In, in Arabidopsis thaliana, 16 micromolar concentration reduces root growth with respect to control condition. This inhibition is correlated with a suppression of expression of meristematic genes like short root and pretora 1. The meristematic gene Scraycrow is expressed specifically in endodermis tissue. The methylhexadecilamine down regulates its expression and duplicates endodermal cell layers, as is indicated by the arrowheads in the inset. Indeed, in this black and white uh, contrast image, is visible that the methylhexadecilamine modifies cell differentiation and the regulates cell site control in all tissue layers of the entire root meristem. These effects are correlated with an increment of root meristem white. Then we prompted to investigate auxin because auxin acts as a morphogen. DR5GFP synthetic marker showed an expansion of its expression domain indicating an auxin accumulation in root tip after the methylhexadecilamine treatment. This overlaps with the expansion of what's 5 GFP expression domain, suggesting that the methylhexadecilamine produce an agglomeration of auxin in root tip, and this is the grounds for alteration of cellular size and differentiation. Thank you. Hi, good morning. My name is Bricia Ruiz Aguilar, and I'm going to present you our work entitled Arabidopsis Transcriptional Response Due to Exposure to Cold and Freezing Stress. The plants are exposed to two main types of stresses, the biotic and the abiotic. And within the layer, we found the one generated by low temperatures, which in turn are divided is divided in cold and freezing stress. The plants where are exposed to this, there is a transcriptional regulation of low temperature response genes, which leads to stress tolerance. This might involve the synthesis of response molecules, such as compatible solutes, if proteins with cryoprotective effect, and the toxification. But we wanted to know what more is happening inside the plant. To achieve that, we conducted an rna seq study in plants exposed to stress by low temperatures. We used Arabidopsis thaliana as a model plant and seedlings of 14 days were exposed to for 24 hours to zero, four and 10 degrees and we are working now on the data analysis. We focus on the biological process with more enrichment in the tree temperatures. We found in the induction processes like RNA secondary structure unwinding, RNA processing, and cola acclimatization. In these processes, we found proteins like helicases, elongation factors, RNA binding proteins, dehydrins, and gate transcriptional factors in the response to cold and freezing stress in Arabidopsis. In the, on the other hand, in the repression, we found biological process related with photosynthesis and chlorophyll biosynthesis. We are we are also working on the characterization of genes of interest selected from this data and in the identification and in silico analysis of the genes, analysis of expression, and in the characterization of mutant and overexpressing line. And that's all. Thank you so much. 
Hello, my name is Mariana Sotelo. I'm here to present the work that we are doing in the Faculta de Agronomía, Universidad de la República, Uruguay, about root road adaptation underwater deficit. In our group, we are interested in genes that are associated with abiotic stress. And here I will briefly introduce the work that we are doing with the TTL mutant. TTL1 mutant was first isolated in Arabidopsis by Abel Rosado in 2006 in a screening population of sodium chloride. Uh, it was isolated with the, uh, for the phenotype of root row re uh, reduced length. TTL1 belongs to a small family of proteins uh, with four, four members that are characterized for having six tetratricopeptide repeats uh, that are located in conserved position among the members of the family. Also, in the C-terminal, they have a thioredoxin-like motif that is not functional because of the absence of a cysteine that is required for the reductase activity. During osmotic stress, also TTL1 presents a reduction in a root growth rate and a swelling phenotype in the epidermal cells of the elongation zones of the root. This phenotype was the starting point of our research um, because we wanted to know if these changes in the anisotropy of these cells were related to changes in the physical properties of the cell wall and moreover we wanted to know if these changes in the anisotropy of the cell were related with the reduction in the primary root growth rate. For this we evaluated the physical properties of the cell wall in epidermal cells of the elongation zones in the mutant during osmotic stress. Moreover we characterized the primary root growth to the, during osmotic stress. Uh, characterizing parameters like cell production rate, length of the cell cycle, cell, cell elongation in the proximal meristem, and time to enter the transition and elongation zone. At the end of the work, we were able to relate uh, TTL1 with two of the hormones uh, that uh, control the, uh, the balance of growth in the, in the meristem of the root of Arabidopsis. And also we relate TTL1 with the, the cell anisotropic expansion that is needed to control cell division and root growth recovery during osmotic stress. Uh, I would like to invite you to read our work uh, uh, that was recently published in Shins. Thank you for listening. Hi, my name is Eric, and today I'm going to talk about how to measure the shape of barley using topology, a project here at Michigan State University that mixes math, image processing, and a lot of barley. Barley is extremely adaptable. You have varieties that grow in Iraq, in Norway, Morocco, Tibet, and Scotland. And just looking at the shape of the seeds, you can tell that there's, there must be an interesting relationship between morphology and climate adaptation. In particular, we are interested in studying the morphological properties of 20 different accessions corresponding to 28 very different climates across the Eurasian continent. So with our collaborators in UC Riverside, we got shipped large boxes of barley all the way from California here to Michigan State, where we have a, a five-ton lead box that allowed us with a very creative setup to get almost a thousand uh, reconstruction, 3D reconstruction of barley spikes corresponding to 28 different accessions. And not just that, doing a lot of image processing, we are able to also get individual seeds. And now with individual seeds, we can measure their shapes. So how do we measure the shapes? We can do it traditionally, say the height, the length, the width, surface area, volume of each of these seeds. But there's more than meets the eye. We need to be more comprehensive. So we do the Euler characteristic transform, or the ECT, which essentially measures the topology, the inner mathematics of each seed, by taking each seed and fixing a direction, say left to right, uh, front and back, top to bottom, and chopping the seed across that direction and measuring how the topology, how the inner mathematics of this seed changes. And by measuring those changes in topology, 
as a collection of numbers, mathematically, we can prove that we summarize effectively all there is to know about morphology. Does this work? Well, we can ask a computer. We tell the computer just morphological information of the seeds, and we expect the computer to tell us with some accuracy which accession the seed comes from. So if you tell the computer just traditional information, the computer will tell you 55% of the time the correct accession that, it, that the, the, seed, the seed comes from based just on lengths and width and volumes. But if you tell the computer topological information, now the computer is able to tell you the correct accession 74% of the time. Even better, if you combine both traditional and topological information, now the computer is correct 86% of the time. So, topo so topology definitely is measuring something that we are missing in our traditional context. What are we missing? Well, we can do analysis variance if there's a particular direction or a particular slice that tells us more information between accessions. And turns out that all the, that the most useful slices are those that correspond to the crease and the bottom of the seed. And with that, I thank my collaborators, organizers, and these are my details if you have any more questions. Hello, everybody. I am Alvaro Colin, and I'm going to present some of my doctoral research, which is titled Acetogenin and Fatty Acid Dynamics During the Avocado Seed Germination and Leaf Maturing. So acetogenins are fatty acid derivatives, and they can be found in the avocado fruit and also in the avocado leaves. They possess different biological activities, and this makes them attractive to some industries. However, their biosynthesis pathway is still unknown. In order to gain information about the tendencies that these lipids follow in the avocado plant, we sampled seedling and tree leaves, and also embryonic axis and cotyledon from imbibed seeds, and determined their acetogenin content and their fatty acid content. Some of the most interesting uh, findings were that acetogenin seems to accumulate in a specific periods of the seed germination, such as the time in which we can observe the root protrude from the seed. On the other hand, uh, seedling leaves seem to accumulate more acetogenins as they develop. However, trees accumulate a lower amount of acetogenins. And also tree leaves seem to accumulate almost exclusively persin, which is uh, an acetogenin that is toxic to some herbivores and to some insects. It was also very interesting to find that acetogenins can be bound to different glycerol lipids. Specifically, we found them bound to mono and diacine glycerols and also phospholipids, as we can see in this graph. In addition, using all the data from this study, we built a correlation network in between fatty acids and acetogenins. We can see here that the, the polyunsaturated fatty acid cluster is the closest one to the acetogenins cluster. So this indicates a, a strong metabolic relationship in between them. Some of the conclusions that we can draw from this uh, work is that acetogenins and fatty acid follow interlinked dynamics across all of the avocado plant life. Uh, for the first time, we determined that acetogenins can be bound to different glycerol lipids. And also the correlation network that we built confirms a previous relationship in between lino linoleic acid and persin, but it also uncovers new relationships in between specific acetogenins and fatty acids. Lastly, the fact that we find acetogenins bound to phospholipids indicate that they might have different roles in the avocado plants, such as signaling. And well, that's all. I, I want to thank you for your time and I hope you enjoyed this talk. Hello, everyone. I'm Citlali Fonseca and I'm a postdoc at UC Berkeley. And today I'm going to present to you some of the results I got in my previous postdoc at the Instituto de Biotecnología UNAM in Mexico. And the title of my presentation is Methylotionin 1A Regulates Rhizobial Infection and Neuroorganogenesis in Faciolus vulgaris. Metallotionines are metal ion binding proteins that have important roles in plants. For example, they are involved in the regulation of cell growth and proliferation, protection against heavy metal stress, 
and responses to pathogen attack. In a previous transcriptomic analysis in your lab, we found a methylotonin 1A was upregulated under nodulation conditions and downregulated under mycorrhization conditions. In addition, an in silico analysis and expression profile showed that this gene was most highly expressed in uninoculated and inoculated roots with rhizobia. So we hypothesized that this gene could have an important role in common bean and rhizobia symbiosis. We identified six methylotunin genes in common bean genome, and they were classified into three classes based on their homology with those methylotunins in Arabidopsis thaliana. We analyzed the expression profile of MT1A at early and late stages of nodulation in common bean, and we observed that this gene was upregulated at 7 and 30 days post inoculation, but it was downregulated at 21 days post inoculation. Also, we observed promoter activity in cortical cells near to deform root hairs and in nodal primordia, as well as an infection zone on young nodules and periphery of the infection zone of mature nodules. After reverse genomics analysis, the direct regulation of MT1A showed a reduction in infection events at seven and 10, and 10 days post inoculation with 50 and 75%. In addition, the total number of nodules was reduced at 14 and 21 days post inoculation, and those nodules presented a reduction of 50% of nitrogen fixation capacity. Finally, an histological analysis showed that the number of the infection cells and the size of the cells in the epidermical and parenchymal region was reduced in MT1A nod silent nodules. So we can conclude that MT1A gene is required for the proper development and progression of infection event during the early stages of nodulation in common being, and also has an important role in the nodal organogenesis in this legume. Thank you so much for having me and see you next time. Hello everyone, my name is Laura, and today I'm going to share with you my research called Functional Analysis of Lowering Locus T During the Reproductive Transition in Agave Tequilana. During their life cycles, plants undergo various morphological and physiological changes that have been classified as stages. One of the most studied is the reproductive transition, in which several pathways involving endogenous and environmental factors can influence flowering time. And downstream of these pathways, there's the key element flowering locus T, which is a mobile signal protein that induces flowering time through the Florian activation complex. This transition has been widely studied in monocarpic animal species and polycarpic perennial species. Unfortunately, there are few reports for reproductive transition in monocarpic perennial species, such as agave tequilana. This is an emblematic crop here in Mexico due to the production of tequila and mezcal, and moreover, this crop has acquired international relevance for fiber production and as bioenergy source. But what do we know about this transition in agave tequilana? Well, based on transcriptome analysis from leaf and shoot apical meristem tissues of agave tequilana plants from different developmental stages, a series of elements involved in the reproductive transition were identified, such as flowering locus T. As we can see here, there are six homologs to promote flowering and three to repress flowering. So the manipulation of the reproductive transition represents an advantage for commercial production and basic research in agave species. Hence, the purpose of the present study is to characterize the function of the FT homologs in agave tequilana. In order to do this, clones were constructed with the FT putatively designated as promoter or repressors, and the ectopic overexpression is being studied in Arabidopsis thaliana. The overexpression of FT is also being characterized in agave tequilana by establishing a transformation protocol mediated by Agrobacterium tumefaciens. In addition, in situ hybridization and fusions of the genes to yellow fluorescent protein will be developed 
to determine the spatial and temporal expression. The results obtained will enable us to understand the transcription and regulation of the reproductive transition and to improve strategies for genetical analysis in Arab species. Finally, I just want to say thanks to Professor John, Emmanuel Avila, and all the members to the Laboratory of Genetic and Molecular Analysis of Agave Species. Thanks to CONACYT for supporting this research, and thank you for watching. That was a great uh, flash talk uh, session. Thank you for all the flash talk presenters and we'll have many more flash talk presentations throughout the week. You can go to our website and you can see the, the names of the presenters for each of the sessions and also in the abstract book. So thank you to all the flash talk presenters. Thank you to all the speakers today. Um, and also thank you behind the scenes to the organizers and the, and the technical people that are making this run, especially Edgar and uh, Cedric. It was a, a great first day to the meeting and we will have the meeting until Thursday. Um, there is also a business meeting on Wednesday, which is from five o'clock to seven o'clock p.m. Uh, Mexico City time. That's Wednesday, five to seven p.m. Uh, Mexico City time. Please stop by to that meeting if you would like to contribute uh, to the organization of the next SMB ASPB uh, meeting. Hopefully by that time we'll be in person and you might get to select a, a nice place in Mexico to have the meeting, fingers crossed. Uh, but plan to attend that meeting if you want to be an organizer or go to the website and uh, the email is listed there for you to get in touch with the current organizers if you would like to participate in the organization of the next meeting. Uh, so please be aware of that. And uh, if there's no other questions or concerns, we will close uh, this first day of the meeting. Thank you everybody who participated.